Hello again, this is the news hour from Al Jazeera. Adrian Finnegan here in Doha. There's been a large explosion in Lebanon's capital, Beirut, within the last hour. Let's show you some latest pictures. Uh, it's clear that uh, there was a massive explosion, as you can see. Uh, we're not quite sure yet as to what has caused this explosion, but uh, if you can uh, see the pictures of the neighborhood now in which this uh, explosion happened, you can see that it's caused uh, widespread damage. We have no information yet as to uh, uh, how many casualties uh, there might have been. Uh, it's clear, though, that, uh, that something has caused uh, a very large explosion in Lebanon's capital within the last hour. Al Jazeera's Zaina Hodder uh, is in Beirut uh, and is on the line for us now. Zaina, uh, you must have heard this explosion. Not only heard it, Adrian, felt it. It shook the Lebanese capital. I have reported from this city for years, but never felt such a massive explosion. First, there was a thud, and then a gust of wind. Glass everywhere destroyed. I am seeing ambulances uh, carrying wounded, rushing to the hospital. There's chaos in the streets. It's still not clear the cause of this explosion. Some reports are suggesting that it happened at Beirut port. It is still not clear, like I told you, but I was kilometers away. The glass broke everywhere around me. And as you can imagine, this is a city which is used to explosions, assassinations, but it has been a while uh, since uh, the last, uh, uh, well, it's too early to say bombing because some reports are, are suggesting that uh, there was a, a, a depot uh, that exploded at Beirut port. Like I mentioned, it's still not clear what exactly shook the Lebanese capital. Yeah. But as you can imagine, people are worried. Phone yeah. lines are jammed. People are trying to reach their relatives, calling family members to make sure that they're okay. So this is all I can tell you at this moment, okay. Adrian. So that a massive explosion. You, you, you are obviously unable to, to see the pictures we're showing right now, but we have uh, pictures taken from uh, the water near to the port area. And, and it's clear that there is a, a very large explosion right on the coast there. Where in the city, uh, Zena, are you right now? Not very far from the port, Adrian, at this point in time. Uh, some roads are blocked, so it's very, very difficult uh, to move around. The security forces are directing traffic uh, towards one area. Um, as you can ma imagine, there's a lot of chaos. I saw the plume of smoke, massive uh, like I mentioned, a massive explosion. We're still trying to confirm exactly what happened. At the beginning, uh, just a few minutes after the explosion, as you can imagine, uh, there were reports saying that it was close to the house of the former Prime Minister, Saad al-Khariri, and then reports emerged that, no, that is not true. I'm, in fact, standing outside his residence, and nothing happened here. Uh, so it is still too early for us to confirm, uh, but this is really a, a country... That, that is drowning, uh, an economic crisis, a political crisis, a currency crisis. So people are already on the edge. And that is why many are just con uh, concerned what exactly happened. Like you mentioned, it's close to the sea. It's close to Beirut port. We are still trying to confirm exactly what happened and what caused this massive explosion. The, the, the pictures that we're showing show a, a, a thick plume of black smoke rising over the port and then what appears to be a, a blast wave. So maybe there was a fire first before the explosion. Tell us something, Zena, of the port itself. Yes, Adrian, sorry, I didn't hear, I didn't hear you very well. Uh, the cars are honking. Like I told you, there's panic in the streets. Everybody's trying to get home. Uh, glass everywhere. So I could imagine the injuries just as a result of the uh, uh, broken glass. Uh, I was close to the American University Hospital, and that's in the heart of Beirut. And glass was falling from the seventh floor, from the sixth floor. People were trying to, uh, to, to, to find cover. So there, there is still chaos. People are trying to get to their homes. Um, it was the first day after a, a five-day lockdown was lifted as uh, the, the authorities had uh, imposed a five-day uh, lockdown to try to curb the, uh, the, the increase in the number of uh, coronavirus cases. So this country is really tackling with many 
many crises, a health crisis, a, a currency crisis, an economic crisis, a financial crisis. And now with this bombing, you can imagine how concerned people are. Um, but again, we don't want to jump into conclusions. I do not want to call this uh, an attack. I do not want to call this uh, uh, an assassination attempt. Right now, all we know, a massive explosion took the heart of the Lebanese capital uh, just a few minutes ago. Everyone trying to reach home, everyone concerned that this could be if indeed it was an attack. And I repeat, we still have no confirmation if indeed this was an attack. Um, it could be the start of even more instability for a country really that hasn't uh, seen stability for decades. This, uh, this explosion was clearly big enough to cause a blast wave, uh, which has, from the pictures we're seeing here, uh, caused significant damage several kilometers away. There are cars that have been blown upside down, or what have, they appear to have, uh, have been hit uh, uh, by something which has, which has thrown them into the air. Buildings damaged several kilometers away in the city itself. Uh, it looks as though this explosion, as you say, was at the port. Zainer, I don't know whether you can hear me, but I, I just wanted you to tell me a little about the port itself in Beirut. Yes, Adrian, the force of the explosion was felt across the city. Their initial report is suggesting that explosion was in the port. And I can tell you, we're just... We are approximately five, six kilometers away from the port and the whole building, our whole office, uh, uh, the, the, building, uh, the building where our office is located, the glass is, is, is in the street. Uh, so it is still not clear what exactly happened. We are trying to make calls uh, to figure out what exactly uh, happened. But the damage, the damage kilometers and kilometers away and it was the force, the force of the explosion. Uh, I was I was walking in the street and I was thrown to the ground. And I'm telling you, I'm not close to the port. I wasn't close to the port. So, Adrian, until we get more confirmation, I cannot say whether or not this has been an attack or whether it was some sort of accident. Yeah, it, it I mean, I, it appears from, from, from looking at this, the fact that, that, that it happened at the port, uh, that this may have been uh, an industrial accident, something that has gone terribly, terribly wrong uh, at the port itself uh, that has caused this, this clearly massive explosion. Uh, and you said you felt this blast wave, which, which ap appears from the pictures we're seeing here, Zaina, to have caused so much damage right throughout the city. You felt it yourself. Yes, I did. I did, Adrian. Massive, massive explosion, the force of the explosion. You mentioned an industrial accident. We cannot rule that out. Uh, we have to stress this time and time again. We cannot rule that out uh, for the time being until we confirm exactly what happened, until we uh, manage to reach the site of this explosion. But if you tell any Lebanese now that this was an accident, it will not calm their nerves because... The Lebanese people have been on edge for some time now. I talked about an economic crisis, a state close to bankruptcy, a currency that has devalued more than 80% in the past few months, inflation, soaring food prices, a surge in coronavirus cases, the healthcare system close to collapse. So people are dealing with all these problems and then they feel an explosion that rocks their capital. And this is a country that has seen massive explosions. I'm not linking this explosion to anything, but just let me tell you, in two days' time, by the end of this week, Lebanon was expected to hear uh, from the International Tribunal, which has been investigating uh, the case of the assassination of the former Prime Minister Rafik al-Hariri. That was back in 2005, and that explosion was just as massive as this one. And that explosion was a political earthquake. Uh, the whole, not just the capital, the whole country shook following his killing. Three days from today, the verdict is going to be issued. It will be the first time in Lebanon's history that um, an assassination or a political killing um, is investigated and murders, uh, murderers are uncovered and, uh, and at least attempt to, to bring them to justice. So you already have all these 
uh, this, this, this political atmosphere in the country, just then you hear this massive explosion. So could you imagine what is going through the mind of every Lebanese now as they try to confirm exactly what happened? So we cannot, we cannot say whether or not uh, this is an explosion, whether it's an impact or whether it is an industrial accident. We're seeing pictures which uh, show clearly signs of, of absolute devastation at the port area. It, it, uh, these pictures appear to be uh, the site of the, uh, the, the explosion itself. There you see that massive blast wave uh, heading out across uh, the capital, Beirut. Uh, firefighters, can we go back to those pictures at the, uh, at the scene of the, uh, the, 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 the explosion? We don't know. Uh, uh, there it is again. Firefighters tackling uh, what is remained, uh, what remains of the uh, the fire there after the explosion. Uh, mangled buildings in the port area, cranes uh, still standing despite that blast. But that that roadside uh, close to the port area where we saw cars that have been overturned, people lying injured and bloodied on the side of the road. Uh, people standing around, as you can see, there stunned. After, uh, after what has happened there at uh, the port in Beirut. And Al Jazeera, Zaina Hoda is making her way to this, this site right now, and she's on foot uh, listening to us uh, uh, on phone. Where, where are you now, uh, Zaina? How far away uh, from the port area are you? Zaina, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, how close now are you to the port area? No, we appear to have the line has dropped uh, for the moment. I will come back to uh, Zaina uh, as soon as we can. So what do we know? Um, within the last 30, 40 minutes or so, reports began to come in of um, a huge explosion uh, in Beirut, the Lebanese capital. Uh, when the first pictures started to come in, I mean, they're, they're, they're unbelievable what you're seeing right now, mangled buildings, cars. Uh, it appears that this explosion happened in the port area uh, in Beirut. We have no idea yet as to what caused this. As Zaina Hodder was saying to us earlier, this is a city that's used to uh, explosions and attacks, uh, but this was on a scale rarely seen in that city. A massive uh, explosion there, we, and well, we, we simply don't know the cause of it yet. We don't know yet uh, either how many people uh, ha, were caught up in this explosion, whether there have been deaths. There have certainly been injuries. As Zaina was saying, that massive blast wave that we saw uh, from those uh, initial pictures showered the city in shards of glass and damaged buildings. It almost looks as though there's been an earthquake uh, in, in some parts of the city. Uh, itself further away from the blast. Um, we're seeing pictures of injured people lying on the road, uh, near the road, pictures of upturned cars there uh, on that road passing the port there where, where cars have clearly either been involved in, in traffic accidents um, as drivers were distracted by the blast or have been blown over by that massive blast wave uh, that we saw on the pictures. We're trying to re-establish uh, contact with, uh, with Zaina Hodder, and we're trying to, uh, to talk to other people, trying to get hold of other people in the city <clears throat> who can give us uh, their, <coughs> excuse me, their experiences uh, of what happened in the last hour in Beirut. So if you've just joined us, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just gonna clear my throat. This is Al Jazeera, live pictures from Lebanon's capital, Beirut, where within the last hour, there has been quite clearly a massive explosion. The site of the explosion reported to be, well, you can see it from the screen, the port area in the city, a massive blast wave has damaged buildings, mangled buildings. A fire is uh, still raging, firefighters tackling that, uh, that blaze. That blast wave has damaged buildings kilometers away in the city itself, has showered the city with, uh, with shards of glass, blown out windows uh, for kilometers uh, around. Uh, and as yet, we have no indication as to uh, the number of deaths or injuries, but it's clear 
uh, that uh, after something like that, on that scale, uh, that there will be casualties. The emergency service is trying to deal uh, with um, clearly a massive uh, explosion like that are going to be uh, overwhelmed, as uh, our correspondent was telling us, that uh, even though uh, Beirut is um, uh, almost used to explosions over, over the years, um, rarely has it seen anything uh, on this scale. So this appears to be the seat of the explosion, which happened uh, within the last hour. Our correspondent Zaina Hodder is, is making her way to uh, the, the, the site of that uh, explosion. And we'll, as soon as we've re-established contact with her, we'll, um, we'll talk to her some more about uh, her experiences. Um, those pictures we were showing you a few moments ago of, of the fire, um, the seat of the fire, the seat of the explosion, apparently there are people trapped under that rubble, which is what the emergency services are, um, uh, are, are doing. They're trying to work, uh, trying to get those people uh, free. Uh, Zaina's back on the line. Uh, Zaina, where, where are you now? Yes, lines are patchy, as you can imagine, Adrian. Everyone is using their phones. The uh, network is jammed. Everyone's concerned about their loved ones, trying to find exactly what happened, uh, what shook the Lebanese capital just under an hour ago. Uh, we are still trying to get confirmation. What we understand for the time being, some sort of an explosion at Beirut Port. Beirut Port is located really in, in, in the heart of, of the Lebanese capital. We still do not have uh, confirmation on casualties and injuries. As you can imagine, uh, there's chaos. It's very difficult to move. Uh, some roads are blocked, and then there's traffic congestion in some areas. Uh, there, there's panic in the streets, glass everywhere. Uh, the force of the impact, the impact, the force of the explosion was massive. Um, the, the, the wind, uh, it, it, people, people were, were initially, everyone, uh, what, what came to their minds is that this is another assassination. Uh, Lebanon, for, for many years, uh, was rocked by a series of a string of assassinations, uh, political killings. But it has been a while. It has been uh, quiet for some time now. But again, there's no confirmation. Some reports are suggesting that this is some sort of an accident at uh, Beirut port, maybe a fuel depot. Some reports also suggesting fireworks. Nothing that we can confirm at the time being. All I can explain, all I can tell you is what is going on in the streets. And all I can say is chaos, fear. Uh, nobody knows what happened. Damage uh, kilometers and kilometers away. I could imagine how many people were sitting in their homes when uh, when the blast shook their apartment and glass uh, glass broke everywhere. So there is there is concern, but there's still no confirmation, Adrian, on what caused this explosion. It's clear that there will be uh, multiple injuries after something like this, uh, Zena. Uh, the city's emergency services working. Uh, Tirelessly yes, you can hear as we speak. Yeah. It's will, it's given this is happening in the middle of a, of a pandemic, will will the, the, the will the hospitals in the city be able to cope? This is a very good question because the healthcare system is already collapsing. Uh, this is a country the in deep economic crisis, financial crisis a currency crisis. Private hospitals are owed billions of dollars by the Lebanese government, a government that is cash-strapped and bankrupt. So private hospitals have begun to turn away patients uh, for some time now. And public hospitals are underfunded, and they have been raising the alarm that they can no longer cope with the uh, rise in coronavirus cases. So. There are many, many crises in Lebanon at this point in time. A bombing, a political assassination will uh, definitely not bode well for the stability. But as we have to stress time and time again, we still do not know the cause of this massive blast. We are still trying to confirm and trying to reach the site of the explosion. This is. Um, it, it, we're finding difficulties reaching. Some roads have been blocked, and as you can imagine, a traffic congestion just to be able to move from one area uh, to another. 
Uh, Zena, we, we were looking at pictures. Uh, we're still on uh, the pictures are coming from the road, which runs adjacent to the port there in Beirut. Uh, scenes of, uh, of complete chaos. Uh, mangled, it looks like uh, warehouse buildings at the port there, uh, cranes uh, blown uh, askance, um, uh, many people standing on the roadside there, um, completely bewildered. They're taking photographs of something there on the opposite side of the road to the explosion. Uh, not sure what that is, but uh, we're also seeing pictures of cars uh, that have clearly either been involved in traffic accidents immediately after the blast. Oh, it's that building there which uh, which has been completely blown out, uh, as you can see, uh, by the force of that blast uh, from the port, uh, which is just opposite. But cars that have been either involved in traffic accidents by, you know, as drivers were uh, distracted by the, the, the explosion right next to them or have been blown over by that massive blast wave. Um, Let's speak to uh, reporter Anshul Vora, who uh, is also in Beirut. Uh, your house, Anshul, I understand, was damaged by the blast. That's correct. About half an hour, 40 minutes ago, we were just watching a show on Netflix, taking a break from work. And I heard uh, a jet hovering in the sky. And because this has been happening for some time, I opened the window, glass door, and looked outside. And the entire building shook and I was blown by it. My entire house has been bombed. Everything has been bombed. I'm bleeding on my neck. Uh, I think there's, I think it's glass on my neck and my ankle. I would say I'm seriously injured, but a lot of people around me on the street where I live in, which is called Jemeze, a Christian-dominated area, a lot of people are bleeding. There's absolute chaos here. People cannot understand how to react to this situation. This country has already been grappling with so much. Earlier in the day, I was filing a story on how the price of bread has doubled. But how are these people going to deal with the situation now? My entire neighborhood has been bombed. Thankfully, my neighbor is okay. I haven't yet many, I haven't yet, I don't know if there are any casualties yet or not because I'm right under my house. But my entire house was blown apart. There's nothing that I could actually pick up from there other than my phone, luckily. I found my phone and I found my passport. Uh, husband is with me. We're on the streets right now, also on the job, trying to film, trying to talk to people and understand what's happened. Other uh, journalists now collecting at the same spot. We're outside the Red Cross. A lot of people trying to go in. I haven't yet managed to get to the building of Red Cross. I don't know whether it's been bombed or not, but a lot of the buildings here have been bombed. Just people around me bleeding everywhere. Complete chaos. I mean, you know, one doesn't want to sort of talk about who's done this yet, but deaths have been hovering above, hovering above these skies over the over the last two months now. So complete chaos. Uh, many were anticipating this, but it's just such a heartbreaking moment, personally, but also as somebody who lives in Lebanon. For me, I can associate with the Lebanese people. These people have been going through such a hard time, and now this. I mean, one just is, you know. Just, does not have words how to describe this this situation that we are in. Anshal, um, it's clear that, that from what you were saying, you've been injured by flying glass there, and and and, and you're you're bleeding. Are, are you getting are you getting treatment for that? Are you able to to, to get medical assistance? No, uh, no, no medical assistance. I I don't see Red Cross. I see one Red Cross nurse uh, running around uh, in a parking lot trying to help an, an, an elderly lady. But as I said, I, I don't know if I can get to the Red Cross building, and it's very close to my house. And because I'm limping, as I said, my ankle is bleeding, I, I haven't managed to get there yet. And it's complete chaos because all the cars on the street, people are rushing to pick up the wounded. Uh, lots of old people, I see at least four or five now. I see two more Red Cross. Oh, nurses, Red Cross workers now, some young people trying to help uh, 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 others around. It's just complete chaos. Cars have been bombed, houses have been bombed. This is a really posh area yeah. in Lebanon. Um, you know, one would think that this is an area which would not be bombed by uh, the southern neighbors because it's Christian dominated and people here have generally felt yeah. very safe in that regard. But it, it, this is the first one to go through this uh, uh, to go through the situation here today. Anshal, I don't know whether you're aware yet. Obviously, I think you're in a state of uh, shock, but there, there's been the explosion was at uh, was at the port in uh, Beirut. How far away from the port is your is your neighbourhood? Well, we're about, I think, 
we're about uh, uh, 30 minutes away from it. But the fact that that's been bombed as well, as you're saying, we did hear uh, my husband is German and he's a journalist as well. And he just got a message from the German embassy that that, in fact, had happened. And uh, um, uh, if that happened to them, this makes the situation much, much severe. Uh, I mean, this sort of, you know, this sort of a sort of an event. I mean, I really can't even get into the politics of it all, to be honest, because I have people bleeding in front of me. An old man, I reckon, would be 60 plus is bleeding. He's lying on a stretcher now. A Red Cross man is a Red Cross worker is dealing with him, is trying to address to his wounds. There's a really old lady on my right. She's being taken care of. Uh, 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 she's been taken care of by some people around me, some young people. I mean, it's just an absolutely, it is an absolute nightmare. You know, we've all read about these things happening in yeah. Lebanon, but that it would actually happen. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is about 15 years, right, after the 2006 war, that this would actually happen. No one, no one believes that. One thought that somehow, some, somehow okay. peace would be maintained. Listen, I, somehow, I'm... Lebanon is not going to go in this direction. It was already dealing with so much, but here we are. Uh, young people have, of course, been hit as well. A young lady is sitting on a on a what would have been a window once, and this is this is the parking lot right in front of my house. The parking lot right in front of my house, just like about, about 100 meters away from Red Cross, a very posh area. Markets had opened up after lockdown was lifted, and and uh, well, another nurse from Red Cross has just come to this parking lot with some bandages, trying to cater to people who've been injured. Hopefully, I'll get some first aid as well. Anshal, so it's a really dire situation here. Anshal, look, we'll, we'll let you go and get, get that ankle treated, that, that bleeding uh, stemmed. Uh, look, take care of yourself, and um, uh, we'll, we'll give you a, a few minutes to, to, to gather your, your wits again, and we'll come back to you. Many thanks indeed. That's um, reporter Anshal Vora there, uh, who was at home watching TV when that blast hit. Uh, her neighborhood... Uh, a couple of kilometers away uh, from the port area uh, in Beirut when that uh, explosion blew out all the glass in the windows of the homes in her neighborhood. Uh, Anshal's neighbors, like her, injured by flying glass. She's got uh, her ankle, she said, was, uh, was bleeding. She's clearly, I mean, you can hear it in her voice when she's talking in a complete state of shock there. Uh, so... Um, We'll let Anshul go and uh, and get the treatment she needs. She said there's a Red Cross uh, first aid worker there treating people in her neighbourhood. So um, other reports speaking uh, of um, uh, a firecracker storage warehouse uh, being in the vicinity of this uh, this explosion. Um, so it may have been uh, an explosion at a fireworks warehouse, uh, which Zena Hodder, our correspondent, was uh, was speculating upon. Uh, a little earlier. We clearly yet don't know the cause of, of what uh, has set off this huge explosion in, in Beirut within uh, the last hour. But um, that blast wave, when you saw the pictures uh, uh, of the blast wave uh, shooting out over the city, uh, shattering windows and damaging buildings several kilometers away, blowing vehicles over on that road that runs uh, adjacent to uh, the port area there. Uh, firefighters now uh, trying to, uh, to put out the, the blaze there at that mangled warehouse, which is clearly the seat of the explosion. There are reports of people being trapped uh, under the rubble there. And as Zaina Hodder was saying, uh, the city's emergency services, already stretched by the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, will be inundated. Uh, it's clear that there have been multiple injuries, uh, blast injuries, after this explosion. It has just gone 1,600 hours GMT. This is Al Jazeera live from Doha. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Let's uh, bring you up to date with that breaking news out of Lebanon. A huge explosion has shaken the capital Beirut. It appears to have been centered on the port area in the heart of the city. Lebanon's health minister says there's been a very high number of casualties. The blast wave from the explosion has caused extensive damage to buildings within a large radius of the blast site, kilometers away. Uh, people felt that blast, including uh, Al Jazeera's Zaina Hodder, uh, who is uh, on the line for us now from uh, Beirut. Zaina, just remind us of, of where you were uh, and what happened when that blast struck. 
Hello. Zaina, I don't know. Sahafi, Sahafi. Zaina's trying to negotiate her way uh, towards the, the port area. Zaina, can you hear me? It's Adrian. <laughs> Clearly chaos there. Zaina, can you hear me? It's Adrian. Yes, Adrian. I'm so sorry, but I was in a cab. We're trying to reach. No, and the line has dropped again. Uh, obviously, as Zena was saying, uh, it is incredibly busy there. The mobile phone network's inundated uh, with people uh, trying to, uh, to call loved ones, to contact loved ones, loved ones to make sure uh, that, uh, that they're safe. We'll try to re-establish uh, contact uh, with uh, Zena uh, and get her back on the line. Zena, you're back. Sorry, you were, you were, in a, you were telling us you were in uh, a cab. Zena, can you hear me? Zena clearly can't hear me. She's on the move. Um, as any good reporter is doing, she's, she's running to the, uh, uh, to the scene of the, uh, the, the disaster right now uh, by any means possible. At first on foot in a cab, she said as well. It sounds like she's on foot again uh, right now. But um, uh, Nasser Yassin is, uh, uh, is with us uh, right now on the line. Uh, Nasser, uh, tell us something about your experience of this. So this is really, really very, very, very massive. I haven't seen this. I've lived the civil war in, in Lebanon, Israeli invasion, different assassination. But this is, I think, the biggest uh, explosion that happened in, 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 in Lebanon up to my you know, experience and knowledge. I was outside Beirut, uh, in a, in a, uh, not far from Beirut, but overlooking it, and uh, we were shaken. Um, and actually, we've heard seconds before uh, some kind of a, a, an air jet or a, or a sound of a missile, if I can say. I can't, I'm not an expert in, in, in military affairs, but we've heard for a couple of seconds something like, like a, a, a sound, and then we've heard the bomb. And from the images that I've seen, the, the damages are, are, are huge in, in the port area. I think the whole port area might have been all you know demolished altogether the radius of, of the explosion by talking to relatives uh, uh, glasses were broken in the radius of 20 kilometers from the from the uh, port area so we don't understand yet we don't know yet what happened but this is going to be huge in beirut and uh, and uh, we, we we just pray that not many casualties uh, will, will be will be lost NASA, I, 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 I don't know whether you're able to see local TV pictures at all, but, but there's a scene of complete devastation at the port area itself. I'm, I'm intrigued by, by this yeah. noise you described a few moments ago before the actual blast itself. Um, 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 Anshal yeah. Vora, we were speaking to our, 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 our colleague Anshal Vora a few moments ago, and she described hearing a similar thing. She said it sounded almost like a jet. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it sounded like a jet or, or a sound of a missile, something, you know, uh, moving, wheezing in, in, in a couple of seconds, and then we heard the bomb. And, and we're like, we're like 40 kilometers or 35 kilometers from Beirut, uh, overlooking Beirut, and we heard it very clear. So I think we need to, 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 to wait and see the investigation about this. Uh, but it, it doesn't look like uh, this, is, this is fireworks. Uh, I don't think the port of Beirut has a storage for that amount of fireworks from looking into the images of the explosion. I think this is something much bigger than that. No, sir, I, I mean, it, it, you, you say you were 20, what, 20, 30 kilometers away from, from the scene of the blast. I mean, but you, you felt the blast wave even where, where you were? Absolutely, absolutely. It felt as if it's a bomb in the, in the, in the nearby. And then we, we ran away and everyone was running away to check if there was some kind of a bomb in the area. Uh, I mean, that's how we felt it. And we're, we're, we're uh, in the mountain outside Beirut, and we've, we've heard it, we've felt it. So, so by looking at the images and talking to, to friends and family in Beirut, uh, this is, uh, I guess, much bigger than just fireworks exploding in the port area. I think the whole port area uh, the building of the uh, of the uh, uh, where, where the storage area and the silos of the grains and so on, I think it's totally destroyed from the images that I've seen. So it could be it could be something bigger than just a fire in, in the port area and going into some kind of a, a, a store area of firework. I think this is not a real story about this. Uh, NASA, uh, how do you think um, uh, the city's 
health services uh, and emergency services are going to cope with something of, of this magnitude? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, we cannot tell uh, the number of casualties, but, but definitely within a, the radius of the port area and around it, there are definitely many casualties. Probably the workers, employees, people who work in the harbor of Beirut will be, will be affected you know, clearly by this, unfortunately. So the health services in Beirut are stretched now by the, by the coronavirus response, uh, particularly public hospitals. But I think, I think everybody is going to, uh, uh, you know, try, try their best to, uh, to, to do the emergency uh, response to this. Uh, Lebanon is not, unfortunately, is not known for having a very efficient emergency response, aside from the Lebanese Red Cross, which is a, which is a non-governmental organization. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone is going to, to go there, and particularly the Red Cross, the army, and uh, perhaps some, some volunteers and volunteering NGOs are going to go and help. And private hospitals are equipped for this. But again, I mean, I can't tell from only the images I see, but this, this is going to be stretching the healthcare system more than it has going through now with the coronavirus response and with actually the economic crisis. Let's not forget that Lebanon is going through one of its gravest and deepest economic and financial crises, and some hospitals have been struggling to get uh, uh, their, 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 their equipment, they're getting their, their material and whatever they need uh, to keep going. So I think this is, this is um, again, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sad to, to look into and see the images and, and, and know what's happening. This is going to strain the country further and perhaps it's going to accelerate its collapse if the healthcare system, you know, uh, is going to be struggling to cope with large number of casualties and, and uh, injured people. And, and I mean, as you say, uh, NASA, Lebanon's people will, because that's their nature, rally right now to help those who are injured um, or caught up in the immediate aftermath of this explosion. But what do you think will be uh, the effect on the, on, on the country's population, given all of what they've been through over the last year, uh, both economically and, and with the, the, the pandemic? This is, this is going to impact upon morale, isn't it? Of course, I mean, uh, we've been going through crisis after the crisis for the last year, uh, economic, financial, and of course, top of the political crisis, inability of the uh, political elites and the political uh, system and those in power to come up with a solution for the economic crisis. And then came the coronavirus pandemic and all the lockdown and its impact on the economy. So the Lebanese the, the, the Lebanese people and people who live in Lebanon as well as refugees are going through very, very hard times. And then comes this it's kind of, uh, I think it's going to be the straw that will break the country. Um, if, if this is uh, in the size of it, of course, and likely the demolition of parts of the port, if not all of it, I'm from the images. But if this is also related to some conflict, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to, as a, as a, as a uh, conflict related or war related, I think it's even going to be worse. Uh, well, I cannot tell, we cannot say, we need to wait and see. But if some of the chatter we're getting on WhatsApp that there were uh, some people talking about uh, a, a, a uh, a strike in the port, I think this is even known to get the country yeah. in, a, in, we, a down, in, in a downward spiral. We can, we, can only, we, we can only speculate at the moment, and, that, and that's not uh, helpful. That this, we don't Absolutely. yet know the cause Absolutely. of this explosion, Absolutely. NASA. But um, just before we let you go, Absolutely. Absolutely. just before we let you go, NASA, tell, tell us once again about where you were, uh, what was happening when this blast wave uh, hit. You, you thought, people thought where you were, and you were some considerable distance away from the site of the explosion, but people thought this, this was something that was happening within the neighborhood, quite local to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, uh, sounds of something like for seconds, as if it was the sound of a drone or a jet or something, and then this massive explosion. And we all ran to look into the uh, nearby area to see if something happened, you know? I mean, I, I, I initially thought it was a drone hit or something. That's something we've been seeing in this part of the world. And, uh, and then, or maybe some kind of an explosion in, 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 in the nearby. And then 
we started to get uh, calls from Beirut and uh, we've seen the images and then we realized that this is something uh, quite big in Beirut. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I just wish people who were affected by this uh, safety and uh, as you mentioned earlier, we're, we're not speculating, we're just describing what's happening in, in this incident and we hope that this is not going to be something that's going to put the country in a, in a worse situation than it is. Mm. Now, so, uh, can you stay on the line for me just for, for a few moments while, while we've got you? Um, I, I just want to remind uh, viewers of, of what uh, we're seeing on the screen at the moment. Um, uh, within uh, the last hour, uh, there were, uh, has been a, a massive explosion um, in Lebanon's capital, Beirut. It appears to be set, uh, have centred uh, on the port in the heart of the city. Uh, the wave, the blast wave from this massive explosion has caused extensive damage to buildings within uh, a fair few kilometre radius uh, of the blast site. And, and uh, you heard Nasser Yassin saying there, you know, 20 to 30 kilometres away it could be felt. Uh, Lebanon's health minister, uh, Hamad Hassan, has said that the explosion has caused a very high number of injuries, along with that uh, extensive uh, damage. Uh, Lebanon's, uh, or the capital's, um, emergency services at the moment are struggling to cope. Uh, as you know, uh, hospitals already uh, overwhelmed by uh, patients due to the coronavirus pandemic. This is going to make things even worse. Al Jazeera Zaina Hodder uh, is in Beirut. Uh, and uh, Zaina, where are you now? I'm right at the entrance of Beirut port, Adrian. Uh, heavy security presence. They're not allowing us to go in. I can still see ambulances trying to reach the site of the explosion. I tried to ask one of the ambulance drivers what she knows. He said, we know nothing. All we know is that there was a massive explosion. We're going to go in uh, to evacuate uh, uh, the casualties. What we understand from the health minister, hundreds, hundreds of people were wounded in this massive blast. And I saw it with my own eyes. I saw uh, people on the back of the uh, on the back of, of, of uh, ambulances uh, being taken away, covered in blood. Uh, people, there's the chaos in the streets. The damage, the damage around Beirut port, uh, it, it, it reached kilometers away. I was kilometers away from Beirut port when uh, the explosion went off. It, it shook the ground. I was thrown to the ground. You can still hear fire trucks. Uh, are arriving at the scene to try to put out the flame. Still no word from the security agencies or any officials on what exactly happened. Was this an accident? Uh, was, uh, was this a fuel depot or a fireworks depot like some reports suggest? Or was it something else? As you can imagine, uh, with the chaos, a lot of unconfirmed reports, we are trying to confirm exactly what happened. But all I can tell you now is that hundreds of people have been hurt and the, the city is on the edge. Everyone fearing the worst. Even if you tell them this could be an accident, they're still panicking because this is a city that has seen so many explosions in the past, so many assassinations, uh, so many car bombings, even after the Civil War ended in 1990. And people are already on the edge suffering from economic hardship, people losing jobs, businesses closing, people finding their life savings trapped in banks, uh, people finding their the local currency losing 80% of its value. So could you imagine the state of the Lebanese people and then this massive explosion that took the capital? Accident or not, there's chaos in the streets, people are worried. People are calling family members, trying to reach each other, but phone lines are jammed, as you can imagine. I'm outside Beirut port. A number of dozens of people are gathered here. Uh, Lebanese tend to be curious people. Um, in other countries, maybe people would run the other direction. In this country, a lot of people like to know what is going on, because I ask them, what are you doing here? Do you know somebody inside? No, we're here to see what happens. So, it's chaotic, Adrian. Unfortunately, at this point, it's very difficult for us to 
to say exactly what happened. I don't want to assume anything. But whether if this was an accident, there have been casualties, a lot of casualties, people being taken now to hospitals, and a lot of security presence in the streets, the internal security forces closing some roads leading to the site of the explosion, trying to divert traffic. It was rush hour when it happened. People were going back home, leaving work. This is the first day the country reopened after a five-day lockdown. So many, many people were in the streets. And the force of the blast was felt kilometers and kilometers away. Glass falling down from buildings. So you can imagine how many people have been injured just, just from falling glass. Never mind those who were next to the to the explosion. I'm not really sure if they would have they would make it out and survive that force of that blast. So right now we are trying to confirm this is a city on the edge and a lot of concern in the faces of people when you just look around. People asking questions. What happened? Zena, stay on the line a moment. I and just want I to. I can hear a man. I'm, 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 I okay. can hear a man asking, "Where is he? Has he taken to hospital?" So people are wondering where their loved ones are. In the midst of this chaos, it's very difficult, really, to know whether or not your loved ones are safe. But you can, you can. I can hear, overhear people on their phones now making calls, asking where their son or their father or or their mother is at this point in time. Zena, please stay on the line for us at the moment. Zena Hodder is at the scene of the explosion, which you're seeing on the screens on your screens uh, right now. Uh, if we can replay this video from uh, from the beginning, um, any moment now you'll 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 see it. Uh, there's been speculation that it was that uh, the blast happened at a, at a fireworks uh, factory or firecracker storage area. Um, looking at these pictures, I'm I'm no expert, but if you look at that plume of smoke, there, there was an initial explosion. Uh, and what looks like, to me anyway, my, my um, amateur eyes, to be explosions, firework explosions within that, that cloud of smoke. And then, uh, several seconds later, uh, you get this boom. A massive, massive explosion. As we said, we, we, we still don't know whether uh, this uh, is an industrial accident or something more deliberate, it's too early uh, to tell, but this is the result of that explosion as the sun sets over Lebanon's capital, Beirut. A scene of complete devastation there at the port area. And that blast, the shockwave from that blast, uh, went two, three kilometers or more in every direction, damaging buildings and homes, blowing out windows, there have been many, many glass injuries. We were talking to reporter Anshal Vora a little earlier, who was clearly in a state of shock uh, when she talked to us. She was at home watching TV, and all of the windows blew out in her home. While she was talking to us, she had uh, an ankle injury, which was, uh, which was bleeding, uh, and she was uh, looking for, uh, for a first aid. There was a Red Cross, a Red Crescent uh, first aid person uh, nearby, and so we're, we're hoping that, that she got the treatment that, that she needs. This is Anshal's house. That's what happened. Now, that was several kilometers away from where the, uh, the explosion happened. That was where Anshal was watching TV. Many, many homes across Beirut looked like that tonight, even though they were kilometers away from the port area in the city. Al Jazeera's Zaina Hodder is live for us on the line. She is at the port, which is where that, uh, that explosion happened. As you said, Zaina, earlier, emergency workers are still there trying to extinguish the flames uh, and, and searching for people who, who may be under the rubble, that mangled rubble there of those buildings that have been, that have been uh, devastated by that explosion. Yes, Adrian, we are not able to enter the port. We are. Um, right outside the port, there's a security cordon, the Lebanese army, um, a very heavy presence of the army and the internal security forces. Um, they're opening the roads as fire trucks continue to arrive, uh, ambulances continue to arrive at the scene. Uh, no one seems to know, um, for the time being at least, what exactly happened. 
at least from where I am standing. Uh, some will tell you they believe it was a fuel depot, a fireworks depot, with some people even saying there could be weapons depot. It's very hard to say at this point in time what exactly happened. Uh, there's chaos, as you can imagine. Uh, people trying to call their loved ones, trying to find out whether or not uh, they were hurt in this massive explosion. The damage is, you know, felt has it's, it's kilometers and kilometers away. Beirut port, uh, just to give you an idea, Beirut port is really in the heart of the Lebanese capital, just two kilometers from downtown Beirut, central Beirut, uh, where the parliament is, where the government is. If you remember a few months ago, it was the epicenter of a protest movement where uh, people used to gather and protest and call for a new leadership. Uh, so, and in that area, there are a lot of shops and uh, a lot of people uh, were in the area when this happened because it happened during rush hour. Uh, people were in the streets. It was the first day the country reopened after a five-day lockdown. Uh, people were uh, trying to finish whatever they needed to do because the country is going to go into lockdown again on Thursday for another five days. So the streets were crowded and... Uh, when it happened, I was in the Hamra area, which is just a few kilometers from Beirut port, next to the American University Hospital, which is a very, uh, it, it, it's right in the center, and glass from the seventh and eighth floor were, was falling down uh, on the ground. So it, it was very, very powerful, very massive. Uh, we were all thrown to the ground, the security, was so concerned that there could be, if you can still hear the sound of the sirens, ambulance is still arriving, still trying to evacuate uh, those inside the port. Again, we, we heard from the health minister who just said a short while ago that hundreds, hundreds of people have been injured in, in, in this massive blast. And I can tell you for sure, not all of the injuries, not all of the casualties were inside the port because Looking at the scale of the damage outside the port and kilometers from the, the port, people would have been hurt kilometers away. Glass everywhere. And uh, hospitals taking the, uh, sorry, ambulances taking the wounded uh, to the hospital. So still unconfirmed. What exactly happened? Was this an accident? Was this an explosion? Was something in that depot that caused this explosion. We're still waiting to hear from the internal security forces, uh, from uh, from Lebanese government officials. Still, still no word. Still no word on exactly what happened that shook uh, the Lebanese capital. Al Jazeera's Zaina Hodder is reporting live for us uh, at the site of that explosion at the port in Beirut. Uh, Zaina uh, will. We'll let you. Uh, we'll go and um, gather some uh, some facts for a moment. I just want to show you once again those pictures, if I can, of um, Anshal Vara's house. Uh, hang on a second. We're just going to call them up for you. Anshal Vara is a reporter uh, who spoke to us uh, about uh, an hour ago now, or just under an hour ago. She was watching TV in that room, several kilometres away from the port where that explosion happened. This is what happened to her house. Uh, and here is what she had to say when I spoke to her a short time ago. We were just watching a show on Netflix, taking a break from work, and I heard uh, a jet hovering in the sky. And because this has been happening for some time, I opened the window, glass door, and looked outside, and the entire building shook, and I was blown by it. I'm bleeding on my neck. Uh, I think I think it's glass on my neck and my ankle. I wouldn't say I'm seriously injured, but a lot of people around me on the street where I live in, which is called Jemeze, a Christian-dominated area, a lot of people are bleeding. There's absolute chaos here. People cannot understand how to react to this situation. This country has already been grappling with so much. Earlier in the day, I was filing a story on how the price of bread has doubled. But how are these people going to deal with the situation now? Thankfully, my neighbor is okay. I haven't yet many... I haven't yet... I don't know if there are any casualties yet or not, because I'm right under my house. But my entire house was blown apart. There's nothing that I could actually pick up. 
from there, other than my phone, luckily, I found my phone and I found my passport. Uh, my husband is with me. We're on the street right now, also on the job, trying to film, trying to talk to people and understand what's happened. Other uh, journalists now collecting at the same spot. We're outside the Red Cross. A lot of people trying to go in. I haven't yet managed to get to the building of Red Cross. I don't know whether it's been bombed or not, but a lot of the buildings here have been bombed. Just people around me bleeding everywhere, complete chaos. I mean, you know, one doesn't want to sort of talk about who's done this yet, but deaths have been hovering above, hovering above these skies over the over the last two months now. So complete chaos. Uh, many were anticipating this, but it's just such a heartbreaking moment. The voice of uh, reporter Anshal Vora speaking to us uh, an hour or so ago, clearly in shock there after what had happened. Couldn't believe that, uh, uh, that you know, just sitting there watching TV, that the, the windows would cave in, the force of that blast. And she was several kilometers away from it uh, at the time. Um, just to remind you, if you've, uh, if you've just joined us, uh, Breaking news out of Lebanon, a huge explosion has shaken the capital, Beirut. It appears to have been centered on the port in the heart of the city. And the blast wave after the explosion has caused extensive damage to buildings within uh, a large radius of the blast site. And uh, a number of, uh, an extensive number of uh, injuries, mostly uh, blast and glass uh, injuries. Uh, Al Jazeera Zayn Ahoda is, is somewhere near to where you're looking at the moment, uh, at the entrance there to the port and those mangled warehouses that we're seeing uh, where firefighters are trying to extinguish uh, blazes uh, there. Um, Zena, uh, uh, you faced something of a trek across the city, a city in absolute chaos when you heard this blast, uh, felt this blast, uh, and then tried to make your way to the port. Yes. So First, I heard a thud, and it sounded like an explosion, but I wasn't sure. But moments later, moments later, it was like a gust of wind pushed us to the ground and glass flying everywhere. And then I saw, I saw smoke in the distance, not very far. I thought it was downtown Beirut from my vantage point. I thought that it was downtown Beirut. <laughs> chaos in the streets. I was close to a hospital. They were evacuating patients from the hospital as well because the force of the blast, like you said, caved in windows, glass everywhere. And people were so concerned that it, the explosion is going to be followed by other explosions. This is a country that has seen many, many explosions, political assassinations. Uh, so immediately in the back of every one's mind is that here we go again. And, and this is the initial reaction that I heard from people. Head home, head home, it started again. But it was so difficult to move because as you can imagine, people started to panic, get into their cars. Uh, some cars were damaged on the road, some roads were blocked. And then you saw the security forces start to, to close roads leading to Beirut port. So this, it was kind of difficult to reach here. I'm now standing outside the port. I can still see the smoke a few hundred meters from where I'm standing, but the army is not allowing us in. Ambulances, the civil defense, fire trucks, they continue to arrive at the scene. They enter some, I see some of them come back out with wounded people, but others have not come out yet. Maybe people are trapped underneath the rubble. It's very hard for me to say exactly what happened because we can speculate. I mean, you ask anybody here what happened, everybody will give you a different story. You can hear, you can hear more ambulances arriving. The health minister is saying that hundreds, hundreds of people have been injured, not just, not just at Beirut Port. This explosion was felt miles away, kilometers away. Glass everywhere. I saw a woman on the back of a motorcycle. Her face was covered in blood and they were rushing her to the hospital. So this, whether it's an accident, whether it was some sort of a bombing, it has caused casualties. We're still waiting for the internal security forces, any of the security agencies to confirm exactly what happened. 
so far, no statement from the authorities, apart from the health minister who said that hundreds have been injured. You can hear more and more ambulances arriving. So definitely more people are either trapped inside under the rubble, who need to be evacuated. You can hear, Adrian. Zena, we'll, we'll, we'll let you... We'll let you go and um, uh, gather some news for a moment. Uh, let's talk to, to Sammy Nader, uh, who is um, in his car as we speak at the moment. Sammy, Sammy, where are you right now? Where were you when, when this blast happened? I, I was in my uh, office in downtown Beirut and uh, all the windows were broken. We were kind of thrown out of the uh, of the room and uh, all the doors were uh, 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 broken uh, as well. I mean, this is something that is unseen. I have lived uh, civil war. I, uh, I've, uh, I was, uh, I was, I was with. Sammy, we appear to have yes. lost. Hang on. Yes. No, we've lost. We've lost your signal, Sammy. Um, Many thanks indeed, uh, Sammy Nader. We'll try to get Sammy back uh, again uh, so that he can recount his uh, experience for us uh, once again. Uh, you're looking at uh, downtown Beirut at sunset, dusk, looking out over the, uh, the port area. And within the last 90 minutes, there has been a massive explosion. Here it is. Uh, First, a plume of smoke. Something's gone terribly wrong. Um, what looks, what appears to be, and in that, in the middle of that plume of smoke, that fire, uh, explosions, maybe fireworks. We don't know. There are reports that maybe this was a fireworks storage area. Uh, and then several seconds later, after this, uh, you get this mushroom cloud uh, that just. Well, mushrooms out right over the city. Look at that. Glass, windows, buildings damaged, windows shattered uh, kilometers away. The blast felt as far as 10 or 15 kilometers away from the blast site. Uh, just a massive explosion which has caused uh, so much damage to, that, uh, to downtown Beirut. Many people injured uh, by flying glass. Uh, blast injuries. The uh, emergency services rushed to the scene. Um, we saw them trying to extinguish the flames of the fire uh, that is still burning there in the port area. Look at that. That's remarkable. And you've the camera shaking there as the blast wave hit uh, the person filming uh, there. As I was saying, em emergency services rushed to the scene. Oh, this is taken from the sea, by the way. And look again, you see that, that mushroom cloud, that blast wave uh, in the humid air over Beirut. Astonishing, astonishing scenes. Uh, people injured by, uh, by flying glass as their, their windows caved in. Uh, reporter Anshal Vora told us of her experience uh, a, a little earlier when she was sitting at home watching TV and, and the windows blew in. Look at that. Unbelievable. We still don't know what caused that explosion, but we know, uh, according to Lebanon's health minister, uh, that that blast has caused a very high number of injuries. These are life picks. I mean, it's just apocalyptic, isn't it? Look at that scene after such a massive explosion. Mangled wreckage there uh, of what were once warehouses in the port area in downtown Beirut. Not far away from that is uh, Al Jazeera Zaina Hodder, uh, who's uh, on the line right now. We were talking uh, earlier on to uh, Nasser Yassin uh, Zaina, who said that he hopes that this won't be the straw that will break the country's back. Well, Adrian, it's too early to say what caused the blast, but right now I saw a number of port employees um, leave and they were in a state of shock he could barely speak to me i told him were you inside when it happened uh, yes he told me i was inside i said what exactly happened he just put his hands up in the air he was in a state of shock all he could tell me was there are a lot of dead 
and a lot of injured. Again, it's very hard for me to independently confirm. This is from somebody, a port employee who was inside, who was inside Beirut port when this blast occurred. But from what I'm seeing, from where I'm standing, it's outside the port. Hospitals continue, continue to arrive more than an hour after that blast, taking away either dead or wounded. And the health minister saying that hundreds, hundreds have been wounded in this massive explosion. Now, we've, uh, we've, the line has dropped uh, to Zaina. Uh, Sami Nader, I'm glad to say, is, is back with us. Uh, Sami, you, you were telling us uh, about where you were and what you were doing when, when this blast hit. Yeah, so I was in the office. We were thrown out of uh, the, the room. Uh, windows and doors were uh, totally uh, uh, destroyed. And this is something unseen. The amplitude, the impact of uh, the explosion is something unseen. And I've lived uh, civil, the 15 years of civil war uh, in Lebanon. Uh, I was witness of uh, 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 Rafiq Hariri uh, car bombing, but I have never seen something like that. Like uh, for uh, I mean, all all of Beirut downtown, even the suburbs were touched. Now I'm uh, for the last two hours. I'm trying to to get home. Barely I made like uh, uh, some meters. There uh, are rumbles all over uh, the road. And while I mean hearing that uh, what is said about the reason of the bombing i'm i'm sorry but i'm so skeptical i can't believe this is uh, a fireworks uh, uh, thing uh, you know uh, uh, how this huge quantity of fireworks can be piled in can be stopped in the port of peru i mean this is something beyond reasons um, uh, I, I do believe that there is something else behind that. Uh, now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing people uh, tweeting that uh, the kind of the flame uh, indicates that uh, it can be some uh, toxic uh, gas uh, getting uh, from the, the, the explosion. They are calling for people to stay uh, indoors and to close the windows. And, um, you know, the, 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 the timing of this, uh, of this incident, of this explosion, uh, the, the, the location of this explosion, I mean, I mean, I mean, it raises a lot of questions. I don't want to go into like a, a catastrophic scenario or conspiracy theory, but I, I hardly believe uh, that this is a firework uh, thing because I'm looking around me and I'm seeing the impact of the magnitude of what happened. I can't believe this is a firework uh, 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 explosion. Uh, as you, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, as you say, Sammy. I mean, it, it is very early days to speculate yet. We don't know what uh, has caused uh, this this explosion. What has led to it? Um, uh, but if there was some malintent involved, why now? Why now? You know, uh, we know that uh, we have uh, a scale uh, tension uh, with between Israel and Hezbollah. We know that the, uh, uh, Lebanon is more and more isolated, more and more. Uh, into a crisis. There is a lot of pressure uh, that uh, that is put on Lebanon directly or indirectly. The tension is scaling up uh, between uh, Iran and uh, and the other regional power, including the United States of America, including uh, Israel. So we are in, a, in the middle of uh, of many conflicts. Uh, it boils down to one conflict. This. Uh, rising tension uh, uh, with uh, with Iran, plus the, the area where this took place is practically a security area. This is something that is under the control of uh, uh, a group, I mean, a military group. Uh, I mean, let's not speculate, but I mean...
Yeah, the, uh, the line has dropped out to Sammy uh, once again. He, Sammy's in his car. It's taken him two hours at least to get home at the moment. He said because of all the rubble all over the road. Look at these cars uh, damaged uh, near to uh, the, the site of the explosion. Earlier, we saw uh, cars that had actually been blown over in the road that runs adjacent to the, the port and um, dazed looking uh, drivers, dazed and bloodied uh, people wandering around on the road there um, in a state of shock after what had uh, happened. Nada Hamza uh, is on the line now from uh, Beirut. Uh, she was near the port when the blast happened. Uh, Nada, uh, tell us about your experience. Hi, Nada, can you hear me? Tell me what happened to you today. Now the line is open, someone's there. Nada, can you hear me? It's Adrian. Yes, you're very, very faint. I can just about hear you, uh, Nada. No, hang on. Nada, we'll, we'll try and uh, establish the, the line again and we'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, Nasa Yassin is with us uh, again on the line. You were some distance away, Nasa, uh, when this, this blast happened, weren't you? I mean, a, a good, um, what, how far away from it were you? Um, like 20, 25, 30 kilometers away. And you and felt it, even, even that far away, you felt the blast? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, it sounded like a, a bomb in, in, in a nearby area. I mean, not not in not a, a powerful one, of course, but it sounded like a bomb had, it took took place in a nearby area in the mountain, and that's 25 kilometers from Beirut. So you can imagine the uh, the the uh, how massive uh, was this in in Beirut. Uh, I've been getting uh, messages and uh, uh, talking to to friends. Um, it's in a radius of five kilometers in Beirut, uh, homes and offices had uh, uh, their glasses broken or furniture broken or, or, or damaged. Uh, areas just around the port area, around one or two kilometers, it looks like really like, like an earthquake or a war zone. Unfortunately, it's, it looks very, very bad. Uh, from the UB campus, I've been getting some news from colleagues and we've got also the glass shattered all over our building and offices. So, uh, again, I mean, just this, uh, uh, the first, uh, um, you know, uh, story about firework, I think it's, uh, it's probably uh, not, not so true, but we still can't tell what happened inside the, the port. Uh, the, the, the port area is, is really devastated, and um, I, I just, you know, uh, sympathize with people who were inside the port area around it, because from the images and from the messages we're getting, um, this looks like a, a, a disaster, a, a war zone, an earthquake, and I'm not sure how the emergency services are going to cope with it, but I'm, I'm praying for, for that. Whatever its uh, cause, uh, NASA, this has caused extensive damage to uh, parts of the capital and, uh, and will have impacted upon people's confidence, uh, I suppose, that they're already um, dealing with the coronavirus uh, outbreak there uh, in Lebanon. So perhaps people are, are, are apprehensive, fearful. What do you think this will do to people in the city, this, 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 the scale of this disaster? You know, we, we, we've always heard, you know, this narrative that uh, Lebanese are resilient, they're, they can keep going, they cope with all the stresses and hardship that they get uh, uh, they go through, but whatever is happening in the last year or, 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 or more, uh, you know, this is beyond any any talk of resilience or coping, you know, starting with the financial crisis, economic crisis, the economic meltdown, and people being unemployed, their salaries being 60, 70 or 80 percent of their value diminished every day. Um, you know, and, and then the coronavirus lockdown and, being, and people fearing and, and another wa wave of, of coronavirus cases in the last couple of weeks. And then this comes in. This is, you know, devastating at all levels. And, and I think, uh, uh, as your colleague was saying, this is uh, a, a, the immediate reaction that this was some kind of uh, assassination, an attack, 
a bomb, something complex related, because this is what we've been through many, many times in the civil war or during all the Israeli attacks and wars in Lebanon throughout the 90s and 2006 and so on. So uh, people started to perhaps speculate, but they started to feel fearful about what could happen. Is it war? And, and, and again, all these stories and the things we've heard about jets in, in the sky just contribute to this fear among people. I, I, I guess the post area, uh, uh, you know, is also uh, something related to the economy in Lebanon. We shouldn't forget that this is a major source of, of income for a struggling economy in the country. If the port area, the, the main port in, in, in the country is devastated, as we've seen, this is also is going to affect the Lebanese economy further, and it's going to affect people's uh, ability to, to, to keep going in such extreme hardship and situation that the country is going through. Um, uh, I hope we, we, we can go through this, but definitely, definitely, this is beyond any imagination that we could have had, uh, you know, about the crises in Lebanon. And this is definitely, definitely a call for support for Lebanon for the coming days. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the pain that's going to come into the Lebanese and into everybody and into the economy and into the confidence of the Lebanese. And Lebanese and Lebanon really would need help in, in, in coming up, uh, you know, out of this. Um, again, we need to look into the details of this, but uh, from, from talking to friends and seeing the images, many neighborhoods around this uh, explosion, which is in the central Beirut, are really devastated. Uh, they get their, you know, their, whether it's the glasses broken or the, or the windows or maybe some of the offices or homes and so on. And, and uh, I'm not sure how, how we're going to cope with, with all of this given all the stresses that the Lebanese are going through. Now, so for the moment, uh, many thanks. Stay with us uh, on, on the line. Um, the Reuters news agency uh, quoting Lebanese security and medical sources saying that at least 10 people are dead uh, following that explosion in Beirut. I, I have a feeling that that is a death toll that uh, will rise in the coming hours and days. But for the moment, uh, Lebanese security and medical sources, according to the Reuters news agency, saying that at least 10 people are dead. Uh, we have Nada Hamza back on the line. Uh, she was um, uh, near the port when the blast happened. Nada, Nada, can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, um, tell me what happened to you. I was a few meters away from the electricity establishment in Lebanon, which is parallel to the to the port, Lebanese port. Uh, I started hearing bombs, and people were like, uh, stop, they stopped in the in the middle of the street, and we thought it's a, uh, it's a clash between the government and the protester near the electricity establishment. Then we heard kind, I'm not sure, but we heard kind of planes. And I was asking people, what's going on? I want to know if I continue or, or go back. So I asked people, what's going on? They said, it's an Israeli attack. By the time they said that, I saw the uh, fire, I saw the smoke, and then we heard the voice. Then I, I don't remember what happened. And it, then I went out of my car, I ran away to the entrance of, of one of the buildings there. Then I realized that the building was destroyed. Then I tried to call my parents. I couldn't reach anyone. Uh, I could reach my, my security group from, from my work. And I asked, just tell me what happened to know if I stay there or I, go, I can go back home. So they said many things because, you know, the news said that it was an attack at Hariri's place. Then they said, I don't know where. So I realized that it was an explosion and I can run away. So oh. I left. No, but no, till no. now, I'm under shock. Not a, Israel has issued a statement denying any involvement in what happened in yes. Beirut uh, today. Yes. Uh, you, I'm, you were I'm clearly, you what happened to you, me in this yeah, place. You were clearly... Uh, in a state of in a state of shock, but, but were you physically harmed? Were you okay? You you weren't hit by flying glass okay. or or flying debris. 
uh, I fly a little bit from the, from my car, but I'm okay. Okay. I'm okay. And how yes, are you, how, I saw how a lot of you, people and a lot of uh, how are you feeling? houses destroyed, all buildings destroyed in the streets. How are you feeling now? The damage Nada. is very big. Nada, can you hear me? Sorry? How are you feeling now? Obviously, you're you're still shocked about about the, about what has happened. Yes, because I can't believe I'm I'm still alive. I can't believe. Yeah. Nada, thank you so much for 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 recounting what happened to you today. Uh, really good to talk to you. We wish you well. Uh, Nada Hamza there, uh, who was uh, just a short distance away uh, when the blast happened. Uh, Al Jazeera Zaina Hodder is, uh, is on the line with us uh, once again. Uh, she's been talking to us uh, since, well, since minutes after this, uh, this explosion hit. Uh, and she's made her way to the port area, um, which is what you're looking at now, the seat of, uh, of this explosion where there is still uh, a fire burning. Uh, she can't get in there, um, but is on the line uh, right now. Uh, Zaina, wh where are you? What's happening? Adrian, I'm right at the entrance of Beirut port and ambulances continue to arrive, uh, which is really an indication of how many casualties there are inside. Health minister says hundreds of people were injured. Security sources are talking about at least 10. This didn't happen too long ago, so information is only trickling in. And amidst the chaos, it's very hard to confirm numbers. But I saw a port employee uh, walk out in a state of shock. I tried talking to him. He could barely speak. I told him, you know, what happened? He, he, he just looked at me and he put his hands up and he said, explosion. And I said, but what, what happened? He told me, I don't know, but there, but there are dead and injured on the ground. He was in a state of shock. The rest of the capital is in a state of shock because this explosion was so massive, it shook Beirut. I was a few kilometers away uh, walking when I heard a thud of, uh, and then wind. Uh, it, 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 it just pushed me to the ground. The force of the explosion was so massive, glass everywhere. As I made my way from Hamra, which is the commercial district of the capital, down to downtown Beirut, central Beirut, I saw, I, I, I could see glass everywhere, damage everywhere, uh, people in, in, in panic, people on their phones trying to reach their loved ones, trying to find out if everyone is okay, because people, casualties were not only inside the port area, people outside, they were in their cars, they were driving close by, the, the Beirut port is, is not very far from the main highway, that, that the, the, the entrance to the capital from North Lebanon. And it was crowded. It was rush hour. Many people in the streets. You can hear sirens, ambulances, still arriving, still trying to find survivors or those who were injured so that they can take them to hospital. It's still not clear what happened, what caused this explosion. There are many reports out there we're not going to speculate at this point in time. Some are talking about something in a storage, in a warehouse that caused this blast. When I saw the smoke right after the, the thud and, and, and the, the initial force of the blast, I saw the, 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 smoke, the smoke color was orange. It was very strange. Orange smoke. That's what I saw. So it's still not clear, Adrian, what exactly happened, what caused the blast. But many, many people have been injured. People who were in their homes from the force of the blast, windows caved in. All the shops in front of Beirut port destroyed, damaged people's livelihoods. And in a time like this, people are struggling. There's a deep economic crisis in the country. Many of these people, this is all they had left. Many cars damaged. More ambulances arriving. Still no word from an official on what exactly happened. Abbas Brahim, he's the head of one of the security agencies in Lebanon, has reportedly arrived at Beirut port to inspect the site of the explosion. 
So we have to wait to hear from an official on what exactly happened. But people are speculating. People are wondering what was in this warehouse, especially since many believe that there's a lot of corruption at Beirut Court. It's one of the reforms the international community has been demanding from the Lebanese authorities in order to bail out this country, to give this country billions of dollars that it needs to kickstart the economy. One of the demands of the international community is to clamp down on tax evasion at the port, to clamp down on corruption at the port. So it's very difficult to say what exactly caused the blast. Right now, we can only speculate if the city, Beirut, is on the edge. This country has seen many, 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 many explosions over the years. But it's been quiet as of late. Yes, there's political instability, political tension. But it's been a while since, since there has been an explosion. So the initial reaction of everybody was, is this the beginning of a new string of, of political violence? People are, are concerned. People are worried about, you know, the situation. So we're going to have to wait, Adrian, to see what Lebanese officials are going to say about what exactly happened and caused the blast that really has at least taken the lives of 10 people, according to security forces. And so, yeah, this... We're expecting that number to rise because I have seen ambulances come and go non-stop for, for over an hour now. Saina, this happened, what, an hour before sundown, uh, a very uh, busy time of the, the, the day in terms of the movement of people. We're just, we're just going to have a look at, uh, at the pictures again of the, the initial blast. Uh, but it, it was essentially, it was rush hour in the city, wasn't it, Zaina? Zaina, can you hear me? Hello, Zaina. No, Zaina is there on the line, but um, obviously it's a pretty chaotic scene where she is at the moment. Uh, she is at the port, uh, which uh, is where this blast uh, happened. Uh, there's speculation that, that, that it, this was um, uh, a fireworks warehouse, that uh, where there was a fire, some sort of accident, uh, and that there were a number of explosives uh, obviously stored there, uh, it being... Uh, a fireworks uh, factory and um, uh, lots of people describe hearing noises first and then that a huge boom uh, and a blast wave uh, that shook the city blew out windows uh, at least four or five kilometers away if you were within a two or three kilometer radius then um, uh, homes suffered extensive uh, damage uh, these are live pictures now. Um, it is dusk now, uh, nightfall uh, in Beirut. Mangled buildings at the uh, at, at the seat of that explosion at uh, Beirut's port. Uh, earlier, we spoke to uh, journalist Anshal Vora, uh, who lives in Beirut. These are pictures from her house, which is within that two or three kilometer radius of the port. Uh, it was so powerful, that blast, that uh, her home, as you can see, um, incredibly badly damaged. Anshal suffered uh, minor injuries, uh, was in a state of shock when we spoke to her, had an ankle injury. This is what she had to say. We were just watching a show on Netflix, taking a break from work, and I heard of a jet hovering in the sky. And because this has been happening for some time, I opened the window, glass door, and looked outside and the entire building shook and I was blown by it. I'm bleeding on my neck. Uh, I, think I think it's glass on my neck and my ankle. I would say I'm seriously injured, but a lot of people around me on the street where I live in, which is called Jemeze, a Christian dominated area, a lot of people are bleeding. There's absolute chaos here. People cannot understand how to react to this situation. This country has already been grappling with so much. Earlier in the day, I was filing a story on how the price of bread has doubled. But how are these people going to deal with the situation now? Thankfully, my neighbor is okay. I haven't yet many, I haven't yet, I don't know if there are any casualties yet or not, because I'm right under my house. But my entire house was 
blown apart. There's nothing that I could actually pick up from there other than my phone, luckily. I found my phone and I found my passport. Uh, my husband is with me. We're on the street right now, also on the job, trying to film, trying to talk to people and understand what's happened. Other uh, journalists now collecting at the same spot. We're outside the Red Cross. A lot of people trying to go in. I haven't yet managed to get to the building of Red Cross. I don't know whether it's been bombed or not. There's people around me bleeding everywhere. Complete chaos. I mean, you know, one doesn't want to sort of talk about who's done this yet, but deaths have been hovering above, hovering above these skies over the, over the last two months now. So complete chaos. Uh, many were anticipating this, but it's just such a heartbreaking moment. It is just after 1,700 hours GMT. Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Al Jazeera. Uh, we're continuing our coverage of the breaking news out of uh, Lebanon today. Uh, a huge explosion has uh, shaken the capital, Beirut. Uh, it was centered on the port area of the city. At least 10 people are reported to have died. That uh, is a number that is likely to rise in the coming hours and days. Uh, the blast wave from the explosion caused extensive damage to buildings within a large radius of the blast site itself. Uh, the cause uh, at this stage is unclear, though Israel has issued a statement uh, denying any involvement, that after uh, speculation uh, between uh, Lebanese uh, citizens, uh, uh, particularly on, on WhatsApp, that, uh, that, that Israel may have been uh, behind it. The UN says that it has no information yet on the cause of the explosion. A spokesman uh, said that there are no reports of injuries among UN staff in Beirut as of yet. We uh, have no indication from our colleagues in Lebanon uh, that uh, there's been any harm uh, to UN personnel or facilities. And certainly I hope uh, that uh, they're all okay and I hope that the people uh, of Lebanon are okay. Uh, these, they're very worrying signs of explosions. We do not have uh, uh, information about what has happened precisely, what has caused this, whether uh, it's uh, an accidental or man-made act. And so we will need that information to respond. Once we get that, we'll probably try to express something further. But uh, at this stage, our thoughts uh, are with the people of Lebanon, and we hope that whatever has happened, uh, that uh, the damage is limited and, uh, and that uh, the safety of the Lebanese people uh, 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 will be ensured. Well, here's the situation right now at uh, the port uh, in uh, Beirut. As night falls, this explosion happened uh, around two hours ago. It's clear that uh, obviously a, a, a fire continues to rage uh, in the port area. Helicopters trying to douse. Uh, the flame is firefighters on the ground there uh, also looking for uh, survivors under the rubble of those mangled warehouses uh, there uh, in the port area uh, our correspondent uh, who was standing at the gates of the port uh, reporting that uh, ambulances still two hours later continue to come and go uh, the fire burning obviously in uh, several uh, places uh, within the port area uh, you can see the main seat of the, the explosion uh, on the left of the picture there where the helicopter now is, uh, is dropping its load of uh, uh, fire retardant and, uh, and water. Uh, fire's also burning there on the, on the, uh, the right-hand side of those uh, uh, silos, which perhaps isn't surprising given the, um, the extensive uh, damage from that, that blast wave. Al Jazeera Sena Hodder, as I say, our correspondent, is, uh, okay. is there at the port area. Uh, Zaina, what's the latest? Well, we're hearing from the head of uh, general security, Major General Abbas Ibrahim, who arrived at Beirut port uh, not too long ago. What he is saying is that the blast appears to be explosive material stored in a warehouse. So what is he saying is that there is explosive material stored in a warehouse in Beirut port material that was confiscated years ago. So this is the first statement uh, from a Lebanese security official uh, telling the Lebanese and the rest of the world what exactly caused the blast. Now, this is going to raise a lot of questions. What was explosive material uh, doing at 
of Beirut port stored in a warehouse. This was a massive explosion, Adrian. We've been talking for the past two hours. I felt it. The rest of the city felt it. Uh, there's been chaos in the streets ever since that blast. The force of the blast was massive. It destroyed and damaged buildings, glass everywhere. Uh, and, it, and it took lives. What we understand from Lebanese security forces is at least at least 10 people have been killed. And the health minister saying hundreds of people injured. And I can tell you for sure that there were there has been a lot of casualties because I've been standing outside Beirut port for more than an hour. Ambulances coming, arriving, ambulances leaving the port, non-stop, chaos. The Lebanese army pushing, telling people to move away, find off in the road. People are on the edge. People are afraid of of what what happened. What shook the capital? It felt kilometers and kilometers away, 50 to 70 kilometers. Uh, people were telling me that they they felt their apartment shake. So this, in it, the head of the general security is now saying that this was highly explosive material stored at Beirut port. This is going to raise a lot of questions on what was the material doing at Beirut port. Of course, the international community believes is rife with corruption, that political parties and not the government control what goes in and out of Beirut port. So, more questions to the authorities, who really, have, the people of this country, a lot of them at least, have lost faith in them Zainab. for months now. They've been demanding a new leadership. They're demanding uh, Zainab, new I, new faces to govern a country. Zainab, I, I want to pick up the on... the economy has been run to the ground by the same political parties who've been in office for decades. So Zainab. highly explosive materials caused the blast, according to the head of general security, Major General Abbas Ibrahim, who arrived at Beirut a short while ago. At least 10 people killed, hundreds injured. The Lebanese capital is in shock. People are on the edge, on their phones. I have been overhearing their conversations, calling their parents, their brothers, their sisters, their friends, checking if they're okay. Zaina, Phone um, lines are jammed. Can you hear me, Zaina? Closed. Damage to central Beirut is massive. Beirut port is not... Is, is very close to central Beirut and very close to one of the main highways that lead into the capital. Sena, can you hear me? Um, yes, Adrian, well, I, I can I, I hear want, you. I want to pick up on, on something you said there about these explosive materials. You said that they were confiscated years ago. Um, and, and you talked earlier on when, when, within the last couple of hours while we've been talking about corruption uh, being endemic there at the port. Yes, Adrian. That is the statement that was made by uh, Major General uh, Ibrahim. I'm quoting. It appears that the explosion occurred in a storage of high explosive materials, which was confiscated for years. So this is the head of general security. It's a question many, many will ask him and will ask the Lebanese authorities. What was highly explosive material doing at Beirut port? The head of the Red Cross also now telling the media ambulances from all regions across the country are heading to Beirut. The situation, in his words, is not normal when it comes to the damage and the injury. It's massive. The amount of casualties. I've been here for almost two hours now. Ambulances continue to arrive, continue to leave with the wounded. Al Jazeera Zayna Hoda reporting live there from the, uh, the port uh, in Beirut, the scene of that massive explosion uh, there. Uh, she quoted Lebanon's internal security chief, Abbas Ibrahim, who on a tour of uh, the blast site was asked by reporters about the cause and said that he couldn't speculate but said that explosive materials uh, 
confiscated years ago were stored in a warehouse there at uh, the, the port city, uh, the port in the city, rather. Uh, let's hear now from Nasser Yassin, uh, who is a chair of the Refugees Initiative at the American University of Beirut. Uh, now, he was a fair distance away from the city at the time of the blast, but was still uh, hit by the blast wave. This was really, really very, very, very massive. I haven't seen this. I've lived the civil war in, in Lebanon, Israeli invasion, different assassination, but this is, I think, the biggest uh, explosion that happened in, 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 in Lebanon up to my, you know, experience and knowledge. I was outside Beirut, uh, in a, in a, uh, not far from Beirut, but overlooking it, and uh, we were shaken. Um, and actually, we've heard seconds before uh, some kind of a, a, an air jet or a, or a sound of a missile, if I can say. I can't, I'm not an expert in, in, in military affairs, but we've heard for a couple of seconds something like, like a, a sound, and then we've heard the bomb. And from the images that I've seen, the, the damages are, are, are huge in, in the port area. I think the whole port area might have been all, you know, demolished altogether. The radius of, of the explosion by talking to relatives, uh, uh, glasses were broken in the radius of 20 kilometers from the, from the uh, port area. So we don't understand yet, we don't know yet what happened, but this is going to be huge in Beirut. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we just pray that not many casualties uh, will, will, be, will be lost. I mean, it sounded like a jet or, or a sound of a missile, something, you know, uh, moving, wheezing in a in, in couple of seconds, and then we heard the bomb. And, and we're like, we're like 40 kilometers or 35 kilometers from Beirut, uh, overlooking Beirut, and we heard it very clear. So I think we need to, 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 to wait and see the investigation about this. I cannot tell uh, the number of casualties, but, but definitely within a, the radius of the port area and around it, there are definitely many casualties. Probably the workers, employees, people who work in the harbor of Beirut will be, will be affected you know, clearly by this, unfortunately. So the health services in Beirut are stretched now by the, by the coronavirus response, uh, particularly public hospitals. But I think I think everybody is going to uh, uh, you know try try their best to uh, to to do the emergency uh, response to this. Uh, Lebanon is not, unfortunately, is not known for having a very efficient emergency response aside from the Lebanese Red Cross, which is in, which is a non-governmental organization. But I'm, I'm I'm sure everyone is going to to go there, and particularly the Red Cross, the Army, and uh, perhaps some, some volunteers and volunteering NGOs are going to go and help. And private hospitals are equipped for this. But again, I mean, I can't tell from only the images I see, but this, this is going to be stretching the healthcare system more than it has going through now with the coronavirus response. Sami Nader is director of the Levant Institute for Strategic Affairs. Now, he was in his office in downtown Beirut when the explosion happened. All the windows were broken. We were kind of thrown out of the, uh, of the room and uh, all the doors were uh, 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 broken uh, as well. I mean, this is something that is unseen. I have lived the uh, civil war. The area where this took place is practically a security area. This is something that is under the control of uh, uh, a, a group, I mean, a military group. Joining us now on the line from outside of Beirut uh, in Shouf is uh, Nizar Hassan, who is a, a social activist. Um, uh, tell us about what happened with, with you today. Where were you when this, this explosion happened? Hello. Um, I was very far from Beirut, uh, so I was not directly impacted by the explosion. We're uh, approximately 50 kilometers from Beirut, but you heard the explosion. We thought it was from the nearby valley. So uh, the, the size of the explosion is absolutely incredible. We, I don't think we've ever seen something like that uh, in the history of the country. Everywhere in Lebanon, even um, behind the mountain range. That We appear to have, uh, have lost our guest for the moment. Uh, we'll try and uh, get him back. Uh, 
Let's uh, just remind you once again of, um, of what we've been uh, covering here at Al Jazeera over the last, uh, well, it's getting on for two hours now since this news broke. A huge explosion uh, has shaken Beirut's capital, uh, Lebanon's capital, I'm sorry, Beirut. Uh, it happened uh, in the port area in the heart of the city. Now, we know that uh, 10 people have been killed, the Reuters news agency uh, quoting uh, Lebanese uh, sources. Uh, but that is a death toll that is sure to rise. Uh, the emergency service is still at the scene. Uh, the shockwave from the blast blew out windows uh, several kilometers away. Uh, there were a number of glass-related uh, uh, injuries and blast-related injuries. Uh, the emergency service is really uh, dealing with um, uh, an avalanche of, uh, of casualties there at the moment. Lebanon's health minister confirming there, have, there has been a very high number of injuries uh, and in the last 30 minutes or so uh, Lebanon's internal security chief Abbas Ibrahim uh, has been on a tour of uh, the, the blast site and was asked by reporters about the cause. He said that he couldn't preempt any investigation but he could confirm that explosive materials, materials that had, had been uh, confiscated years ago uh, were stored in a warehouse there. Uh, let's uh, go once, uh, uh, speak once again to uh, Nizar Hassan, who uh, is back with us uh, on the line. Um, uh, sorry about that. We had some technical problems. You, you were telling us that you you were a fair distance away, thirty to fifty kilometres away, but even then you heard this blast in central Beirut. Yes, indeed, we heard it and we felt it uh, as if it was uh, quite nearby and. Uh, we have also friends and comrades from very far areas from Beirut, 100, 100 kilometers or 70 kilometers away from Beirut, and with the mountain range separating them uh, from the coast, and they still heard it. And also we have friends and, and people in Cyprus reporting that they heard the explosion and they felt their buildings shaking. So it's, it's a really devastating, it's an incredible size, the explosion. I don't think we've ever seen anything like that in, in the history of the country. And uh, we, we're still hearing reports. Uh, I think you have the updates about <laughs> the number of uh, people who might have dead, died in the, in the explosion. But uh, obviously, this is, any number we hear now is an underestimation because there's too much rubble in and around the port area uh, to know how many people have been, uh, have been killed by the explosion. Uh, and, and what do you make of this statement from the general security chief that um, uh, the blast, yeah, he I said, he, he was mm. it was caused mm. by highly explosive material, not yeah. explosives. He, it, there's, a, there's a difference. Mm. So these weren't explosives, but it was mm -hmm. highly explosive material that was being stored in the port area. Yeah. Okay, so what we know, what we've heard, obviously nothing confirmed yet, what we've heard from many sources, including, including uh, the words that you just quoted, is that there are highly explosive material and the report, uh, many people are saying this is, to be specific, this is uh, ammonium nitrate. Okay, ammonium nitrate is a very explosive uh, uh, comp chemical component that exists, uh, that is used in industrial explosions. It's also used in explosive devices, sorry, in explosive uh, devices. Um, and so, so it's used as an explosive component, right? It's not something that is, might be explosive. It's something that is uh, industrially and in military um, uh, used. It's put to use for, for explosions. So, obviously, uh, if there's a huge storage of that, then this is as if you have a huge bomb uh, that has exploded. Uh, it depends, obviously, on the pressure of the storage and all of that. I'm not the expert. But one thing that many people have reported, and you can get from the words of Akta Abbas Rahim, the general security chief as well, is that the storage, the, the components have been, or the material has been stored for a long time after being confiscated. And one of the one of the things uh, we, we, we just received in terms of, uh, obviously, these are rumors, but some of them are more substantiated than others, is that this is a ship that 12 years ago uh, was about to drown near the coast of Lebanon, and the material was uh, transferred to the Lebanese coast to the port so that it doesn't, uh, you know, cause pollution or explosions, etc. And uh, that a few months ago, there was a team that investigated, like went to inspect the situation of this uh, of this storage and found it to be dangerous, but nothing was done about it. Obviously, this is not confirmed. We yet to have any confirmed reports about that. But obviously, if this is a case of fireworks being stored next to highly explosive chemical components, then 
someone is responsible of that, obviously, someone who the, the management of the port is responsible for storing such highly explosive material for so long. And we wonder why they were stored so, for so long and they haven't gotten rid of them. But also being stored uh, in, in nearby or in proximity to fireworks is something that raises the eyebrows. Another, you know, another sign of potential incredible incompetence that is literally just criminal incompetence by, by the Lebanese administration that uh, just, you know, causes damage to the whole city. It, it, it was a disaster waiting to happen, you say. And this stuff had been there for so long and was unstable. Um, it, it begs the question, why? Why was it allowed to stay there so long and why so much of it? Um, uh, you know, if, if, if there was a danger, this, yeah, this I mean, could the, sort of the, thing the could happen. The answer in the Lebanese administration, especially when it comes to the port and the customs, is always bribes, right? I'm, I'm not I'm theorizing here. I don't have the facts. But if something is, sta is, is highly explosive and it's stored for so long and they, they, should, they should be dealt with, but they haven't been dealt with. Then some people have been benefiting from this, from this storage. Obviously, I don't know that for sure. Uh, uh, this is only speculation, but this is how things happen, especially that we have one of the most corrupt administrations in the country uh, in that specific location, in that specific uh, facility. Nizar, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Nizar Hassan, the social activist uh, on the line uh, from Lebanon. The Lebanese uh, Red Cross, the head of the Lebanese Red Cross, says that Hundreds of people have been injured and taken to hospital for treatment uh, after the blast today and that others are still trapped in their homes. And that blast uh, hit homes two, three kilometers away, blew in windows and um, caused a scene of devastation as we were hearing it a little earlier. And in a few minutes, I, I will we'll play you a sound of a reporter, uh, Anshal Vora, who was at home watching TV when the blast struck and you can see uh, the, the devastation caused from inside her home. But first of all, I want to bring in, uh, once again, Al Jazeera, Zaina Hoda, uh, who we can see now. Zaina, uh, uh, tell us where you are, what, what's happening there right now. Adrian, we are at the entrance of Beirut port. You can see behind me the chaos. Ambulances continue to arrive, continue to evacuate the casualties. So far, according to security sources, at least, at least, 10 people have been killed, but we're expecting that number to rise because we understand uh, from the health minister as well as the uh, Lebanese Red Cross that there has been hundreds, hundreds of injuries. Ambulances have been called in from across the country to help in the rescue effort. It was a massive explosion. You can see the fire trucks also arriving at the scene to try to put out the flames. It happened more than two hours ago. We've been speaking, Adrian, about how massive this explosion was, how it was felt across the city uh, kilometers and kilometers away, and how there has been material... As you can see, the chaos, it's chaotic scenes here outside uh, Beirut port. A short while ago, the head of one of Lebanon's uh, top security agencies, Major General Abbas Ibrahim, uh, visited the site of the explosion. In a statement, he did say that it appears, it appears that the blast was caused by highly explosive material that was stored in a warehouse and that this explosive material was confiscated years ago. Now, if indeed this blast, this massive explosion that has taken away people's lives and caused so many injuries, if you can see inside the ambulance, they are evacuating the wounded. If indeed highly explosive material was stored at Beirut port. This is going to raise a lot, a lot of questions about safety procedures and what exactly was this highly explosive material. We all know that the international community has been demanding that the Lebanese authorities clamp down on corruption at Beirut port as, well, as one of the conditions for the international community to bail out this country, to provide billions of dollars of aid. 
because they believe the endemic corruption in the port really costs this country billions of dollars. It costs the state treasury billions of dollars uh, a year. So the head of general security saying the blast was caused by highly explosive material. The Lebanese president, Michel Aoun, has called for an urgent meeting at the presidential palace of the Higher Defense Council. The Higher Defense Council groups the various security agencies in Lebanon. They are now in session at the presidential palace. The prime minister, Hassan Dieb, issued a statement a short while ago declaring a national mourning tomorrow uh, for the victims of this explosion. Uh, this was the first day the country reopened after a five-day lockdown, so there were many, many people in the streets. It was rush hour when the blast occurred, and that is why you have so many people who were injured in the explosion, not just inside Beirut port, but across the capital. Glass was falling everywhere, uh, people were panicking, people were on their phones, uh, wondering where their, uh, family, uh, their, their family were, if they were safe, if, if they were not safe. Uh, so there's chaos in the street. This is a city on edge, a city um, that has seen explosions, many explosions in the past. And that's why the initial reaction of people was, is this an assassination? It, it, was this a car bombing? Um, because the country is going through a, a deep economic crisis and a political crisis as well. And in Lebanon's history has, has shown really every time there is political instability, there, was, there has been security incidents. So right now, the head of general security saying the explosion was appears to have been caused by highly explosive material, which is stored in a warehouse at Beirut port, which is just right behind us. But right now it's dark. It's very difficult to see. Um, but chaos in the streets, uh, Adrian, a lot of uh, people really concerned about what happened Zena, uh, this uh, after, late this afternoon. Zena, uh, you got your earpiece back in, you can hear me. Um, uh, tell us about, I mean, you were several kilometers away from, from the blast when it happened. Uh, where were you? What, what were you doing? And then, then you had this, this difficult journey to, to get to the scene of, of the blast to report on, on, on what had happened because of the chaos that was, uh, that, that was underway there. Adrian, it was late in the afternoon, it was just past 6 p.m., and there was this thud, a thud in the background, which sounded like an explosion. I looked in the sky and I saw smoke, orange smoke, and then there was this force that pushed us to the ground, and then glass everywhere, shattered glass everywhere. It was so powerful, people were screaming, people were on the ground. Security. I was close to the American University Hospital, so there was a lot of security there. They were instructing people to leave the buildings because nobody knew what it was. People were concerned that further explosions will follow. I saw some patients being evacuated from, from the hospital. People had no idea what exactly happened, what rocked their capital. And a lot of People immediately speculated that it was some sort of an attack because, like I mentioned, this country has seen political assassinations, killings, bombings, car bombings over the years, but it has been quiet for some time now. We have been speculating as well the past two hours, but 10 minutes ago, the head of general security saying that it appears that this was highly explosive material, highly explosive material that has taken the lives of at least 10 people and injured hundreds of others. People are concerned. People who are 17 kilometers away said that they heard, they heard the blast. That's how powerful it was. We are now approaching the entrances of Beirut port. You can see the heavy security presence, the Lebanese army, the Lebanese security forces the ambulances trying to evacuate. If there are any survivors, it's still not clear. I spoke to a port employee about an hour ago. I saw him leave in a state of shock. He could barely speak. All he could tell me was that it was an explosion. I don't know what happened. 
And he told me that he saw dead bodies and injured people lying on the floor. He was clearly in a state of shock. He couldn't continue uh, the conversation. So you can see hospitals, uh, excuse me, ambulances still evacuating casualties to the hospital. Another fire truck leaving Beirut port. Beirut port is in the center of the capital. It's, it's very close to the main highway that the, the northern entrance of Beirut, if you like. So the force of the explosion was felt outside the Beirut port area, central Beirut, all the way to the commercial district. I can just give you an idea how people are, were on the edge when it first happened. A lot of them saying that the explosion was close to Saad al-Hariri's residence. He was the former prime minister. His father was killed in a massive, massive explosion in 2005. And the verdict, the, the, an international tribunal has been investigating the case and the verdict is expected to be issued on Friday. So already the country was on edge. There was really, really concern in Lebanon that the verdict will ignite strife in the country because Rafik al-Hariri was the most prominent politician uh, since the end of the civil war in 1990, but he was also the head of the Muslim Sunni community and the suspected assassins belong to a Shia group, Hezbollah. So you could imagine how this could inflame sectarian tensions in a country like Lebanon. And this is, the verdict is supposed to be issued on Friday. So people were already on, on, their, on the edge. They were immediately linking this explosion to the possibility of another attack. But now, we do know, at least from according to one of the top security officials in this country, that it appears the blast was caused by highly explosive material. And clearly it was highly explosive material because the Lebanese capital shook. Buildings, kilometers away, their glass shattered. People in the streets, they were crying. Uh, there was really panic everywhere. It was very difficult to move from one area of the capital to another because everybody just wanted to get home as quickly as possible because they did not know what happened and they were worried that there would be further explosions. So Beirut was rocked by a massive explosion just over two hours ago. Lebanese security saying highly explosive material in a warehouse at Beirut port. Confiscated material in the words of the head of Lebanese security, which is going to really raise a lot of questions. Authorities will have to answer a lot of questions on what this material was doing at Beirut port, how was it stored at Beirut port, and whether or not it was stored in, in, in a safe manner. Clearly, what we saw today, that it was not. Zainab, for the moment, many thanks. Al Jazeera Zainab Hoda there, uh, live at uh, Beirut port. As Zainab was saying, Lebanon's president has uh, called an urgent defense council meeting. That meeting is underway. The prime minister has declared a national day of mourning on Wednesday. These are live, uh, live pictures now from uh, the scene of that explosion where uh, firefighters are continuing to tackle the blaze uh, that began uh, immediately after that massive explosion that hit uh, the Lebanese capital uh, around uh, two, two hours, 15 minutes ago. Uh, now, let's uh, speak to Habib Bata, uh, who is a journalist and the founder of Beirut Report. He joins us now from the northern suburb of Beirut near Antelias. Uh, good to have you with us, sir. What, what do you make of, of these uh, reports uh, that an explosive material, not explosives, but an explosive material uh, had been stored in a warehouse at the port for quite some time? Uh, and there's speculation that... Um, uh, a, a, a team, an inspection team, uh, had uh, found them to be unsafe uh, just a matter of months ago. Well, I mean, it's not surprising, you know, uh, Lebanon is an accident waiting to happen uh, in so many, way, uh, so many places, uh, whether it's uh, uh, public services, electricity, all kinds of government industries are not regulated well. We don't have, like, inspectors that... Uh, so many buildings could collapse. Um, so, you know, again, all the problems that Lebanon faces is because they don't really have a strong government that is able to ensure the safety of its citizens. 
Um, and that's been why people have been protesting. That's why the uh, currency has been falling. Um, so, you know, there's so many possible accidents in Lebanon. So it's very hard to speculate. It could be, you know, many things. Some people heard airplanes. Um, I thought it was an airplane. The minute that I um, looked in the sky, uh, the minute that I felt the explosion, I looked in the sky it was my first reaction. It's always our reaction as Lebanese to look in the sky uh, because we've had so many airstrikes that make similar um, explosions. But this was very, very strong. I mean, this was felt more than a bunker busting bomb. And we felt many of those here as well. So it's very hard for me to speculate. But, you know, there, there are a million accidents waiting to happen in Lebanon. Uh, if it does turn out to be an industrial a a accident, uh, that these materials have been stored in an unsafe manner. Who's, who takes responsibility for that in, in, in Lebanon? Given we were hearing earlier from our, our correspondent about, uh, about corruption being pretty endemic uh, there in Lebanon anyway, particularly at the port. Yeah, I mean, the, another problem in Lebanon is that there are conflicting authorities. It's never really clear who's in charge. So that there's a port authority, there's the Ministry of Transport, uh, there's the security forces, um, that, you know, so so there are all these overlapping bodies in Lebanon that always pass the, the blame on to each other. You know, we've had food crisis, we've had gas shortages, we've had, um, you know, people are, are really hungry and starving in this country. So, I mean, the real immediate impact, you know, before we assign blame will be how this will devastate the economy, which is already devastated. When you have uh, the entire port of a country just kind of blown to smithereens. Uh, I mean, that's where the wheat is. That's where we get our bread. Um, all those products, all those uh, valuable goods, that will definitely hurt businesses and the economy. That's, people are already broke in this country. They're already, um, the food, price of food is so high. Maybe this will make the food price go higher. Um, so you have to realize Lebanon is a country that is reliant completely on imports. We don't make much. It's a very small country with no manufacturing. So we really rely on that port of Beirut. It's a lifeline. Um, and so that's what people are going to be worried about first. But of course, you'll have all kinds of conspiracies and theories um, that will immediately happen. Uh, people who will say it's Israel, people will say it's Hezbollah, people will say, um, people will read whatever they want. The problem is, is that we don't have information um, in Lebanon and it's very, the government's not very transparent. So you can read whatever theory you want at this point. But yeah, I think it's all possible. I don't think we should jump to conclusions right away, although many will. Many will use this as a political uh, vehicle, uh, even though we've seen fireworks explosions in other countries that have been massively devastating and killed many people, uh, it seems that accidents can happen in Lebanon, yet they happen all the time. The country's going to need help, isn't it, now? Oh. oh, most definitely. The country needs help yesterday. The country needed help uh, five months ago. Uh, you know, we have a, a crippling uh, banking crisis. People can't get money from their banks for like eight months now. Uh, we have a debt crisis. All of the country's revenue goes to paying uh, debt and not actually providing services. We have a currency crisis, which means the currency divided by 80 percent. That means salaries have been slashed by 80 percent. Jobs have been uh, uh, slashed in huge numbers. You know, we have something like 50 percent unemployment, uh, depending on how you count the figures in Lebanon. So the COVID crisis, you know, hospitals are already full um, in Lebanon, and we don't know how many more ICU uh, rooms are left uh, for people with COVID. Now, with this you know, people have been uh, injured miles away. When I felt the explosion, I was like five miles away and my whole body moved. Um, all of my friends, their houses have been, the windows have been destroyed and, you know, glass is an import, right? So how people sleep tonight with no glass in their houses? Um, you know, we're, we're talking about a huge number of economic losses that, you know, we're only going to start calculating as, as, the, as the hours go by. Um, but it will definitely affect everything that is already so devastating um, in Lebanon right now. Really good to talk to you, sir. Many thanks indeed uh, for being with us. Habib uh, Bata there. Let's uh, go back to Al Jazeera Zaina Hodder, uh, who is at the, uh, the scene of the explosion at the port in uh, Beirut. Zaina, the Lebanese Red Cross, the head of the Lebanese Red Cross, says that hundreds of people uh, have been injured and are being treated, but that many people are still trapped uh, in the area of the blast. Zena, can you hear me? It's Adrian in Doha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Adrian, oh. I can hear you. Oh. I'm sorry. As you can imagine, it's very chaotic here. Um, yes, we are outside Beirut port. 
And you can see the Lebanese army is heavy security presence here. They are now leaving Beirut port. Behind them is, is the entrance. Another fire, another fire truck leaving. We've been here for almost three hours now, watching ambulances arrive, ambulances leave, fire trucks arrive, fire trucks leave. Uh, the casualty toll, Lebanese security sources say at least 10 killed. We're expecting that number to rise. Health minister says dozens, hundreds have been injured. This was a massive, massive explosion. And according to the head of the Lebanese uh, general security, it appears to be caused by highly explosive material that was stored in a warehouse at Beirut port. He made that statement a short while ago after he inspected the site. He arrived at Beirut port, left a short while ago. So now, according to General, Major General Abbas Ibrahim, the blast was caused by highly explosive material at Beirut port. You can see ambulances continue to leave the scene of the explosion. It's been a chaotic few hours in the Lebanese capital since Beirut shook by this massive, massive blast, the force of the blast, the magnitude, the scale of the explosion. I've covered many, many uh, bombings, assassination attempts, nothing like this, nothing that shook the capital. Well, some will say maybe the massive bomb that killed the former Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri in 2005. Uh, it was, you, you can compare it to that explosion. That too shook uh, the Lebanese capital. So people are on edge asking questions. At first they thought it was some sort of an attack. Now they're saying it was an accident. So many Lebanese are going to ask, there's going to be more questions now on what this explosive material was doing at Beirut port. We know that uh, the international community has accused the Lebanese authority of not, of not clamping down on corruption at Beirut port. In fact, they have uh, demanded that uh, corruption, uh, th th that the authorities fight corruption at Beirut port is, is one of the conditions uh, before aid, uh, billions of dollars of much needed financial assistance is dispersed to uh, Lebanon. So now that we have a statement from a Lebanese official on what happened or what caused the blast, now there are going to be more questions asked. The Higher Defense Council, this is, um, this group's the head of the army as well as the different security agencies. They are in session at the presidential palace in Babda. The president called for the meeting. We will expect a statement afterwards. Right now, people are making sure that their loved ones were not injured in the attack, uh, excuse me, in the explosion, on the, the massive blast that happened just a few minutes after 6 p.m. local time in Beirut. And so what impact will this have on Lebanon, uh, the country? We were hearing uh, a few moments ago about the port uh, being the main source of, um, well, the country's food imports, the, the materials it, it needs to feed uh, the, uh, the country's population. Uh, of course, the, the country already uh, economically troubled, uh, people having suffered months of um, inflation, uh, of uh, a currency which is, which is no longer uh, worth the, the, the paper that it's printed on. Yes, Adrian, a deep economic crisis that has really destroyed people's livelihoods. Businesses have been closing down. People have been losing their jobs. Unemployment, 32% of the workforce now unemployed. Many who work in the... I'm going to just let you absorb what is happening here. Ambulances continue to evacuate casualties. It's almost, what, three hours now, Adrian, since we, we've been on air, and ambulances still 
evacuating the injured, the dead. You speak English? Yes, were you inside? You were inside when it happened. You work at the port? You work here? No, I work in Beirut. Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah, some people, I managed to speak to a few people who were inside the port when the explosion happened. They were clearly in a state of shock. They could barely speak to me. All they would say was it was a massive explosion and that they saw dead bodies, injured people lying on the, on the ground. This is it's just more in, you know, instability in a country close to bankruptcy. Just yesterday, the foreign minister resigned, accusing the government of not having the will to implement much needed reforms. Among those reforms is fighting corruption in the different state institutions. He resigned. He was replaced just a few hours later. And this really raised a lot of questions among Lebanese. Instead of the authorities, instead of trying to listen to the grievances of the people, they found a replacement. So this is definitely, a, more and more Lebanese are gonna ask about the ability of those in power to keep them safe. This may not be an, 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 an attack. It was an accident, according to the head of general security. It appears that explosive material, the blast was caused by explosive material, but it, where was the safety procedures? They were not put in place. So there will be more, yet more criticism directed against those in power who have really been blamed for years of mismanagement and running the economy into the ground. So I'll, yes, I'll just Lebanese are going to ask more questions. Sorry, you cannot keep us safe. Al Jazeera Zayda Hodder reporting live there from uh, uh, the port uh, in Beirut, as she said, uh, pretty chaotic scenes there. Uh, rescue workers uh, still searching for people uh, killed, injured, trapped under that, uh, that rubble after that huge blast and the multiple fires that, uh, that had started there uh, at uh, the port. Uh, we're hearing from uh, Lebanon's general security chief Abbas Ibrahim, that um, uh, this explosion happened at a warehouse where explosive materials, not, not explosives, but explosive materials uh, had been stored in a, a warehouse. Uh, there's obviously the main seat of the fire that uh, the firefighters are trying to tackle there, but um, uh, in some of the, the other shots that, that we're seeing from the port area, there are numerous fires uh, burning at the, the port area. Uh, an emergency service is reporting that, that there are people trapped, not only there at the scene of the explosion, but in their own homes. Uh, the blast wave damaged buildings several kilometers away. Uh, a lot of uh, windows were shattered, glass injuries, but, but really uh, uh, buildings were, were completely damaged, mangled by this, this huge blast wave that, that came after the explosion. Uh, and as people uh, were, were injured and as I said some uh, reported as still being trapped uh, inside their homes. You can see just how powerful that explosion was uh, by looking at this video from the scene. An initial fire or explosion and fire was followed by uh, a much greater blast or series of blasts even uh, and what appears to be to the untrained eye sort of fireworks going off in that uh, in that area. There are reports also that, that there were fireworks explore, uh, stored in that area, but there you go, that's the main, the main blast. And you can see the extent of that blast wave. A massive explosion that hit downtown Beirut uh, earlier today. And people that have been injured in that explosion have been describing the moment that it happened. My car was down there. It rolled over. I think my injuries are because of the glass. The glass cut me up. My car was like this. I don't know what happened. I was fishing. I heard there was a fire, so I began to head home. Then I heard something explode, and then this happened. I got injured. This is all I know. Uh, let's talk now to uh, Ahmad Mousali, who's an expert in Islamist uh, groups and political science professor 
at the American University of Beirut. He joins us now on the line uh, from there. Good to have you with us, uh, Professor. Uh, where were you when this, this explosion hit earlier today? Well, I was at home sitting uh, on my desk doing some writing, and suddenly I felt uh, the ground shaking under me and the table, you know, goes up and down before an unbelievable wave of thunder and, uh, you know, shaking of the building. I thought it was an earthquake, actually, a high level of an earthquake. I mean, I lived through the Civil War and other wars in Lebanon. We never heard something like this. When, once you realized it, it was an explosion uh, that, that had caused it, uh, what, were your, what were your initial thoughts then? Well, my initial thought that it was probably a strike or, you know, a response to a strike, that something big has happened. So I tried to put on the TV or check my uh, mobile phone and so on to see what happened. And uh, the initial response, I think, uh, for most people, uh, was that it is uh, a military strike. The, the Prime Minister has declared a national day of mourning uh, Wednesday. Uh, what do you think will be the impact on the country uh, of, of this explosion? Lebanon already is going through maybe the toughest time in its history. The state is about to collapse. The economy is already uh, bankrupt. Uh, people are, uh, half of the people are out of their jobs. Uh, poverty is uh, increasing. The uh, funding or the exchange rate in dollar and uh, Lebanese lira is going up and up and up. And I think what happened today is going to lead to massive storm of people going against the government and the state. Just to remind you, last year in October, when it, uh, the demonstrations in Lebanon started, it was because of fires that took place in mountains and the government could not put it down of course along with other causes that have been going on for long corruption mismanagement uh, insensitivity to people's demand and many other issues i think the initial uh, step now is shock people are shocked i think people don't cannot think clearly but I think the next step is going to be a uh, kind of massive action against the government and its lack of any program for the country, any improvement, any support, and so on. So we are going to go through a very tough time, and uh, I'm not very optimistic, actually. Professor, it's been good to talk to you. Many thanks, Steve, for being with us there. Uh, Ahmad Moussali there on the line uh, from Beirut. Let's speak once again to uh, Habib Bata, who we spoke to uh, around 20 minutes ago. Uh, Habib uh, is a journalist, the founder of Beirut Report. You, you heard what, what the professor was saying there about people perhaps uh, uh, taking to the streets again against the government uh, in anger after this. I mean, do, is that a, a point of view you'd agree with? Yeah, I mean, I think at, at some point, you know, whatever happened, there's a, a great failure uh, here to uh, protect people and citizens. And that's been the main protest call is that people want a government that cares for them. Um, um, they want a government that performs the basic uh, public uh, services. You know, we don't have electricity. We, we've been in the dark uh, for half of uh, half the day in Lebanon for the last few months uh, because the government can't manage to provide electricity. Uh, we, we, we have fuel shortages. I was, as I, before I, 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 before the explosions, I was filling up gas at a gas station. They wouldn't give me uh, enough gas uh, to fill my car. Um, so, so we're constantly in a state of crisis. 
Um, and, and, and that's really the reality of life in Lebanon. It's a very difficult life to live in Lebanon, um, to wake up in the morning with uh, multiple headlines and problems. Uh, just two days ago, we had a threat of a war with Israel. Um, so you really, you, you know, you can't escape. It's a constant life of stress and trauma. And I think that this uh, will also have an emotional impact. There will be plenty of people that will be killed, um, injured, uh, fragments of glass, you know, millions and probably billions of dollars in damages. Uh, but then there's the emotional trauma. Um, you know, I'm still feeling rattled. I wasn't even, you know, at the site of the explosion, but I felt it so strong. And I, I'm still feeling emotionally rattled. And I think that's a minor, I have a minor case of it, um, you know, because it's, 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 like it's kind of like a PTSD when, you, when you're always being bombed. When you've lived with so many bombings and so many wars, we've had like 10 wars in Lebanon in the last uh, 20, 30 years. So, uh, you know, th these kind of things, they spark that uh, trauma in your, in your mind, you know, that, that your heart starts beating. And when, when I heard I jumped in my car and I raced and the cars were almost crashing uh, into each other on the streets. Um, but, you know, Lebanon is an unregulated life, a life without a strong state, you know. Uh, anyone who, who thinks about making government small and doing away with regulations should come here uh, because this country is... A constant disaster. As the professor said, the forest fires uh, were one of the factors that got people angry because the government couldn't control the forest fires. And now we've actually sold uh, the helicopters in Lebanon that are supposed to fight forest fires. So we're, the helicopters are, are probably not even able to fight this massive blaze at the port uh, very well because many of them have uh, been, been sold off or auctioned off. Um, so the state is literally selling itself off. And as people, that's um, how desperate things are. Yeah, as as people um, emerge from that that initial emotional trauma, um, the next thing they're going to feel, you, you think, is anger. And 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 how will they channel that anger? Uh, where where is this? What I'm trying to say is, this a dangerous moment for for, for Lebanon, or or is it? Do you think the, the catalyst that could provoke the change that the country so desperately needs? Well, I don't know. Um, it's it's difficult to say. I mean, these kind of things get very messy, and it's hard to you know uh, create a you know a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel and say things are going to uh, be well because of this. I mean, I think that uh, people blame each other. Um, so that's one of the problems why I think the protests haven't really succeeded in the countries because the country is very very deeply divided. So people will will create their own bad guys out of this story. Some people will blame the government. Some people will blame Israel. Some people will say it was a drone. People have said that they heard planes. Um, there will be all kinds of theories. Um, so I don't know if anger in the streets has been helping the country. Um, it's definitely a natural outpouring, and it's very expected that people would be very angry at, so for so many reasons. But did that, has that led to a positive change? It hasn't been an organized anger. It's been a, just an unorganized anger. So um, for in large part, let's say. There are definitely organizations out there. Um, so I don't know if this will really benefit the country because the economic loss will be so devastating. Um, so I don't know if people will even have the money and the time to be, um, you know, going out and, and, and expressing their opinions uh, if they can barely uh, survive. So it could be, there could be protests again, but I think people are just so exhausted um, in this country, emotionally and mentally exhausted. Um, I don't even know if they have the energy uh, to keep fighting and fighting and fighting constantly. Um, so I think people will try to huddle down, uh, protect their own. Um, you know, who knows? You know, as I said, the, the, a giant wheat silo was was there uh, in the port. So that could make the price of bread go up. Uh, we could see a price uh, increase. And we've already seen a quadrupling of prices um, in some cases in supermarket items. So uh, there's desperation and anger. Um, there could be, you know, he, he could be right. There could be more protests. There definitely will be. The protests will, will use their advantage. But the problem is the country is, is so deeply, deeply, deeply politically divided from its actual founding um, that it, it's, it's hard to just have a critical mass of people thinking one thing um, in Lebanon. And that's one of the biggest problems in Lebanon is there isn't really kind of teamwork or a team spirit to actually save this country. Everybody's going in different directions. And again, this country doesn't make a lot of sense as a country to begin with. Everybody knows that. Um, you're putting people together, have very different worldviews. Um, you know, half of the country looks toward uh, Iran um, and China, and half the country looks toward uh, France and the United States and Saudi Arabia. And, you know, these international powers have played up that. They will play this to their advantage always. They will support opposing sides. Lebanon is the world's chessboard. 
um, and this is where the Cold Wars happen. So, you know, decisions are not always made in Lebanon that determine Lebanon's fate. Uh, many are, but they're, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to untangle the um, division in this country. And okay. I don't know if another violent event will do that, because we've had so many violent events in this country. We've had so many wars and bombings, um, and that hasn't really set the country on a, on a better path. Uh, so I think right now it's just going to be about, you know, counting the losses. And I think we haven't scratched the surface yet. Habib, good to talk to you. Many thanks. Habib Bata there, uh, founder of uh, Beirut Report. It is 1800 hours GMT. Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Al Jazeera. Uh, if you've just joined us, there's been a huge explosion in Lebanon's capital, Beirut. At least 10 people have been killed. Lebanese security officials say the blast was triggered by explosive material that was stored in a warehouse in the port area, which is at the heart of the city. Lebanon's president has called an emergency meeting and the prime minister has called a national day of mourning on Wednesday. The head of the Lebanese Red Cross says that hundreds of injured people have been taken to hospital, but that many people are still trapped in their homes. The cause of the blast is uh, still unclear at the moment. Uh, Israel, however, has issued a statement denying any involvement. Omar Nashabi is a criminal justice analyst. Uh, he joins us now on the line uh, from Beirut. Omar, good to, to have you with us uh, here. Uh, take us through your experience of what happened today. Where were you when, when this happened? Good question, because the connection is not very good. Uh, but uh, what I can tell you is that this was a, one of the, I think, the largest explosion. I mean, I lived through the whole war, and we never had an explosion that large. You know, the explosion took place at the airport, uh, at the seaport, I'm sorry, and it's a warehouse of highly explosive material. It's still not clear what this material is about. I mean, there are some uh, early reports that this is nitric acid and fertilizers. Now, uh, what has caused the explosion, uh, there was obviously a fire, and then later on it led to an explosion. The investigation is on the way. The Lebanese army is doing the investigation uh, with uh, some judicial authorities, uh, the judicial authorities overseeing the investigation. Uh, I don't think we will have any indications that are accurate until tomorrow. However, the explosion created a lot of destruction all over the city. We have uh, many, many wounded They're still being moved to the hospital right now. And uh, apparently there are uh, allegations and reports that there are some uh, victims under the rubble. So uh, there are uh, rescue operations on the way to remove the people from under the rubble. Now, the country has been going through a lot of uh, problems. This comes at a time when the country is under, uh, uh, is under very, very difficult economic situation. The uh, local currency has, been, uh, has lost its, uh, its value, uh, 10 times its value. Uh, the, uh, there is a government where things are not going very well with the government. Uh, yesterday, there was a resignation of the foreign minister. And on top of that, you have the coronavirus outbreak. The contamination rate has been increasing in the past week. So uh, adding to these two problems, the economic and financial uh, uh, crisis and the coronavirus outbreak comes this explosion. And there's talk about a chemical agent that is uh, uh, nitric acid. It's not sure, but uh, there, is, there was a very, there's a very strange smell now in the city in parts of the city, and uh, the, the cloud that uh, was uh, produced by this huge explosion is colored the reddish orange, and uh, therefore it is a very unusual uh, color that uh, indicates uh, probably that there is a chemical uh, agent. Uh, we don't know how dangerous this is, but the people, uh, experts are advising people to stay home. Omar, if this turns out to be... Uh an industrial accident, accident uh, of sorts. Uh, who takes responsibility? How do people who, who are victims of this, uh, if they've been injured, uh, if they have relatives yes. who've been killed, how, how do they get justice? Yes, this is, uh, this is a big question. And uh, it, I think it's still very much early for anyone to answer it. However, we, I can tell you and I can tell the viewers that this country has been suffering with the whole process of holding people in positions of responsibility accountable. Uh, the system of accountability that is supposed to be part of the democratic system 
and of any government uh, is uh, not functioning well. Uh, you know, there are so many reports of corruption in Lebanon. And people in positions of power and in positions in the government have not been held accountable, although in many cases there was a lot of evidence that shows that they have been involved in corruption. You know, the biggest fear is that uh, this uh, is something that has to do with politics, because also uh, we are expecting the uh, judgment from the Special Tribunal for Lebanon on Friday. So uh, it would be, uh, yeah, you know, everybody, or, or I mean, it would be expected that people will make a correlation between those two events. Now, it's not sure uh, scientifically and judicially there's nothing to indicate any correlation or there are no signs that indicate that this is a criminal act that has been done on purpose and that it's related to the judgment that is supposed to come out on Friday. Uh, however, we don't know yet. I mean, we're still very much early on in the investigation. So, uh, and I, the investigation has to remain confidential uh, until uh, the, it is completed. So, we have to wait a few hours more to know more uh, what comes out of this investigation and if this was an accident or was it a terrorist attack. We cannot have a, a confirmation to deny or confirm any of these two possibilities. And, and Omar, once people um, have got over the, the shock, the emotional trauma uh, of, of what they've lived through today, uh, I'm assuming that, that they, yes. they, will, they will become angry. Um, how do you think that they will, they will vent that anger? Uh, anger? Is, this a, is this a dangerous moment for the country? Omar, you, can you hear me? No, I'm afraid we, uh, we seem to have lost uh, the line to uh, Omar there. Um, let's uh, talk about... Uh, hang on a second. We're now going to go back to uh, Habib uh, Bata again, who's uh, a journalist, the founder of uh, the Beirut Report. He's been with us over the last uh, half an hour or so. Uh, you were presumably listening, uh, Habib, to, to what uh, Omar uh, was, uh, was saying there. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think that, you know, this country is not prepared for disasters and, you know, it's, it's hanging by a thread. And so, you know, we've always lived in fear of a major um, catastrophe, a natural disaster, uh, an earthquake. Um, you know, this country has no emergency uh, readiness and no response. There are barely enough police uh, to control the highways, which are extremely dangerous. Um, so in any, any place where you, where you find a government tries to uh, put in regulations and safety for citizens in any country you live in, we don't have any of that here. So there's no highway patrol. There's no fire inspections of buildings. You know, there are many buildings in Beirut that have flammable materials. Um, I interviewed firefighters for a story once. And they didn't even have firefighting suits uh, to, to go into fires. So, so you know, the, the, and the infrastructure in the country is so bad. Some of the roads in Lebanon are, the, are, are, are made for donkey carts, uh, literally. I mean, they've been the same roads for hundreds of years, probably. So, uh, you know, th th everything is very tight, uh, tight squeezes, uh, tightly fitted uh, warehouses, um, you know, things that are very flammable. You know, gas stations are a disaster in Lebanon. We had a gas station blow up in Lebanon a few years ago. Um, because of the, the gas tank. So there's no regulation on how um, flammable substances are controlled in this country. Um, and then you will have those who will claim that they were weapons um, uh, that were stored there. But again, we have no ability to know that. So people are just jumping to conclusions and they're so anxious um, and they're ready to, you know, uh, 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 lynch any, 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 any cause or person that they hold responsible for without even having evidence. Um, and so people are on edge um, in this country, you know, just driving around today, people were just driving so uh, crazily. Um, that's before all of this happened. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, this is just one example of how a country that doesn't have any kind of emergency preparation uh, will, will really suffer very badly in any other consequence. And, you know, we've expected earthquakes in this country for a long time. We're on a fault zone. Uh, we have a number of dangerous uh, government projects that are uh, building on, on fault zones. Um, and, and so this is kind of a, a, a rehearsal for how bad things can be. But just to really reiterate, this was like a natural disaster because it didn't just affect the area or the few blocks around the explosion site. I have friends that live 10 or 15 minutes away um, who, who showed me their entire house and their room were blown out. And I just wonder how people are going to sleep tonight without windows. Um, well, 
Habib, and, we, and, and Habib so sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We, we, when we, we yeah. talked earlier, we, uh, this has come at such a, 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 a terrible time for, for, for Lebanon, uh, economically and, and politically. Um, uh, we, we were talking about the fact that the country is going to need some help after this because, I mean, the port, as you were saying, uh, is where um, all of the raw materials for, for, for the food that, that its, its people need to eat are, are, are imported. Where is that help going to come from? That's another great question. You know, um, Lebanon, because uh, it's in this cold war between Iran and the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, nobody wants to help Lebanon unless Lebanon follows the politics that they want. And the problem is that Lebanon is not aligned. It cannot be um, just, you know, marshaled into one position or another. Um, you know, the U.S. has demanded and put pressure on Lebanon economically, uh, put sanctions, has, you know, restricted flights for, for decades uh, because of Hezbollah. Um, because they feel that it's a, 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 you know, a terrorist group and supporting a terrorist country. So they have put pressure on us in that way. Um, the other, other countries have uh, put pressure on us to uh, turn away uh, from the U.S. But as a small country, it's very hard to take positions um, like that because you're really at the whim of other countries. And other countries have refused to help Lebanon unless there is some kind of other countries. And other countries have refused to help Lebanon unless there is some kind of uh, political reform. Um, this political reform, again, it doesn't, it, every, every kind of help has strings attached. You know, foreign aid is not charity. Um, and countries have been trying to aid Lebanon for decades, but they've done so in a certain way that um, promotes their own interest in the country. Okay. So the problem with aid is that it always has strings attached. Um, it, it often impoverishes the country more uh, because of the high debt rates, uh, interest rates on debt. Uh, we pay extremely high borrowing costs in Lebanon, um, and there are a lot of debate about how that came to be uh, because it's an unstable country. So, you know, Lebanon in, in some ways doesn't know where to turn anymore uh, because everybody wants um, a certain agenda in the country okay. and no one wants to give money for free. And, and Habib, one more question. Um, uh, uh, you, you look at the, the, from where I'm sitting, you know, I'm look, sitting in front of a computer here and I'm looking at all the, the, the wire services and... Uh, 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 you know, an hour or so after the blast, there's, there's a statement that uh, uh, comes in. The Israeli government, Israel had nothing to do with Beirut blast, quoting Israeli government official. What, what are we to make of that, that remarkable uh, denial, and, and so very quickly after it had happened? Yeah, it tells you a lot, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, why would you um, immediately say uh, you're not having nothing to do with a crime, that you are nowhere near the crime scene? Um, so, 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 what, so you can tell actually because people were blaming Israel because Israel has been involved in those kind of bombings so many times in Lebanon that it almost uh, knows that people will blame it. So the fact that that's even happening tells you a, a deeper story about the relationship between Lebanon and Israel, which has been a very violent one. Um, and we've been on the receiving end of that most, uh, most entirely uh, with the number of casualties and whatnot. So uh, they, they, you know, but people won't believe Israel. People do not believe Israel because they've lied uh, so many times uh, in Lebanon, and they've broken so many ceasefires. Um, and people, people here feel that they are, uh, you know, a kind of a, a, a very violent uh, a government that's willing to make any kind of lie to, to get its way. So it might have been Israel. It might not have. They might have had nothing to do with this. Um, but even if they didn't have anything to do with it, that's how complicated Lebanon is. Is that once one event, a uh, violent event happens, it can be read in so many ways. Habib, good to talk to you. Habib Bata there. Uh, speaking from uh, from Lebanon. Uh, if you've just joined us, this is uh, Al Jazeera. Um, there's been a huge explosion uh, in Lebanon's uh, capital, Beirut. At least 10 people are known to have been killed. That, that death toll, though, is going to increase in the coming hours and days. Lebanese security officials say that that blast was triggered by explosive material that was stored in a warehouse in the port area, which is at the heart of the city. The president has called an emergency meeting. The prime minister has called a national day of mourning for Wednesday. The head of the Lebanese Red Cross says that hundreds of people have been taken to hospital uh, with uh, blast injuries. Uh, many are still trapped in their homes. The initial blast wave uh, caught uh, uh, um, traveled kilometers uh, away from the actual site of the, the, the blast. and, and Homes, buildings were damaged, windows were blown out. Uh, people suffered uh, cuts, bruises, glass injuries. The cause at this stage, unclear. Although, as we were saying just a few moments ago, Israel was quick to issue a statement uh, denying any involvement. Al Jazeera's Zaina Hodder is 
uh, live for us now outside the, the port in uh, Beirut where that explosion happened. Uh, and you've been witnessing, Zena, since that explosion, some pretty chaotic scenes there. Well, yes, Adrian, chaotic scenes outside Beirut port as ambulances uh, arrive to evacuate the dead and the wounded. But we have since moved to uh, one of the hospitals in the center of Beirut, the American University Hospital, where most of the uh, injured have been taken. Uh, there are also uh, requests on social media for people to donate blood because really dozens and dozens of people were injured in this massive, massive blast that shook the Lebanese capital. You mentioned uh, explosive material at one of the warehouses. That is what the head of one of uh, Lebanon's security agencies, General Major General Abbas Ibrahim, announced about approximately an hour ago. And now we are hearing from Lebanon's interior minister, Mohammed Fahmi. What he is saying is that highly explosive ammonium nitrate was stored in the port. And he says that the Lebanese people should ask customs about why it was there. So officials uh, trying to really distance themselves on what this highly explosive material was doing at Beirut port uh, that caused this massive blast that has taken the lives of at least 10 people. That is what we understand from Lebanese security sources. But dozens and dozens of people have been injured. Uh, some hospitals have started to turn away patients. Uh, the health care system in Lebanon is under a lot of pressure, uh, not just because of an economic crisis, but because of an upsurge in the number of coronavirus cases. This is a government which is cash strapped. This is a state which is close to bankruptcy. And this is a state that owes billions of dollars to Lebanon's private hospitals. Uh, one of those private hospitals is this one, AUH. But what we understand is that they are um, receiving uh, the injured and treating those who are injured. But there are calls now for people to donate blood, all types of blood, in order to help uh, those who uh, were hurt. Many of them, uh, in their, their, their injuries as a result of uh, falling, falling glass. Uh, and as you can see, family members outside the hospital waiting for news uh, for, about their loved ones. There was panic when uh, just moments after that massive explosion. I was not very far from AUH, this hospital, when it happened. And we are a few kilometers uh, from Beirut port. And I felt the, the, the the, the scale and the magnitude of, of, of this blast, which which shook the ground, pushed us to the to the ground, and and, and caused a lot of panic uh, among residents who had no idea what had just happened. And the smoke, the color of the smoke, what I saw uh, was orange. So maybe it makes, I'm not an expert, but now that the Lebanese interior minister is saying that this highly explosive ammonium nitrate was stored at Beirut port. So many, many questions are now going to be answered. What was this material doing at a Beirut port? Why was it there? Who put it there and uh, and but right now the concern of many Lebanese as you can see is the uh, condition of their loved ones who are now inside uh, the emergency uh, the emergency room this is a city on edge a country on edge uh, people um, on their nerves really concerned and worried uh, about what tomorrow will bring. Their livelihoods have been shattered by this explosion. Many, many shops have been uh, damaged, uh, goods on the floor for so many people. This is all that they had left in a country where there's a deep economic recession, in a country where businesses have been closing, uh, people have been losing their jobs, and a healthcare system that is collapsing. This is one of the biggest hospitals in Lebanon. And a few weeks ago, they laid off 850 nurses and administrators because they could not pay um, their salaries, because the government owes private hospitals billions of dollars. And that is why uh, some hospitals have started to turn away patients because they don't have the supplies needed uh, to help them. So now 
the, the priority now is for uh, to, to, to help and treat those who were injured in this blast. And um, I can tell you the past, what, it's been three hours now since the explosion. I haven't seen, uh, I've seen um, ambulances come and go nonstop to the explosion site uh, and, and uh, taking the injured to, to hospitals across across the capital. All right, Zena, many thanks. Al Jazeera, Zena Hoda reporting live there from uh, uh, Beirut. Uh, let's uh, speak to uh, Mohammed Khalifa, who uh, is uh, was formerly uh, Lebanon's health minister. He joins us now on the line uh, from Beirut. Uh, good to have you with us. Uh, so we saw their uh, anxious relatives waiting outside the hospital for news uh, of uh, of their. Uh, the, the dearest, the, the, the nearest uh, who've been injured in this blast, hundreds of people injured uh, today, and all of this is happening in the midst of a pandemic. Can the city's health services cope? Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening. Hi, hi sir. Uh, can Lebanon's health uh, services cope? Uh, well, let me see. I've been listening. Actually, myself and my family narrowly escaped the death. I am living next to university, and still I am a professor of surgery. And I was leading the. Just I left because of dehydration. We were treating hundreds of casualties along with my team because still I am operating as a professor of surgery in the university. Uh, I think uh, it is a disaster. I never seen something like that except when I was trained during the uh, rough time of the Lebanese civil war. People there were rushing in hundreds no place to accommodate. Our team is one of the biggest team around the world, like 100 physicians and nurses. Barely we could absorb the shock. We managed to do in several waves. And uh, really, we have uh, mortalities. We managed to save a lot of people. Uh, but things beyond any imagination, injuries all over. Certain people, they have seven or eight injuries in different places. You can see nucleated eyes. You can see tear bodies. Uh, on top, we have to mix with everybody in the era of COVID, uh, where you cannot do protection because people, you are between to get COVID or to save somebody else's life. Uh, just I, I was sitting at my home. I told my family, shouted, take care. There is an earthquake. And immediately in my favorite place, everything collapsed and narrowly I escaped this. I left family and jumped to the hospital to save lives. We are in a very bad situation economically, medical supplies, shortage of everything. We managed to cope, but the devastation is beyond any description. And, and what, what are the, tell us about the nature of the injuries you are seeing today. Uh, people, they were sitting at home. They're at home. Some, they have pressure injuries. They were traveling in their cars. Their heads, maybe they hit uh, the wheel steer or they hit somewhere. Uh, people from Packer injuries because you can see their faces are uh, swollen. Uh, others direct injuries due to glass injuries, fragments. Uh, people, you know, Beirut is a very crowded city. If you are passing on a street and immediately tons of glasses collapses and hit you on the street from 20, 30 meter height, there are different sort of uh, impact uh, injuries, high velocity, medium velocity, pressure injuries, acceleration injuries, deceleration injuries, what we describe it in medical terms. Uh, yes, it is very bad. It is, wasn't unexpected. Everybody, I, I told we saw there is an earthquake, and in after like 20 seconds, we had the major explosion. And everybody, he felt that this was a special incident at his home. For example, I have some people when they come with me from the hospital, being uh, they told me, oh, we escaped the explosion I told them, what is the explosion after they came to pick me up? They told me it's next door, downstairs. And imagine it is in the, in the port, and my house is 500 meters far from there. Everybody was under the impression that the explosion went on in his own home. Given the, the, the stress that the healthcare system is under right now in, in Lebanon, can, can it cope with this? Will it, will it be overwhelmed with, with the, number of, the sheer number of injuries and casualties we've seen today? Yes. I'm not afraid. The people who came in, they received excellent treatment. I'm afraid that in certain buildings, if some people, they were living alone, they have uh, no families or no relatives to check up on them, I'm afraid uh, to miss those uh, patients and uh, to miss uh, their opportunity of the treatment. Uh, 
Yes, uh, we have several people they were about in the version of cardiac arrest. Uh, some people, they two or three, they came dead on arrival. Uh, yes, we are coping. We use, still, we use to such injuries. You know, Lebanon passed through a lot. We have good expertise, but definitely resources, uh, the epidemic, adding the epidemic, adding the financial situation, adding the status of uh, uh, depression among the people. The mood is very depressive to start with. Without this, you need, the mood is very low. People are uncertain. Economically, they are depleted. Um, they are uh, living on uh, in poverty. I don't know. I don't know what's happening for a country like uh, Lebanon, a small country in Beirut, and uh, as if you are witnessing uh, what we call it, the uh, slow death yeah. before this explosion. Uh, we people, they were going on yeah. from bad to worse. Everyone we've spoken to today said has said, I've never felt anything like this, and I've and I've experienced a lot. Uh, of explosions no. in, in my life, as everyone no. as everyone in Beirut has, um, uh, this will have traumatised a lot of people, won't it? I mean, it will have it will have brought back a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of bad memories for, for, for a lot of people there. How, do you think Look, that, that you know, you'll, you'll be dealing with with post traumatic stress disorder after after no, something it's very like simple. this today? It's very simple. If if you if we if if you have a, a, a your own phone, just I send you that name. I'm talking to you. If it wasn't a matter of seconds, I could have been torn apart. Mm. If you see, the, when I came from the university, I've been operating all the day. I have a favorite place to sit. Usually, they bring me some water to hydrate and so on. And then my wife called me, no, today you have to come here. Since we married 20 years ago, never she said like that. I stood up and then I told, take care, the building is going to collapse, there's an earthquake. And in two seconds, like a 200 piece of a glass fall apart where I was sitting, it hit me tangentially. Myself, if you called me with a matter of second, my, uh, my phone couldn't answer you because I was dead. Mm. So if you ask me about the general situation, I'm telling you about myself. If yeah. you ask me why, I will tell you, look, I invested throughout my life. I'm a professor of surgery. I'm the first one who did liver transplantation in the Middle East. I am Kaza Kaza. Immediately I could have died and I don't want to hear an excuse with all my due respect, my friend, the Minister of Interior, that such material was imported, was uh, uh, deposited next to the uh, uh, pillows of uh, our citizens. We know what is nitrate, whether it's being used or whatever it is. This is not the right place to store it. And this shouldn't be proud. Somebody should be ashamed of saying this to the public that we are uh, depositing whatever it is, even for manufacturing, even for uh, farming, over for... This is an, a material cannot be deposited in the most crowded area in the Middle East. I don't know what it is. I'm not saying, I'm not talking politics. I'm not blaming everybody and anybody wants to blame me. But as simple as that. It's really good to talk to you, sir. Many thanks indeed for I'm being sure, with us I'm today. sure, yeah. I'm sure there is a say, if somebody is idiot, yeah. it's better to shut down rather than talk and take any doubt. Yeah. Thank you for being with us, sir. Uh, that's uh, Mohammed okay, Khalifa, uh, formerly Lebanon's uh, health minister. Let's go back to uh, Al Jazeera Zayn Ahoda then, uh, who's at uh, one of the Beirut's hospitals. Uh, Lebanon, uh, Lebanon, of course, not only uh, dealing with uh, an economic crisis, uh, Zayn, uh, and the events of today, and th this is happening in the middle of a pandemic, of course. Yes. A rise in coronavirus cases really has strained the healthcare system in the country. We are outside one of the main hospitals in Beirut, the American University Hospital. Uh, many injured have been taken here. Uh, they're inside the emergency ward. Their families are desperately uh, awaiting news about their conditions. What we understand is that there are a number of people who are in critical condition. A lot of people were injured by this explosion. The health minister saying in their hundreds. It wasn't just people. Uh, um, who were uh, close to the site of the explosion at Beirut port, who were either killed or injured. I, I must say that uh, Lebanese security sources say at least 10 have so far been killed. But people kilometers and kilometers away uh, were hurt by shattered glass. Uh, some were getting some reports that people were on their balconies and the balcony collapsed. Uh, uh, there's glass ac uh, across the city, damage across the city, uh, destruction 
destruction that people really have never seen before. And this is a country that is not immune to political violence and assassinations and bombings. Uh, they've seen it happen over the years. This is also a country that witnessed the 15 years of a war that ended in 1990. But the sheer force of this explosion, this massive blast was felt kilometers and kilometers away. Um, it pushed people to the ground. Uh, uh, there was a lot of panic. So uh, we are also uh, getting reports that the Red Cross is appealing uh, for uh, blood donations. They're asking whoever is able to uh, come to hospitals to donate blood because they're in desperate need of blood. A lot of the cases, uh, uh, people are suffering from cuts, from, from, uh, from shattered glass. Uh, and we, we talked about a, a health care system that is close to, to collapse. This is a private hospital, and the Lebanese government owes this hospital billions of dollars. And private hospitals have been threatened uh, with closure in recent weeks because they do not have enough money to be able to treat everybody. And a lot of people who have lost their jobs over the years have lost their, their insurance as well. Um, um, as you can see how tense the situation is, it's not clear. It seems this man wants to enter the emergency ward. It's not clear what problem he is facing, but you can imagine how, how people are tense, how people are on the edge. A lot of them don't know the well-being of their family members, uh, and a lot of them also injured. So it, it, I, I have covered many, many explosions in this country. Nothing, nothing like this. The destruction, you just drive through the streets of Beirut, central Beirut, as well as here in the Hamra district, uh, shattered glass on the floor, uh, damaged vehicles, stores, the uh, stores blown, the, the facade of the stores blown apart. It's, 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 it's very chaotic, Adrian, and all these people, um, waiting for news of their loved ones. Uh, Zainab, you can imagine yeah. how tense the situation is. Yeah. Um, and Zena, before you moved to the hospital, uh, you were for a couple of hours at the, at the site of the explosion at the port. Uh, just, just remind us of, of what you saw there. Uh, it was pretty chaotic there, wasn't it? Yes, Adrian. First of all, it was kind of difficult to reach the site of the explosion as, as some roads closed, a panic in the street. Uh, uh, and uh, once we got there, uh, we, we were there for approximately two hours. And I can tell you that ambulances uh, uh, kept arriving nonstop, entering the uh, Beirut ports and, and coming out a few minutes later uh, with, 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 some, um, with a casualty either injured or or dead in the back of the ambulance and and this went on for two hours fire trucks as well to put out the flames uh, the lebanese uh, the head of one of lebanon's uh, security agencies uh, major general abbas ibrahim uh, inspected the site of the explosion and he told reporters that it appears it appears that the blast was caused by highly explosive material that was stored at the warehouse and it was stored in this warehouse house for years and it was confiscated material something that the interior minister uh, minutes later uh confirmed and reiterated that this was ammonium uh, nitrate and and he was asking questions what was it doing uh, in the warehouse at Beirut port and this is definitely going to be a question that many Lebanese are going to ask in the hours and days ahead because this would point to negligence on the part of, uh, of, of, of Lebanese authorities who are already um, under a lot of criticism for running the economy into the ground for failing to resolve of Lebanon's worst economic crisis in decades for failing to carry out reforms uh, to fix corruption in the state in order for Lebanon to be eligible uh, for an IMF, International Monetary Fund, bailout plan. Lebanon is in need of billions of dollars. The state is close to bankruptcy. Uh, you can see ambulances uh, continue to arrive. What we understand some other hospitals are facing a lot, uh, are under strain. Some of the uh, victims 
victims, some of the casualties are being treated in uh, parking lots outside. So this really just shows you how much, how many crises this country is dealing with. Um, economic crisis, financial crisis, people's savings locked in banks, informal capital controls in place, a Lebanese lira, a local currency that has devalued people's salaries, worth, uh, really worth nothing. Uh, people's life savings also worth nothing. Uh, there's a scarcity in hard currency, which makes it very, very difficult to, uh, to import. This is a country that is import dependent. It imports 80% of its needs. Um, now they they are evacuating uh, a casualty from from an ambulance, as you can see, Adrian. It's uh, it's a very, very, very difficult situation uh, for Lebanese who are watching these scenes. They've seen scenes like this. This may have been an ac accident. They will definitely blame the authorities for negligence, but they have seen scenes like this over the years as a result of bombings and uh, 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 assassination attempts. Uh, and um, you can hear people screaming in the background. People are, 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 are on the edge are on the edge yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, I'm sorry it is quite chaotic here we have to just move out of the way so Adrian you can see they're still uh, still bringing in casualties uh, to the hospital uh, many many people have been injured so, as you can see more uh, medical staff arriving already there's a there is a shortage in medical staff uh, in, in fact tomorrow the uh, association of nurses was planning a strike um, uh, and a sit-in to highlight the conditions that they're working in because they get little pay and because they don't have enough staff. This hospital alone fired 850 nurses and administrators in the past few weeks. So a strike was called for, it's being called for tomorrow by nurses. Just shows you how the healthcare system is collapsing in this country. So this is going to be um, it's going to be a very very difficult night for the doctors and nurses who work uh, in the different private and public hospitals across across the country. All right, Zaina, many thanks indeed. Uh, Zaina Hodder reporting live from the American University of Beirut. France says that it's ready to help Lebanon in any way that Lebanese authorities deem necessary. That's uh, the French Foreign Minister uh, tweeting uh, a statement there. Also tweeting uh, Iran's uh, Foreign Minister uh, Zarif saying that Iran stands ready to help Lebanon in any way necessary following the blast in Beirut. Well, the UN says that it has no information yet on the cause of the explosion. The spokesman said that there are no reports of injuries among UN staff in Beirut. We uh, have no indication from our colleagues in Lebanon uh, that uh, there's been any harm uh, to UN personnel or facilities. And certainly I hope uh, that uh, they're all okay and I hope that the people uh, of Lebanon are okay. Uh, these, they're very worrying signs of explosions. We do not have uh, uh, information about what has happened precisely, what has caused this, whether uh, it's uh, an accidental or man-made act. And so we will need that information to respond. Once we get that, we'll probably try to express something further. But uh, at this stage, our thoughts uh, are with the people of Lebanon. And we hope that whatever has happened, uh, that uh, the damage is limited and, uh, and that uh, the safety of the Lebanese people uh, 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 will be ensured. Uh, we've told you about how this, uh, the blast in Beirut uh, impacted upon homes that were several kilometers away from the, the site of the explosion. Earlier we spoke with uh, reporter Anshul Vora, uh, who uh, is in Beirut or lives in Beirut. Uh, this is her front room. Uh, she was watching TV at the time. See how powerful that blast was? Her home was badly damaged uh, by the impact of the explosion. Uh, Anshul herself suffered minor injuries, and when we spoke to her several hours ago, uh, she was clearly in shock. Here's how she described what happened to her. We were just 
just watching a show on Netflix, taking a break from work. And I heard uh, a jet hovering in the sky. And because this has been happening for some time, I opened the window, glass door, and looked outside. And the entire building shook and I was blown by it. I'm bleeding on my neck. Uh, I think I think it's glass on my neck and my ankle. I wouldn't say I'm seriously injured, but a lot of people around me on the street where I live in, which is called Jemeze, a Christian-dominated area, a lot of people are bleeding. There's absolute chaos here. People cannot understand how to react to this situation. This country has already been grappling with so much. Earlier in the day, I was filing a story on how the price of bread has doubled. But how are these people going to deal with the situation now? Thankfully, my neighbor is okay. I haven't yet many... I haven't yet... Uh, I don't know if there are any casualties yet or not because I'm right under my house. But my entire house was blown apart. There's nothing that I could actually pick up from there other than my phone, luckily. I found my phone and I found my passport. Uh, my husband is with me. We're on the street right now, also on the job, trying to film, trying to talk to people and understand what's happened. Other uh, journalists now collecting at the same spot. We're outside the Red Cross. A lot of people trying to go in. I haven't yet managed to get to the building of Red Cross. I don't know whether it's been bombed or not. There's people around me bleeding everywhere. Complete chaos. I mean, you know, one doesn't want to sort of talk about who's done this yet, but deaths have been hovering above, hovering above these skies over the over the last two months now. So complete chaos. Uh, many were anticipating this, but it's just such a heartbreaking moment. Let's uh, speak once again to Habib Bata, who's uh, a journalist and the founder of Beirut Report. He joins us now uh, from the northern suburbs of. Uh, uh, Beirut near Antelias. Uh, good to have you with us uh, again, Habib. Uh, just a few moments ago, I don't know whether you heard me, uh, tweet from uh, France's foreign minister saying that France stands ready uh, to, uh, to help in any way uh, that it can. This goes back to where the help that Lebanon needs is going to come from. Uh, and also that tweet from, uh, from Iran's foreign minister, Zarif, uh, also saying that, that Iran stands ready to help Lebanon. What are we to make of all of this? I mean, we really hope so. You know, we can use all the help we can get. Um, as I said yesterday and, and, and months ago, uh, this country has been suffering. But, you know, there are a lot of promises and a lot of pledges, but uh, most of the time uh, they don't actually pan out. So hopefully uh, there will be money. The French uh, minister was in Beirut a few weeks ago and he gave money. Uh, a, a lot of money was given to French schools um, in Lebanon. So again, they were very uh, not really helpful for the government, and the government actually complained that France were, could have settled this over an email. Um, so there's a lot of political posturing. Uh, hopefully, this tragedy will not be seen as a political one, uh, like the government's economic collapse, uh, and people will just give money um, just to help. Uh, but again, it, it's hard to imagine money without strings attached um, in a country like Lebanon, where uh, that's precisely the reason why the country is in so much debt, because it's borrowed so much money. Um, and, and actually, and it's been propped up by so many foreign powers all these years. The country could have collapsed probably years and years ago, but constantly being propped up by different uh, powers. So there's a skepticism, I think, uh, when it comes to foreign aid uh, to Lebanon. But uh, at this time, uh, hopefully it will be treated as a humanitarian crisis, uh, like an earthquake or something. And people will just give money without asking uh, uh, questions. Obviously, the money should go to the, the people who need it, uh, the hospitals. Uh, in Lebanon really need uh, money. The government owes the hospitals millions of dollars, as your doctor was mentioning. It's just incredible how hospitals continue to operate um, at a loss uh, in many cases in Lebanon. Uh, people, uh, you know, the price of healthcare is also quite expensive. So, um, you know, it's very, it's, it's a very, it's a very collapsing healthcare system, as Zaina mentioned. Uh, and and that's, there's a collapsing power grid in Lebanon. There's a collapsing uh, water system in Lebanon. Uh, there's a collapsing uh, garbage uh, collection, uh, uh, waste management system in Lebanon. There's garbage piles all over the streets uh, before this explosion happened. Um, so there's so many things that are, are, are kind of uh, colliding. Um, and now we're hearing that there's toxic air uh, as well due to this explosion, which could have been the, the gas that we've been hearing about. Um, there was a, a red color to the smoke. Uh, there were fireworks, it looked like, within the explosion as well. So we don't know what kind of uh, toxic elements. And Lebanon has a very high air pollution uh, level because of the fact that there's no uh, government electricity. So that everybody is running generators in their homes in Lebanon, which fills the air with diesel. So we are already inhaling uh, fumes in this country and swimming in uh, sewage in this country because the sewage system doesn't work. Um, all of these European countries have pledged at one time or another to help 
Lebanon. Um, uh, these solutions are very short term. These are band-aids. Lebanon needs no more uh, band-aids. It needs uh, a, a serious uh, re-reckoning. And I think that this is a reckoning for the system. If, even if it was, this was an accident, um, you know, there's so many other accidents that are waiting to happen. Uh, people also are uh, depressed and anxious. There have been a number of suicides in Lebanon due to the economic situation. This could drive some people over the edge. Yeah. Uh, we have um, to be careful with violence. Habib, um, we heard uh, from Abbas Ibrahim, um, General Security Chief, uh, earlier saying that um, this explosion was caught. I mean, it's still early days. There's got to be an official investigation. But the theory is at the moment that this explosive was caused by explosive material stored in a warehouse. Zaina Hoda was reporting that it, uh, it's thought to be this, this material was ammonium nitrate uh, and that this material had been at this warehouse in the port for quite some time. Whose responsibility is that? What on earth was this stuff? Uh, and so much of it that it could do the kind of damage that we've seen today. What was it doing at the port in Beirut? Well, some have suggested it could be fertilizer. Um, it could have other chemical industries um, that, that use that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, safety precautions are notoriously not applied um, in Beirut. And um, we've, we've seen other fires. Uh, we've seen factories catch on fire in the past. Uh, maybe they weren't very explosive material. We've seen massive fires in Lebanon. Uh, in recent years. So uh, it's not surprising, you know, who was responsible. There'll be fingers pointed in different directions. There's the Ministry of Transport, there's the Port Authority, there's the Municipality of Beirut, um, there's the Ministry of Interior, the police. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, different agencies that might have some kind of a safety claim um, there. But, uh, you know, one thing that's very interesting is that Lebanon is also one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Um, it's it's somewhere on the top 10 list of most populated countries. So, you know, there is a lack of space to put things in Lebanon as well. And this is uh, related to the garbage crisis. There's no space for landfills. So the landfills are put in the sea. There could be no space um, for hazardous materials, uh, no budget uh, to store them in a bigger facility. I mean, there are really so many layers to this onion of responsibility uh, when it comes to Lebanon. It's really hard, I think, to, uh, we, we want to point a finger. We, 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 uh, some people want, you know, red meat. They want, they want revenge. Um, but it, it's often a very complicated mix of authorities that are overlapping that lead to these situations of just kind of winging it. You know, I could just see them winging it and putting things in a warehouse. Uh, I see people wing it every day in this country on the roads. Uh, you know, you almost get killed every time you drive on the roads um, in Lebanon because the police aren't really there to take care of uh, the traffic management. So there are really so many dangers for the Lebanese citizen on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, uh, people people felt that they felt this blast at home. They felt this blast was in their home. Um, I thought the building collapsed behind me. Uh, many friends called me and said there's a bomb next to my house. Um, it's really hard to kind of uh, uh, describe to you uh, the, 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 the force field, the wave of the shock wave that just that just kind of um, fell over all of us. And, um, you know, it, it's uh, it's saying a lot uh, for people living in Lebanon to say it's the worst explosion they've ever seen. Uh, for people living in Beirut, it says a lot. That this, is, this is the most uh, uh, dangerous thing that they've that they felt. Um, so, you know, there have been there have been, you know, hundreds and thousands of bombs dropped on Beirut over the years. So that this actually stands out is quite amazing. We're, uh, we're waiting uh, for a statement from uh, Prime Minister Hassan Deeb, um, and we'll take that live here on Al Jazeera as and when uh, that, that happens. The World Health Organization is expressing its concern over the, uh, the implications of the, the disaster coming as it does in the midst of uh, a pandemic. The Lebanese Red Cross says that more than 2,200 people were injured Habib, in uh, today's uh, blast, and the numbers are likely to rise, as we saw uh, from Zaina Hoda at the, the American uh, University of Beirut. Casualties uh, still arriving at, at hospital three, four hours after uh, the explosion. Uh, what sort of strain at the moment is, um, uh, is Lebanon's health uh, system under at the moment? You know, we have a very limited number of ICU beds um, in Lebanon, something in, in, the, in the hundreds. Um, and the cases of COVID have have gotten uh, to a point where uh, many, many of them are taking up those beds and there aren't many beds left. Um, and so, you know, it's like you're going through a, a crisis. You're going through a kind of a, a Pearl Harbor um, and, and then you get hit again. 
um, on top of that. So it, it, it's you know it, it's 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 a double, triple, quadruple whammy um, in Lebanon. The number of things people are going through, and so these hospitals have been um, crying out uh, for help on television for for weeks and months now, saying that they don't have the PPE, they don't have the protective gear to treat coronavirus uh, patients. Uh, they can't, you know, the, the, because the currency has devaluated so much, the cost of care um, is, is still expensive for Lebanese citizens, but it has no value. Um, and, and, we, and, when you, and when you run a hospital, you need to buy imported goods. We don't make the PPE. We don't make all those products here. So you're still having to buy goods with very little uh, revenue coming in to pay for them. So this country is constantly living in debt, uh, not just the government, the hospitals, the schools are in debt. People can't pay their tuition. Um, there, there's so many uh, areas where money is owed and owed and owed so many times over in this country. I mean, it's really a miracle that, you know, every day people survive in this country. Um, and then you hit it with this. So, you know, the hospital that you're talking about, the American University Hospital, AUB uh, Medical Center, um, is, is, uh, it has just laid off uh, something like 800 employees. Um, and, and they brought in the military uh, because they were afraid people would actually uh, fight uh, the, the, their bosses and, and, and destroy the building of, of the hospital. Um, and so you have revolts in the hospitals uh, before all of this happened, um, and you have an overloading of cases. Uh, the government is unable to control the coronavirus issue in Lebanon, although it has, done, uh, has actually fared okay, but we're having a spike now because people aren't really social distancing and that kind of thing. Um, and, but maybe this will shock people a bit more uh, into doing that, uh, knowing that there's really no, not, much, not much space left in a hospital if you need one right now. Habib, great to talk to you. Many thanks indeed. Uh, for the moment, uh, we may well be back with you. Uh, within the last few moments, Lebanon's health minister uh, has said that more than 30 people were killed in today's explosion. Uh, and that over 3,000 were injured. Uh, that death toll, though, is likely to rise uh, over the, uh, the coming hours and days. So more than 30 people killed in the explosion in Beirut, over 3,000 uh, injured. Let's talk to uh, Khaled Hamadi, who was uh, a Lebanese army general and is now the managing director of uh, Regional Forum for Consultancy Studies. He's on the line from uh, Beirut. Good to have you with us, uh, sir. Uh, where were you when this explosion happened today? Uh, in Beirut, in Beirut, uh, maybe, and I was around, uh, let's say, one kilometer from the explosion. And, uh, and, and what happened when the blast went off? Yani, yani, uh, really, it was a disaster. Really, it was a disaster. Yani, uh, I walked from the Beirut airport to your offices here, yani, for one kilometer on the broken glasses all over the street. And where uh, you see you see many many injuries all over the the, the, the street. They are waiting for for cars or ambulances to take them to the hospital. Everything yani, was was really. Let you remember the the last days of the of the civil war in Beirut. Yes, uh, uh, yani today uh, during this explosion, I remember really the the, the last days of the 80s of the last century. It's funny, uh, everyone we've spoken to this evening has said uh, uh, more or less the, the same thing, uh, that this has brought back some very unpleasant uh, feelings and, uh, and memories. I mean, this really will have traumatized the city, won't it? Say again, please. This really will have traumatized the city, won't it? I didn't, I didn't hear you very well. I didn't hear you very well. I was saying, sir, that this really will have traumatized people in... Uh, Beirut. Yes. Um, how do you think the, the the city will will react? The people will react. What what will happen now? And, and I, I think Lebanese people, all of the Lebanese people, they are disappointed from this government. And I think they they did not uh, uh, yani, uh, wait for anything important for for, for anything serious uh, from this government. Uh, I think uh, the, the meeting of the uh, Supreme Council uh, of the of the defense uh, will will, uh, will 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 lead for nothing. Will they, there there will be, for example, let's say a report. Uh, he will he will ask, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, uh, the the authorities uh, to 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 start the investigations. And I think there will not be a serious investigations 
uh, really that could that could present to the Lebanese people mm-hmm. and to the to the international community a serious investigation and uh, a, a serious result uh, to what happened in uh, in the Beirut port because uh, many questions yani many questions uh, we propose uh, all 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 over uh, what happened in Beirut report for example uh, for example the responsible responsible authorities for the warehouses do they know about this uh, high explosive material in the warehouses and why they are they are stored over there uh, yani uh, yani what we see that uh, the, the, the Lebanese authorities, even the security institution, they did not take any serious me- measures uh, three or four uh, hours uh, uh, after the explosion. We didn't see anything, any intervention from the Lebanese authorities. And we are asking, really, are they are they waiting for a permission from uh, somebody to, to take over and to start working? Uh, for the security of the Lebanese people and ready to see uh, what happened. It was something, something at this, this level of, of seriousness, of, of, of danger. Uh, really, we did, we did not hear any, 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 anything, any declaration from, from the prime minister, even from the minister of the interior. We didn't hear anything. Uh, for that, we are, we are asking themselves. Uh, what kind of ammunition was was stored in this uh, in this warehouse? And uh, is this a part of the uh, Iranian smart weapons, for example? And what happened in the in the in the warehouse uh, is uh, is a part of the explosion that uh, taking place uh, in Iran? And what would be the implication of this accident on Lebanon? Uh, that that okay. he has become totally isolated. So. And uh, yeah, yeah, many, many, right. many questions. Many questions. So, Is there an Israeli behind? We're going to have uh, to. This? So I'm going to. I'm going to have to stop you there. Uh, but uh, many thanks indeed for being with us. Uh, I really appreciate your thoughts. Um, France's uh, President Emmanuel Macron uh, has issued a statement saying, "I express my fraternal solidarity with the Lebanese after the explosion, which caused so many victims." and damage this evening in Beirut. France stands alongside Lebanon always. French aid and resources are being delivered to the site. So uh, we know now that uh, at least 30 people have been killed uh, in this explosion today. Lebanese security officials say the blast was triggered by explosive materials uh, stored in a warehouse in the port area of the city, which is at the heart of Beirut. Uh, the president has called an emergency meeting. The Prime Minister has called for a national day of mourning on Wednesday. Lauren Taylor will continue our coverage of the aftermath of the Beirut blast in just a few moments here on Al Jazeera. Stay with us. A massive explosion sends shockwaves across Beirut, killing 27 people and injuring more than 2,000. Hundreds more are trapped in their homes. A top Lebanese security official says the blast was triggered by confiscated explosive material that was stored in a warehouse in the port area. I'm Lauren Taylor. This is Al Jazeera, live from London. Also coming up... Colombia's former president, Alvaro Uribe, says the Supreme Court has ordered his detention over alleged witness tampering and fraud. Australia deploys the army to Victoria State and announces fines as high as $14,000 to stop people breaking coronavirus isolation orders. And intense speculation over the whereabouts of Spain's former king after he announces he's leaving the country. Hello, we begin with our breaking news out of Lebanon, where a massive explosion has shaken the capital, Beirut. 27 people have been confirmed dead, and the Lebanese health ministry says around 2,500 people have been injured. Security officials say the blast happened in an area of the city's port, which housed highly explosive material that had been confiscated. Shockwaves were felt for several kilometres, and buildings within a large radius of the site 
have been severely damaged. The Red Cross warns many others are still trapped in their homes. The cause of the blast isn't known. Lebanon's president has called for urgent defence council talks. Israel has issued a statement denying any involvement, and France and Iran both say they're ready to help Lebanon in any way. People who were nearby have described what they saw and heard. My car was down there. It rolled over. I think this injury was because of the glass. The glass cut me up. My car was like this. I don't know what happened. I was fishing. I heard that there was a fire. I turned and started to head home and heard something explode. And then this happened. I got injured. Just explosion. I don't know what happened. Let's go live to you, Zina Khoda in Beirut. So this was a phenomenal explosion, wasn't it? Yes, massive. Uh, the whole capital shook. People felt it across Beirut, and we've been speaking to some people in southern Lebanon, and that is like 40 kilometers, at least 40 kilometers uh, from the capital. They too felt and felt this, this massive blast, uh, damage, destruction everywhere. Uh, people in their homes, uh, shattered glass uh, uh, everywhere in their homes. Uh, people's balconies Traffic. fell down. You, you mentioned more than 2,000 people injured. We are at one of the main hospitals in Beirut. Beirut. Uh, casualties continue to arrive. The health minister says at least 25 people were killed. Uh, the casualties were not all at Beirut port. This, this massive blast happened at Beirut port, but people across the city, like I told you, uh, I was thrown to the ground by the, the, the sheer force uh, of this explosion. Family, relatives uh, of, of, of the victims are waiting outside the hospital for, for news about the, the, the condition of their, their loved ones. Hospitals are under strain. It, it's chaotic scenes across uh, the Lebanese capital. Um, the capital is on edge. The head of uh, one of Lebanon's security agencies saying that uh, the blast was caused by highly explosive material at um, a warehouse, stored at the warehouse in Beirut port. Uh, this is really uh, causing a lot of anger. Already many, many Lebanese have been criticizing those in power for mismanagement over the years of running the economy into the ground. And now this. Uh, what some people are calling negligence. Uh, the very fact what was highly explosive material doing at Beirut port that caused so much damage and so many casualties and put um, you know, additional strain on an already collapsing healthcare system in the country. Uh, and Zaina, you mentioned the, the state of the, the hospitals and so on. Um, how equipped are they to handle this volume of casualties coming in from this, casualties coming in from this incident? Yes, the healthcare system is under a lot of pressure. First of all, there has been a rise in the number of coronavirus cases. Second, uh, public hospitals that have been underfunded uh, for decades and so they, they do not have enough beds uh, and enough staff really to treat people. Private hospitals on the other hand, we are at one of the main private hospitals, they have been complaining because the government owes them billions of dollars and they have had to lay off staff because of the economic crisis. This hospital alone a few weeks ago laid off up to 850 nurses and administrators. In fact, the Nurses Association was planning a strike tomorrow to highlight their plight, uh, the difficult uh, working conditions uh, that they have had to endure, long working hours, little pay. Already the economic crisis has uh, affected the value of the Lebanese currency, the lira. It lost 80% of the, its value. So people's salaries are now worthless. And these nurses are saying that we cannot continue uh, uh, like this. Already up to 40%, up to 40% of the 9,000 nurses who work in Lebanon on have been fired in recent months. It just shows you uh, the depths of the economic crisis this country is dealing with. And that's why you have statements coming like from France, for example, that we are ready to help because Lebanon does need billions of dollars of external financing in order to kickstart the economy. Driving through the streets of the Lebanese capital, you can see shops destroyed, uh, um, people's livelihoods. And this, for, for, for many, many people, this was all they had left. 
left. This blast happened at, uh, during rush hour. Uh, many, many people were in the streets. Uh, I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that everyone in the Lebanese capital felt this explosion. And in one way or another, uh, somebody, uh, they were affected, either their livelihoods, either their family or friends uh, injured, or either themselves the victims of what seems to be a negligence on the part of the, uh, of the Lebanese authorities. Uh, to, to talk us through a little bit more about the, um, what was described as a, a highly explosive material stored in a warehouse. Tell us a little bit about the information, how that came out, and, and whether there any further information about why it was stored there and how long it had been there and so on. Yes, many Lebanese are now asking this question because both the head of uh, one of Lebanon's security agencies, Major General Abbas Ibrahim, as well as the Interior Minister, both talking uh, and saying that this blast appears to have been caused by highly explosive material that was stored in a warehouse at Beirut Port, but they didn't give uh, much more information. The Higher Defense Council, which groups the Lebanese army, as well as the different security agencies in the country, they are holding an emergency meeting at the presidential palace. Maybe they will divulge more details, but um, at the end of the day, this government is likely to say that we are not responsible. We took office in January in the midst of an uprising that has been calling for a new leadership. But many Lebanese will tell you this new government is not different from previous ones because it is controlled by the same political parties who have governed this country for decades. Political parties, people here blame uh, for uh, the dire economic conditions, for leading the state to bankruptcy. Just yesterday, the foreign minister resigned, saying that he can no longer be part of a government that doesn't uh, uh, take, uh, doesn't have the will to carry out much-needed reforms to fight corruption. Corruption at Beirut Port, I must mention. Uh, these are demands of the international community in order for Lebanon uh, to get billions of dollars um, in, in aid. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, Zena, while we've been talking to you, the Lebanese capital, prime minister has uh, been making a statement. Uh, Zena. Sorry to interrupt you. While we were talking, uh, the Lebanese Prime Minister has been making a statement saying that uh, we will reveal facts regarding this dangerous warehouse that has been there since 2014. Uh, and he also said that all of Lebanon is facing a catastrophe. Uh, Beirut is in mourning. Uh, and he said uh, officials will pay the price for what happened today. I'm not sure, uh, Zain, if you can still hear me. Um, but as you were just suggesting, that they're, they're, they're already saying that it isn't their fault because they've only just come into power. Well, yes, uh, the Prime Minister Hassan Diab took power earlier this year. Uh, he has repeatedly uh, tried to gain credibility and legitimacy, not just at home and abroad, but his government has been criticized really for not doing anything to improve the economy. In fact, since January, the situation has worsened. Uh, dozens and dozens of businesses are closing. Unemployment is on the rise. More than 32 percent of the workforce, uh, that's more than 400,000 people. And this is a time tiny nation of just uh, approximately 5 million people now out of work, unable uh, to feed their children. Aid agencies are saying that in the Beirut area alone, uh, more than 500,000 children are going to bed hungry. And they are warning that the situation, this humanitarian crisis, will only get worse. So. Hassan Dieb has repeatedly tried to extricate himself, saying that I was not in power uh, for all uh, the, the, the years that, uh, you know, politicians have been blamed for corruption, mismanagement. But uh, his critics will say, you were appointed and by those political parties who were in power and who were responsible for mismanagement and corruption. And those political parties still call the shots. Um, so yes, this is a government trying to extricate itself from uh, from really what many, many are calling a, a, a natural disaster. It, it, the, the explosion um, was almost uh, like an earthquake. It, it, it was an earthquake. The, sh the, the ground shook underneath uh, our feet. And as you can see, people are being uh, treated uh, outside uh, the, the, the emergency ward. It just shows you how, how, how the health care system is under a lot, a lot of strain in, in, in Lebanon. And this is one of the hospitals that is not at the forefront of the fight against the uh, corona, coronavirus. So uh, a, a, ma a massive blast, uh, destruction that many will tell you they haven't seen 
in, 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 Le in the history of Lebanon, and this is a country that uh, has seen its share of violent uh, explosions, violent incidents, uh, assassinations that have shaken the capital and, and caused many, many casualties. This couldn't come at a worse time for a country that is collapsing, a state that is close to uh, bankruptcy, bankruptcy, a government that is cash-strapped, and a government that is not willing uh, to carry out the needed reforms to get an IMF economic bailout in order to kickstart uh, the economy. Zain Khoda, thank you very much indeed. Mohamed Khalifa is a former Lebanese health minister. He's been helping to treat the injured and spoke to us a little earlier. I was sitting at my home. I told my family, shouted, take care, there is an earthquake. And immediately in my favorite place, everything collapsed and narrowly I escaped this. I left family and jumped to the hospital to save lives. We are in a very bad situation economically, medical supplies, shortage of everything. We managed to cope, but the devastation is beyond any description. People, they were sitting at home. They're at home. Some, they have pressure injuries. They were traveling in their cars. Their heads, maybe they hit uh, the wheel steer or they hit somewhere. Uh, people from better injuries because you can see their faces are uh, swollen. Uh, others, direct injuries due to glass injuries, fragments. Uh, people, you know, Beirut is a very crowded city. If you are passing on a street and immediately tons of glasses collapses and hit you on the street from 20, 30 meter height, there are different sort of uh, impact uh, injuries, high velocity, medium velocity, pressure injuries, acceleration injuries, deceleration injuries, what we describe it in medical terms. Nada Hamza was near the port when the blast happened. She told us what she experienced. I was a few meters away from the electricity establishment in Lebanon, which is parallel to the, to the port, Lebanese port. I started hearing bombs, and people were like, they stopped in the, in the middle of the street, and we thought it's a, uh, it's a clash between the government and the protester near the electricity establishment. Then we heard kind of... I'm not sure, but we heard kind of planes, and I was asking people, what's going on? I want to know if I continue or, or go back. I saw the uh, fire, I saw the smoke, and then we heard the voice. Then I, I don't remember what happened. Then I went out of my car, I ran away to the entrance of, of one of the buildings there. Then I realized that the building was destroyed. Then I tried to call my parents. I couldn't reach anyone. I could reach my, my security group from, from my work. And I asked, just tell me what happened to know if I stay there or I, go, I can go back home. So they said many things because, you know, the news said that it was an attack at Hariri's place. Then they said, I don't know where. So I realized that it was an explosion and I can run away. I can't believe I'm, I'm still alive. I can't believe. Homes and buildings quite some distance away from the explosion have been badly damaged. Anne Chalvoro is a journalist living in Beirut. These are pictures from her house showing how powerful that blast was. Uh, the impact of the explosion blew out her windows and damaged furniture inside. Uh, she suffered minor injuries. And Anne Chal joins us live from Beirut now. Uh, so it must have been a, a terrifying experience. Well, it certainly was. It certainly was. We were just sitting in our TV room watching Netflix, and suddenly I heard planes or jets. I don't know what they were, but very loud hovering of planes slash jets in the air. I opened the window. These are glass doors. And uh, I opened the window, and I uh, it was even louder. And within seconds, uh, all the doors and windows had smashed. Uh, I was down on the ground. I was bleeding, there was a speck of glass in my neck, my foot uh, completely swollen. But I have to tell you, uh, as you said, I certainly do have minor injuries because all the hospitals in the city are packed. A lot of journalist friends and editors are trying to get me a doctor, but from everywhere what they're hearing is that uh, all the hospitals are packed. And I, it's all a moral issue, you know, at this point in time. I'd rather go to a doctor tomorrow. I've just sort of driven in a friend's car to a friend's house to sit here and uh, really sit down and see what I can do about my own situation. But it certainly was a terrifying experience, even as a journalist, even as 
some I have a conflict all the time, but this happened in my house. And, you know, we just sort of bought new furniture. But that's not what you think of when this happens. Earlier in the day, I filed a story on how Lebanese was struggling to buy bread because the price of bread has doubled. And my heart's going out. I live here for all the people. These people already had it so hard. Everyone had it so hard. You know, the lights are going out. There's no electricity. People are living in basements. They don't have enough to eat. And then on top of that, this incident happens. And the area that I live in is a posh Beirut area. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a Christian-dominated area. And you know, one sort of, one has these conversations in Lebanon, of course, because of the war in 2004, that things can go wrong here. Uh, but no one sort of thinks that it's going to happen in an area like that. And that's where it happened. And that's also shaken up everyone. And mind you, we're just about 100 meters from the Red Cross building. And even their glasses were shattered. So the impact on my house and on my building was essentially the impact of the blast that took place. I don't have details uh, about who was behind it and how, what's really going on. I've not been able to follow that up. I've just been meeting a lot of my neighbors and people around where I live. And so many people are bleeding. So many people are profusely bleeding in front of my eyes. And one is just struggling to make sense of it. I mean, this country was already on the immense, on the immense stress. And now this, how, whoever's done it, how is this? I, 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 how can this be explained? And I'm really talking as a person here, not even as a journalist, because, you know, this one time I'm also sort of a semi-victim. And uh, uh, I don't want to sort of dwell more on that, because a lot of people around me were much more seriously injured. A lot of people around me are suffering a lot more than me. And it, it, it's, it's more than terrifying, actually. You know, a part of you sort of, a part of you feels, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, my heart is hurting for the people who live around me. And in the meantime, so the, the, the Prime Minister has called it a, a big catastrophe to, to hit Lebanon and there, there have been offers of help from uh, France and Iran, amongst others, uh, after this. Uh, give us an idea of how important the port is in terms of actually bringing in supplies for, for Lebanon. Well, the port is extremely crucial. I mean, you know, with the COVID, the port is obviously shut, as all other borders, uh, all uh, land, the land borders were the airport was shut as well because of coronavirus. Lebanon had opened up, but a few days ago they'd reimposed a lockdown because of a surge in cases. Today the lockdown eased a little for a few days and then there was going to be another lockdown. So of course the port is extremely crucial to supplies and to hit a facility like that, I would think is, uh, is, is, is harsh, you know, to put it mildly. And uh, especially, in a, especially hitting a country which is already uh, reeling under a severe economic stress, the worst the, uh, the worst ever. I mean, I'm not saying this lightly. People are struggling to buy bread. People are struggling to, to buy vegetables. People are banking on charity, charitable organizations, and money is coming from diaspora abroad for charity. Uh, uh, so people don't have money here. I mean, of course, some do, but most don't. So it's already a very stressful very stressful situation in Lebanon. And as journalists, I've been filing stories on you know, the middle class is suffering. It's not, yes, of course, the upper middle class still perhaps have uh, 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 more leeway, but not the middle classes, not the lower middle, certainly not the refugees. And now when an incident like this happens, I mean, it's just, it's harsh to do it at such a time. I mean, you can, I don't know who's behind this. As a journalist, I won't take names, but somebody is, and whoever is, not now, not at this time. This is not a time to settle scores. This is not a time to make statements because people who get injured are real people and they haven't done anything wrong, you know. And indeed, at this stage, uh, that Lebanon's Prime Minister uh, Hassan Diab has said uh, that those responsible for the explosion at what he described as a dangerous warehouse uh, in the port area uh, would pay the price. Um, he said, I promise you that this catastrophe will not pass without accountability. Those responsible will pay the price. Facts about this dangerous warehouse that has been there since 2014 will be announced and I will not preempt the investigations. And at this stage, uh, uh, on, uh, in terms of if investigations, there's also presumably uh, still a search ongoing for, for potentially for victims who are under the rubble. Well, yes. Well, in my own building, you know, a lot of people have been injured. Uh, I have not seen anyone die. I have seen a lot of people being uh, taken to hospitals and I've seen them bleeding, I've seen them immobile. I don't know if there are any casualties, but I've seen at least 50 to 60 people bleeding profusely. And I don't have the statistics, so I won't say how many casualties there are, but a lot of blood around me, a lot of blood on the stairs of my building, on my shirt, on the faces of my friends, 
Red Cross workers, young people here are here are uh, you know volunteer with the Red Cross, and a lot of young young people have been running around trying to help whatever he- uh, trying to offer whatever help they can. But you know I haven't managed to find a hospital because as then I was reporting, there are people queuing up outside the hospitals to seek treatment. So that is how severe really this this attack was. And of course, what my area, the area that I live in, was basically we 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 felt the impact, and it was very clear, in very very strong impact. So um, I don't know what the figures of people who are uh, of the, what how many casualties there are, but I do know that I have in my own eyes in my own area on one street seen a lot of people bleeding to death. And Chavora, thank you very much indeed. Uh for telling us about your experiences there in that uh, huge explosion in Beirut. Thank you. A reminder of the top stories here on Al Jazeera. A massive explosion has shaken the Lebanese capital, Beirut. 27 people have been confirmed dead, and the Lebanese Health Ministry says around 2,500 people have been injured. It happened at a warehouse in the city's port where confiscated explosive material had been stored. Lebanon's Prime Minister described the facility as dangerous and says those responsible for the catastrophe will be held accountable. And Colombia's former president, Alvaro Uribe, says the Supreme Court has ordered his detention amid an investigation into alleged witness tampering and fraud. The current senator has repeatedly declared his innocence and questioned the court's independence. Well, Habib Bata is a journalist and the founder of Beirut Report. He joins us via Skype from Antelias, which is just north of Beirut. I uh, so just want to go back to the uh, site of the explosion itself and the, the Prime Minister suggesting that the what was there was had been there since 2014. Do you have any further information about what was being stored there and, and why? No, I mean, it's very difficult uh, to, to, to know what's being stored in the port of Beirut or, or, or any, any buildings in Beirut because there's very little inventory uh, shared with the public and even with the firefighters in Lebanon don't even have a good clue of of, 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 of what's being stored where in the country. So, you know, we're, we're always uh, hanging on by a thread here and, and, and an accident always waits to happen. Uh, and at the moment, is it your impression that uh, they're still looking for potentially for people who may have survived and maybe, maybe injured lying under rubble in amongst all the debris? I mean, it's such a massive uh, and devastating explosion. We're talking about a port um, area that is probably uh, several kilometers long. Um, that it appears to be a wasteland right now. I mean, there were hundreds of warehouses there. Everything seems to be flat, and, you know, a lot of these warehouses are built of uh, steel, um, and, and they could easily be just destroyed. We saw buildings, you know, miles away uh, that were totally devastated. Uh, again, light steel structures. So uh, I imagine that they'll be uh, going through the rubble for, for quite some time now, and, you know, people have been injured on the roads, on the highways. Um, you know, really, really the, the, the blast radius, um, is, is several kilometers, and we're talking about Beirut, which is one of the most uh, dense cities in the world, uh, population-wise. So people live, literally living on top of each other in this city, uh, very hard to access, very bad infrastructure in the city. Um, so there's a lot of challenges for the emergency workers. And challenges also, presumably, for the healthcare system, which is uh, facing a number of pressures at the moment. That's right. Hundreds of uh, employees have been laid off of hospitals in Lebanon in recent uh, weeks uh, due to the uh, pandemic and the dropping of the local currency has been devalued by 80 percent. Um, there's been a banking crisis. There's been a debt crisis. Uh, Lebanese are facing really so many pressures in so many directions. Um, so healthcare is one of those areas where um, the, the hospitals are owed millions of dollars by the Lebanese government. Lebanese government is not able to pay hospitals uh, for, for care. So uh, everyone is really hanging on by a thread in this country, and uh, it's, it's really hard to predict what, what, what more could happen. And this was there was also a politically charged potentially this week uh, because of a, a verdict that was due on Friday. Talk us through what that is and, what, and why it's significant. Well, the explosion immediately, you know, uh, was a flashback for many people who have been through so many bombs and wars and, uh, in this country. And one of the last uh, violent events in Lebanon was a series of assassinations that rocked the country about a decade ago. Um, and the most important of those was the Prime Minister, Rafiq Hariri, who was assassinated. And his uh, trial, who has been, who's done this uh, murder, 
Uh, it, it has been uh, unresolved and ongoing for many, many years. It's probably one of the most expensive trials uh, in history. Um, and there was supposed to be a report upcoming the next uh, few uh, days. Uh, but again, it's kind of a tenuous link, I believe. Uh, people will read into uh, these events any kind of uh, theory that they want. Uh, people will say that it's Hezbollah. People will say that it's Israel. Uh, people will say they have heard planes. Um, again, but it's very, it's, I think it's very dangerous to jump to conclusions uh, because it's very politically opportune for people to do so. And it, it's, it's re- frequently the case in this country and frequently a problem that we're not able to um, address issues because there's so much speculation about everything. And tell me that the Prime Minister has called on friendly countries to help after the blast and already a number of, of countries have offered assistance. What sort of thing do you think uh, they'll be asked to provide? Well, I mean, Lebanon needs all kinds of things. You know, we're going through a multiple crises right now. People are, are facing a hunger crisis. Um, I think that the bombing of the port, which is a lifeline for the country, a small country like Lebanon that relies on imports and has wars all around it, the sea is our one outlet, and so food will be a big issue. I, I imagine the price of goods could even climb after that. Uh, there will be a lot of injured people, uh, definitely, but the injuries and, and, and dead as well. Um, hospitals in Lebanon are very overburdened of the COVID cases. Uh, there's not much room left. Um, in hospitals, there are not many ICU beds left uh, in Lebanon, so that will be a big concern. But I think the longer-term concern will be uh, people's how this will affect people that are already broke, already bankrupt, already living in poverty. Half the country has gone to poverty uh, levels in this country for the crisis that's gone through over the last month, the, the crazy hyperinflation we've been going through. So, I mean, I think people will this will only add uh, insult to injury um, and really put salt in the wound of this of this crisis that Lebanon is going through. So, Lebanon needs all kinds of humanitarian assistance. Uh, food, um, medicines. Uh, the government will not be able to pay the price of medicines because our currency is so worthless at the moment. Um, so we'll need all kinds of help in all kinds of ways. But most importantly, Lebanon needs help to really have a real government uh, that can actually regulate society. Because again, we're an accident waiting to happen. God forbid there was another kind of natural disaster in this country. Uh, we really don't even have the response teams uh, that are that can even get to places that people need help. Thank you very much indeed. Habib Butter from Beirut Report. Thank you very much for joining us on Al Jazeera. A massive explosion sends shockwaves across Beirut, killing 50 people and injuring more than 2,700. Many more are thought to be trapped in their homes. The blast happened at a warehouse believed to be holding confiscated explosive material. Lebanon's Prime Minister says those responsible will be held to account. Taylor. This is Al Jazeera, live from London. Also coming up, Colombia's former pre- president, Alvaro Uribe, says the Supreme Court has ordered his detention over alleged witness tampering and fraud. Australia deploys the army to Victoria State and announces fines as high as $14,000 to stop people breaking coronavirus isolation orders. And intense speculation over the whereabouts of Spain's former king after he announces he's leaving the country. Hello, we begin with our breaking news out of Lebanon, where a massive explosion has shaken the capital, Beirut. 50 people have been confirmed dead, and the Lebanese Health Ministry says around 2,700 people have been injured. Security officials say the blast happened in an area of the city's port, which housed highly explosive material that had been confiscated. Shockwaves were felt for several kilometres, and buildings within a large radius of the site have been severely damaged. The Red Cross warns many others are still trapped in their homes. The cause of the blast isn't known. Lebanon's president has called for urgent defence council talks. Israel has issued a statement denying any involvement, and France and Iran both say they're ready to help Lebanon in any way. Well, people who were nearby have described what they saw and heard. My car was down there. It rolled over. I think this injury was because of the glass. The glass cut me up. My car was like this. I don't know what happened. I was fishing. I heard that there was a fire. I turned and started to head home and heard something explode. And then this happened. I got injured. Just explosion. I don't know what happened. Well, Lebanon's Prime Minister Hassan Diab has addressed the nation. He says the explosion happened at a, quote, dangerous warehouse and those responsible will pay the price. 
It will not pass without accountability. Those responsible for this catastrophe will pay the price. This is a promise to the martyrs and the injured. This is a national commitment. Mohammed Khalifa is a former Lebanese health minister. He's been helping treat the injured and spoke to us a little earlier. I was sitting at my home. I told my family, shouted, take care, there is an earthquake. And immediately in my favorite place, everything collapsed and narrowly I escaped death. I left family and jumped to the hospital to save lives. We are in a very bad situation economically, medical supplies, shortage of everything. We managed to cope, but the devastation is beyond any description. People, they were sitting at home. They're at home. Some, they have pressure injuries. They were traveling in their cars. Their heads, maybe they hit uh, the wheel steer or they hit somewhere. Uh, people from pressure injuries because you can see their faces are uh, swollen. Uh, others, direct injuries due to glass injuries, fragments. Uh, people, you know, Beirut is a very crowded city. If you are passing on a street and immediately tons of glasses collapses and hit you on the street from 20, 30 meter height. There are different sort of uh, impact uh, injuries, high velocity, medium velocity, pressure injuries, acceleration injuries, deceleration injuries, what we describe it in medical terms. Let's go live to Zena Khoda in Beirut. And Zena, uh, sadly, the death toll keeps rising and the number of injured uh, is going up. Yes, we are outside one of the main hospitals in Beirut, the American University Hospital. Uh, families of the victims, uh, people who were injured as well as killed in this massive blast are gathering outside, uh, waiting to hear news about their, their loved ones. At least 50 dead, according to health officials. Uh, more than 2,700 people injured. This was a massive blast, a blast that shook uh, the Lebanese capital. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say everyone in the Lebanese capital felt this, uh, this, this massive blast. I was thrown uh, to the crown by the sheer force of the explosion. You can hear people uh, shouting. There's a lot of tension in the air, uh, chaos, uh, uh, hospitals under strain. Uh, we heard from uh, top uh, Lebanese security officials saying that the cause of the blast appears to be a highly explosive material that was stored in a warehouse house at Beirut port. Now, the prime minister calling this a natural disaster, but it seems it is a disaster that is man-made. He is promising an investigation, but who? Um, I'm not really sure how many people uh, will believe that those responsible for storing this high, highly explosive material at Beirut airport will be held to account. Uh, this is a country uh, really uh, where uh, many, many people have been demanding a new leadership, blaming uh, the political parties who have been governing this country for decades uh, for running the economy to the ground. So this is just um, adding much more pressure on the Lebanese who are already uh, suffering from many many, many crises. You can see ambulances continue to arrive. Uh, hospitals really, really under a lot of pressure. And the healthcare system was already struggling uh, with the effects of the coronavirus outbreak, wasn't it? Yes, uh, a recent upsurge in the number of coronavirus cases, uh, putting a lot of pressure on, on hospitals, uh, but already the health sector was suffering because of the economic crisis, which predates uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, this is a private hospital and the government owes it billions of dollars. In fact, the government owes most of the private hospitals billions of dollars. And the healthcare system is really based on the private sector, not the public sector, because the public sector is so under uh, underfunded. Uh, so even yesterday, nurses, even before this blast, nurses were prom uh, 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 were planning to hold uh, a strike to highlight the conditions under which they have been working. This hospital alone fired 850 nurses and administrators. Um, oh, 
just a few a few weeks ago because they were not able to keep paying their salaries. As more and more Lebanese lose their jobs, they lose their private insurance and they're unable to come to private hospitals. So then they go to public hospitals and public hospitals are already underfunded. The government is cash strapped and the state is close to bankruptcy. And this is why Lebanese officials are appealing for help from other countries, you know, to, to be able to cope with this with this natural disaster. Uh, 2,700 people, uh, that's uh, quite uh, a high number. And now uh, the Red Cross has been appealing uh, for people to donate blood because there's an urgent need for blood. A lot of the injuries, head injuries uh, from, from shattered glass, the destruction, uh, the damage across this city. Um, I have never seen something like this before. And I've covered many, uh, many explosions and, and assassinations over the years, massive explosions really in Beirut, but nothing, nothing like what we um, witnessed late this afternoon. And the government is, I understand, asking for help from other countries and some, some countries have offered assistance. What sort of things do you think will be a priority? Well, priority will be um, health care to provide uh, the necessary uh, treatment because hospitals were already low on, on supplies because this is an import dependent country. They import approximately 80% of what the Lebanese eat as well as medical supplies. And it has been very, very difficult to import medical supplies, even medicine. There has been a shortage of medicine because you need dollars. And there's a scarcity of dollars here because of the economic crisis and the lira, the local currency devalued by more than 80 percent in the past few months so the very fact that these hospitals and, and pharmacies and they don't have the dollars to be able to import uh, much needed medical supplies so this is what is expected uh, Lebanon is, is, is definitely going to hope that um, their friends abroad w will provide some sort of some sort of support sorry it's quite chaotic here as you can imagine um, so we're gonna have to wait to see whether uh, or not Lebanon will receive uh, the necessary medical assistance to be able to treat all uh, these hundreds and uh, a few thousand people really who who have been injured in this massive blast Zaina Hoda thank you very much indeed and we can speak now to Mark Dao, he's a professor of communications at the American University of Beirut and was a former candidate for the Lebanese parliament. Thanks very much indeed for being with us. Uh, so the Prime Minister has talked about this, uh, this uh, explosion being caused by possibly dangerous materials that were stored in the port and had been there since 2014. Can you explain to us what kind of oversight there is of the port and how that kind of material might have been there for, for so long in such a densely populated area? Uh, the material uh, is stored, uh, it was in hangar number 12, which is one of the biggest, and they store all flammables in it, or uh, material that is highly sensitive to explosions and otherwise. And those were stopped there by a court ruling uh, because they're not allowed to enter Lebanon, and they were basically trying to get them into Lebanon uh, using excuses of using them for fertilizers, so the reports so far are saying. Um, and it seems that uh, something terribly went wrong there and they were not stored properly. There was a lot of flammables in that region. And then there was a, a massive fire followed by the in, intense explosion, uh, which basically destroyed a two to three kilometer radius of homes and houses around. I was one of those who, who is missing a, a door glass and uh, uh, an entire entrance to a house because of the blast. Uh, basically, it's ba negligence. Uh, you've got the customs department, they're responsible for it. And then you've got the Ministry of Defense because they have the right to supervise anything of an explosive nature, such as dynamite and others, and include, including the ammonium nitrates that exploded uh, this evening, as well as there's uh, for the port of Beirut, by the way, is 80% of all imports into Lebanon. So it is the main vein, it's the main artery for this economy, for food, for medicine, for everything. Right next to it uh, is the massive, the biggest storage. And if you see the footage, you'll notice the big dominant white building. That's the strategic grain reserve for Lebanon, which got completely destroyed. And that means wheat. It means three months of wheat. And around the port, there are 
at least two or three of the biggest mills in Lebanon that also produce the flour for the bread. So the damage is massive on every scale. It's food security, it's medical and supplies, plus it is the physical destruction and the injuries. Uh, the, what they just reported is they just crossed 50 people dead and close to 3,000 injured, and people are still flooding into the hospitals. And now they're transporting people from central Beirut hospitals to others, because one of the major hospitals, which is close by, also got affected and destroyed. So some of its capacities uh, have been uh, decommissioned because they cannot function with all the glass and all the damage, and they're not confident that the machines are actually properly functional because of the impact. Uh, I think someone reported that it was close to 4.5 on the Richter scale. That was how massive it is. It's close to an earthquake. Uh, what happened today is negligence, and what happened today is very close to being considered a crime against the Lebanese people. It's a crime against humanity. Yeah, just, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued because you, you did talk about the, the, the reason why those explosives were there. Can you elaborate on, on why there would be, from t materials apparently seized in 2014, why they would still be, be in, in position? Just give us a bit more detail about uh, that, because presumably there would, if, there would need to be inspections at various points to establish whether explosive material was still uh, in, a, in a stable state, especially if it's in a hot area and, the, and that kind of thing. Were there any inspections of the area? There are regular, uh, uh, basically, investigations of that area. Inspections are constant because it's in the middle of the busiest area in the port. So you always get lighters and other flammables going through and in and out of that hangar. Uh, the problem is the quarantined area, which is that, which is basically quarantined because of a legal process that was dragging on. And no one would get the final decision on whether to re uh, export that product to the source where it came from while the court was going uh, uh, until it got a decision. So far, it's been negligence in terms of preserving uh, that uh, material that is related directly to uh, the port of Beirut safety and uh, the board of directors of the port as well as customs and the security agencies which are responsible for such things. Sorry and to by the way, there is to, no just, evacuation I just want to clarify, just, the, the, and the stuff that was there, is it, was it being impounded because it was destined to create weapons? Or what was the story behind that stuff being there? It was, OK, the, the excuse to get them into the country at the time was they're going to be used to produce fertilizer. But such material is not allowed into the country. So it was impounded and there was an ongoing investigation. The company that got them here was uh, uh, going through the legal process and it seems there is some political intervention that this has been dragging on for six years and the product has remained in storage. So obviously there is a, a huge political game being played there. Uh, first, for allowing them into the country. Two, for starting the legal process that has stalled so far for uh, a good six years. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark Dow, for giving us your, your expertise and uh, that very interesting information about uh, the possible causes of that explosion there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our homes and buildings quite some distance away from the explosion have been badly damaged. Anshal Voro is a journalist living in Beirut. Uh, these are pictures from her house showing how powerful that blast was. The impact of the explosion blew out her windows and damaged furniture inside. She suffered minor injuries. We spoke to Anshal a short time ago. We were just sitting in our TV room watching Netflix and suddenly I heard planes or jets, I don't know what they were, but very loud hovering of planes slash jets in the air. I opened the window, these are glass doors, and uh, I opened the window and I, uh, it was even louder, and within seconds, uh, all the doors and windows had smashed. Uh, I was down on the ground. I was bleeding. There was a speck of glass in my neck, my foot uh, completely swollen. But I have to tell you, uh, as you said, I certainly do have minor injuries because all the hospitals in the city are packed. A lot of journalist friends and editors are trying to get me a doctor, but from everywhere what they're hearing is that uh, uh, all the hospitals are packed. And I, it's all a moral issue, you know, at this point in time. I'd rather go to a doctor tomorrow. I've just sort of driven in a friend's car to a friend's house to sit here and uh, really sit down and see what I can do about my own situation. But it's 
certainly was a terrifying experience, even as a journalist, even at some... I cover conflict all the time, but this happened in my house. And, you know, we just sort of bought new furniture. But that's not what you think of when this happens. Earlier in the day, I filed a story on how Lebanese were struggling to buy bread because the price of bread has doubled. And my heart's going out. I live here for all the people. These people already had it so hard. This is Al Jazeera. Hello, I'm Lauren Taylor. This is the Al Jazeera News Hour, live from London. Coming up, a massive explosion sends shockwaves across Beirut, killing 70 people and injuring more than 3,700. Colombia's former president, Alvaro Uribe, says the Supreme Court has ordered his detention over alleged witness tampering and fraud. The UN says the disruption to schools caused by the pandemic could lead to a generational catastrophe. And the president of Belarus accuses his opponents of trying to organize a massacre as voting begins in what could be his toughest election in years. And I'm San Hamush with all the sports, including reigning US Open champion Rafael Nadal pulls out of this year's tournament, citing concerns over the coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> We begin with our breaking news from Lebanon and the massive explosion that's shaken the capital, Beirut. 70 people have been confirmed dead and the Lebanese health ministry says around 3,700 people have been injured. Security officials say the blast happened in a warehouse at the port which had been housing 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate for six years. Lebanon's president has branded that unacceptable. The cabinet is expected to declare a state of emergency in Beirut when it holds an emergency meeting on Wednesday. Fintan Monaghan reports. A massive explosion in the heart of the Lebanese capital. The blast sent shockwaves across Beirut, shattering windows, destroying buildings and injuring hundreds. The streets were filled with panic and confusion as people tried to make sense of what happened. My car was down there. It rolled over. I think my injuries are because of the glass. The glass cut me up. My car was like this. I don't know what happened. I was fishing. I heard there was a fire, so I began to head home. Then I heard something explode, and then this happened. I got injured. This is all I know. Rescue work began quickly. Emergency vehicles converged on the site of the blast from far and wide, putting out fires and getting the injured to safety. Lebanon's internal security chief confirmed the blast originated in the port district, in a section housing highly explosive materials. But he said any further speculation would preempt an investigation. Lebanon's Prime Minister Hassan Diab addressed the nation, promising that the victims would get justice for what happened. It will not pass without accountability. Those responsible for this catastrophe will pay the price. This is a promise to the martyrs and the injured. This is a national commitment. While the cause is still unknown, some are already blaming the government. Lebanon is an accident waiting to happen in so many ways, so many places, whether it's uh, uh, public services, electricity, all kinds of government industries are not regulated well. We don't have like inspectors that uh, so many buildings could collapse. Um, so, you know, again, all the problems that Lebanon faces is because they don't really have a strong government that is able to ensure the safety of its citizens. Um, and that's been why people have been protesting. That's why the uh, currency has been falling. Um, so, you know, there's so many possible accidents in Lebanon, so it's very hard to speculate. Many victims are still trapped in the rubble, and rescue work looks set to continue long into the night. The destruction of central Beirut appeared to come out of nowhere. And as the shock of what happened subsides, the demands for answers will continue to grow louder. Vinton Monaghan, Al Jazeera. Let's go live to Zena Hodder, who's uh, outside a hospital in Beirut. And uh, Zena, within the last few minutes, uh, confirmation, it seems, from the, the presidency that uh, this was 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate, which had been stored uh, for six years, uh, and as the presidency said, without safety measures, and he has said that that's unacceptable. Um, presumably that would explain some of the, the scale of the explosion that we, we saw on those images.
Yes, a massive blast that shook the capital. Uh, officials are calling it a natural disaster, but what has become clear that this is a man-made natural disaster. Uh, the presidency himself, the president himself saying that it is just unacceptable that 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate has been stored in this warehouse. Uh, many Lebanese are asking questions tonight. Uh, who stored this amount of ammonium nitrate in, in, at Beirut port? What was it doing there? What safety measures were in place? 70 people died. Uh, thousands of people were injured. Some people died in their own in, in their homes because of the sheer force of the explosion. Everyone felt it in the Lebanese capital and beyond uh, the capital. We are outside one of the hospitals. You can see family members continue uh, to converge outside hospitals, waiting for news uh, of the, the well-being of their loved ones. I've seen people uh, break down in tears when they found out that their loved one uh, died, and others are, are, are telling us that uh, their loved ones are in critical condition. So the casualty uh, toll uh, could rise even further. So a lot of anger, but at the same time, people are really concerned. What about uh, their health? Uh, what does this, this chemical, ammonium nitrate, do uh, to, to people's health? This country really has multiple, dealing with multiple, multiple crises. Uh, now the Higher Defense Council meeting uh, saying that they're going to declare a state of emergency because the government is cash strapped. The state is near bankruptcy. Uh, they're appealing uh, for help from uh, from other countries. France has promised to send uh, some support to Lebanon. But clearly, the country is not going to be able to handle such a disaster like this, especially the healthcare system, which has been under a lot of strain in recent weeks. And Zaino, you mentioned the state of emergency. What powers will that uh, give the government and what will it mean in effect? Well, the government has declared a state of mobilization a few months back when uh, the coronavirus started to spread in the country. Uh, they did not hand over power to the army. Uh, they did not do that at all. It, it, it's, it seems that the, uh, the, the government may impose some lockdown measures, uh, especially because there's a rise in, in, in coronavirus cases. And that's why hospitals are just so strained. When you declare a state of emergency, uh, they're going to appeal for assistance. So many people lost their lives livelihoods, shops, the damaged, uh, uh, the whole downtown Beirut area. This is a commercial district. Uh, already so many people have lost their jobs. This couldn't have come at a worse time for a country uh, experiencing its worst economic crisis in decades. And there just there isn't enough dollars in the country in order to import much needed medical supplies and medicines. Already there's a shortage in medical supplies and medicines before uh, this, this blast because um, hospitals are finding it hard hard uh, to, um, to acquire a hard currency. This country imports more than 80% of its needs. And now with Beirut port, Beirut port was uh, where the food was coming in. Uh, with the destruction at Beirut port, it is highly unlikely they're going to be able uh, to bring in much needed food supplies. So uh, um, uh, many, th this country, th the authorities are dealing with many, many crises. And, and people, uh, if you talk to them, they're just fed up. They're saying, what's next? We've been dealing uh, with those in power who have run the economy into the ground and now negligence on the part of the authorities, uh, they believe this has something to do with corruption at Beirut port and we do, you know, political, some political parties uh, do have a say over, over control at Beirut port. So this is just going to cause more and more anger. We have to remember a few months ago there was this national uprising, people taking to the streets demanding a new leadership. That never happened because they were up against a militarized state. Now will this uh, push people back to the streets? It's, it's hard to say because people really are struggling uh, just to survive. And with this blast now adding even more pressure and more misery uh, to, to a population that, uh, that really um, has, is in desperation. Zaina Hodder, thank you very much indeed for that live update there from Beirut. Well, earlier I spoke to Mark Daou, who's a professor of communications at the American U University of Beirut and a former candidate for the Lebanese parliament. He has more details on what led to the explosion. The material uh, is stored, uh, it was in hangar number 12, which is one of the biggest, and they store all flammables in it or uh, material that is highly sensitive to explosions and otherwise. And those were stopped there by a court ruling 
uh, because they're not allowed to enter Lebanon. And they were basically trying to get them into Lebanon uh, using excuses of using them for fertilizers, so the reports so far are saying. Um, and it seems that uh, something terribly went wrong there, and they were not stored properly. There was a lot of flammables in that region, and then there was a, a massive fire followed by the in, intense explosion, uh, which basically destroyed a two to three kilometer radius of homes and houses around. I was one of those who who is missing a, a door glass and uh, uh, an entire entrance to a house because of the blast. Uh, basically, it's be negligence. Uh, you've got the customs department, they're responsible for it. And then you've got the Ministry of Defense because they have the right to supervise anything of an explosive nature, such as dynamite and others, and include, including the ammonium nitrates that exploded uh, this evening, as well as there's uh, for the port of Beirut, by the way, is 80 percent of all imports into Lebanon. So it is the main vein. It's the main artery for this economy, for food, for medicine, for everything. Right next to it uh, is the massive, the biggest storage. And if you see the footage, you'll notice the big dominant white building. That's the strategic grain reserve for Lebanon, which got completely destroyed. And that means wheat. It means three months of wheat. And around the port, there are at least two or three of the biggest mills in Lebanon that also produce the flour for the bread. So the damage is massive on every scale. Mohammed Khalifa is a former Lebanese health minister. He's been helping treat the injured and spoke to us a little earlier. I was sitting at my home. I told my family, shouted, take care, there is an earthquake. And immediately in my favorite place, everything collapsed and Narrowly, I escaped this. I left family and jumped to the hospital to save lives. We are in a very bad situation economically, medical supplies, shortage of everything. We managed to cope, but the devastation is beyond any description. People, they were sitting at home. They're at home. Some, they have pressure injuries. They were traveling in their cars. Their heads, maybe they hit uh, the wheel steer or they hit somewhere. Uh, people from better injuries because you can see their faces are uh... many reports emerging on what exactly happened maybe we can just walk down the street to try to show you the extent of the damage ambulances rushed to beirut port uh, not too long after the head of uh, one of lebanon's security agencies said that it appeared uh, the cause of the blast was um, highly explosive material that was stored in a warehouse for years and that really uh, caused a lot of anger uh, because people are saying that this is not a disaster. Officials are calling this a catastrophe, uh, a disaster. But this is a man-made disaster, a result of either negligence, incompetence or corruption. Uh, so the Lebanese people are asking what was ammonium nitrate doing at one of the warehouses at Beirut port? Uh, why was it not stored safely? Um, who is responsible for placing this material at Beirut port that has taken so many lives? According to the Red Cross, at least 100 people dead, and the number could rise. 4,000 uh, people injured. Uh, so many questions. The cabinet is expected to meet. Officials are saying that they're going to get to the bottom of this. Those responsible will be held to account. Uh, but the people in the streets are saying, uh, how can we trust you when you have been in power uh, for all these years and you have been responsible for the mismanagement and corruption that has run the economy into the ground? They are still pulling out bodies from underneath the rubble. The electricity company is not very far from here. And people, uh, hundreds of employees were in that building when the blast uh, happened. And a woman just told us that uh, her husband's colleagues were being, uh, they, they, uh, they died in the blast and they're only pulling their bodies from underneath the rubble now. Uh, so that search operation is still continuing. And um, even at Beirut port, that was the site of the, the explosion. Many, many port employees are missing. What we also understand Stand civil defense workers um, could be among the dead because initially there was a fire at the port and that's when uh, the civil defense arrived. Uh, some reports are suggesting that's exactly what happened before, uh, before the blast happened. So people are still searching for loved ones. People are, as you can see, these are shops. These, 
These are people's livelihoods. They're, people are saying, who's going to help us repair this? We don't have the money uh, to repair. A member of Lebanon's parliament has resigned in protest over the port explosion. Marwan Hamade demanded an international inquiry look into the blast in his resignation letter. He served in various prominent positions as Minister of Trade, Health and Telecommunications. All right, let's bring in now Mark Dao in Beirut. He's a former candidate for the Lebanese parliament. Good to have you with us. So let's start with the obvious elephant in the room. Who on earth was keeping this much ammonium nitrate in a warehouse at a port? Uh, basically, someone was trying to import that material in 2014, which is not allowed. And then there was, uh, they impounded the material and there was a court case running for the past six years, which obviously only extended this far and wasn't directly re-exported because of political pressure and interventions with the justice system. Another side of the corruption that dominates Lebanon and has led to the systematic breakdown of the state and the failure of so many functions, including economic, including we already had a crisis with garbage piling up. And now with that explosion yesterday, it rained glass in Beirut. Everyone's home is damaged in a radius of four to five kilometers. People's lives lives are completely damaged, not right. to mention the corona right, crisis. Right, right. Uh, we'll we'll get to, to the damage basically... in a moment, yeah. but the thing that's perhaps interesting, one of the many things sadly interesting here, is what when you say because of corruption it was left in the port, everybody knows that the ports, the airport are controlled by armed factions in that country. There must have been some level of decision making amongst the political and military factions to keep that amount of uh, ammonium nitrate there, right? This wasn't just like an administrative oversight. Yes, it's not a pile of small combustibles that you can debate and put on the side. It's 2,700 tons of that stuff. And the problem is the defense knows, the Ministry of Defense they know, Ministry of Interior they know, the Ministry of Economy knows, the Prime Minister knows, the security agency know, and if nobody knows, then the justice system already knows and there's a court case in it. So everyone is aware of that threat and there was excessive pressure to keep them there. Six years from and they pressure were not from who, sir? exported. Pressure from who? Pressure from the political entities and the people covering those who tried to import ammonium nitrate into the country under the pretext. Well, who was of trying to import this? Is, is that a matter of public knowledge and court record? In the court records, it is available. I don't have the name of the company, but the company that is importing should be investigated and what was the purpose and why that big amount of material. And then the second question is, why were they kept in one place? Why not in a safe position away from the port, which is a critical element in the infrastructure, knowing the threat that they included? And why weren't they directly re-exported? Why were they impounded for six years and no one was capable of taking action? This can only happen with excessive political pressure and intervention in the justice system, which means people in the political establishment are directly linked to this. And that is why a lot of big heads and should And that is precisely this. my they question. Who are those people? Is it known who are those people in the political setup that decided that to keep that That is up to the there? investigations to do. Yes, the, the direct people responsible, prime minister, president, minister of defense, uh, the port directors, those are the direct people who are responsible for it. Who is exercising pressure on them? Then that's what the investigation should do. And the question is to the judges, the senior judges handling this case. They should have gotten to the bottom of this instead of letting that political pressure continue and leaving that dangerous material in the port for six years. Who control, which faction controls the ports in Beirut? Everyone knows in Lebanon that the port and the airport are highly influenced by Hezbollah activists and political pressure because they are used and they are intervened with on a regular basis. But there are other factions as well that are all aligned. But in a thing like this, no one has the leverage that Hezbollah has. So most probably it's Hezbollah who can exercise pressure of that size in this critical port, which imports 80% of Lebanon's uh, imports in total, including most of its food, 
most of its medicines. All of that has been damaged. Lebanon's strategic grain backup uh, has been destroyed. The grain reserves, which include wheat for flour and all of this. Someone with massive power that can cripple an entire government and all of its ministries can do that. And no one has that power except Hezbollah. That must be raising some question marks then for that uh, group and faction to answer for then. Definitely. And not only them, but the political government that is supported by them, the current government, the current president of the republic, those are people who should be held accountable for a crime against humanity, the total destruction of a city because of negligence, the death of more than 100 people and the hospitalization of more than 4,000. Today, the hospitals have been calling for in distress because their morgues are full. There are no places to put the dead bodies in the hospitals of downtown Beirut. They're starting to move dead bodies to other hospitals around the country. This is mass murder committed by the negligence and the political interests of a few who are creating the political power in this country and abusing its people. All right, it's been uh, great to get your uh, thoughts and analysis on that. Thank you so much for uh, make, taking the time to come and talk with us. Mark Dow with there. This is Al Jazeera. Hello, I'm Sahil Rahman, and you're watching the Al Jazeera News Hour live from our headquarters here in Doha. Coming up in the next 60 minutes devastation all around, hospitals overwhelmed. Beirut struggles to cope a day after a terrifying explosion kills at least 100 people. More economic woes in store for the people of Lebanon. Cost of the damage from the blast is estimated to top $3 billion, with food imports hit by the flattening of Beirut's port. And breaking ground and stirring controversy, India's Prime Minister lays the foundation of a Hindu temple on the ruins of a 16th century mosque. Also, Sri Lankans are voting in a much delayed election. It's the first poll in South Asia during the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm Peter Stemmett with the sport. Rafael Nadal confirms he will not defend his US Open title later this month because of coronavirus fears. Welcome to the News Hour. We begin in Lebanon's capital, Beirut, where people are describing the fallout from Tuesday's explosion as apocalyptic. There were scenes of chaos after the blast ripped through the city's port, killing at least 100 people. The Lebanese are trying to come to terms with the widespread damage that stirred memories of the civil war. Among the hardest hit areas are the busy commercial districts. Beirut's governor says up to 300,000 people have been left homeless. Now, this was the moment of the impact. The blast happened at a port warehouse where the government says about 2,700 tonnes of ammonium nitrate had been stored for years. More than 4,000 people have been injured and rescue workers are still searching for those missing. Hospitals across the city have struggled to cope and some were damaged by the blast. Already strained by the coronavirus outbreak, health workers are overwhelmed by the number of casualties. Let's go live now to uh, Zaina Khoda, who's in the capital Beirut for us. Uh, and Zaina, just paint the picture before we get into the nitty gritty of what's been happening, of where you are and what you're seeing. Well, we are close to Beirut port. The port has been rendered unusable. It's completely uh, destroyed, completely damaged. And for an import uh, dependent economy like Lebanon, this is going to cause problems. Yes, there are other ports in the south of the country, in the north of the country, but they are small. Beirut port is the main port. It's just across this highway. Uh, but we are standing here because we are we're finding difficulties getting a signal on the other side of the street. Families, uh, family members continue to uh, converge around the port, hoping to hear news about their loved ones. Many, many people remain missing. The Red Cross says more than 100 uh, are dead, up to 4,000 injured, 300,000 people now displaced. Uh, you just drive across this, uh, the, the capital this morning, almost every building, uh, almost uh, every apartment has been damaged by the sheer force of this explosion. Um, the damage really, uh, the, the damage area quite, quite uh, large. Uh, so people are still coming to terms with 
with what happened later on Tuesday, just past 6 p.m., just before sunset, when this massive explosion shook the capital. Of course, in the here and now, we can hear the sirens of emergency services uh, in the, the distance. And, and that is the focus now, isn't it? The search and rescue. But also those services are stretched because some of them also attended the blast even before it actually kicked off. They may have been caught up and be maybe part of the death toll. That is true. Last night, uh, ambulance from across the country uh, were called in to help evacuate the wounded. We were standing outside the port and we saw ambulance arriving one after another. Uh, hospitals were overwhelmed. Like you mentioned, they were already close to collapse. This country is going through a very deep economic crisis uh, as a result, really, of years of mismanagement. The state is close to bankruptcy, and this is why officials have been appealing for international assistance, in particular medical supplies and medicines. Because there's a scarcity of dollars, a scarcity in foreign reserves, and you need dollars and foreign reserves, uh, foreign currency, excuse me, in order to purchase medicine and much needed uh, supplies. So hospitals were already complaining about shortage. They were complaining about being understaffed. Up to 850 uh, nurses were fired from the main hospital in Beirut a few weeks ago because they couldn't pay, uh, pay their staff. So uh, the hospitals are raising the alarm, saying that we need help. Some countries are coming forward. Uh, with assistance, but this is uh, this is a city really in shock, uh, a city in ruins. And of course, it comes during a, a major COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, and with the possibility uh, of food insecurity as well at the same time. Yes, a surge in coronavirus cases. In fact, uh, yesterday, Lebanon, uh, the country was reopening after a five-day lockdown, and the plan was uh, tomorrow another five-day lockdown would be uh, imposed in order to try to stem uh, the, the, the spread of, of coronavirus. So this country really tackling with multiple crises. We were at one of the neighborhoods early this morning. We saw people, you know, angry, uh, saying that these are our livelihoods. Their shops have been destroyed, uh, their homes, and they're saying, who's going to to help us? Is this government going to help us? Uh, we have to remember it's been months now. We've been seeing protests in the street, people calling for a change in leadership. They believe those in power, the political parties who have been governing this country uh, for decades, uh, they are responsible for running the economy into the ground. And they're not calling this a disaster. They're calling this a man-made disaster. Many people are saying, you know, this is the fault of the authorities. They're negligent, incompetent and corrupt. So many, many questions are now being raised. How come highly explosive material was being stored at Beirut port in an unsafe manner? Indeed, lots of questions to be uh, asked. And of course, we'll try and uh, get those sorted through the coming days. For the moment, uh, Zeyna Khoda, thank you. Mirna Dumit is president of the Order of Nurses in Lebanon. She's describing the situation in hospitals as catastrophic. Hospitals are not only overwhelmed. We have three hospitals that are completely destroyed. So we had to evacuate patients who were in those hospitals to other hospitals. In addition, we have two other hospitals that were partially uh, destroyed. So it was a catastrophe. It was a big hit to the healthcare system who was already, or the hospital system in Lebanon that is already uh, bleeding. So the situation is catastrophic and uh, very sadly, I say that we lost three nurses, three nurses who were uh, working at uh, the hospital and they are dead. So um, I don't find words to describe what happened. It, it's a, uh, we've never seen uh, such a thing. Now, the disaster couldn't come at a worse time for Lebanon. Its economy has been unravelling for months as government opponents blame the crisis on decades of corruption and mismanagement. In March, Lebanon defaulted on $90 billion worth of debt. Talks with the International Monetary Fund on a bailout stalled last month after infighting between the government and its central bank. The Lebanese currency, which remains pegged to the dollar, has lost 80% of its value since last October. That's been devastating for a country that imports most of its goods. Now, food costs are up by 190% on last year. And salaries and savings have lost much of their value, while the fallout from the pandemic has sent poverty and unemployment soaring.
Jad Chiban is an economist specialising in health, education and labour policies. He joins me now from Beirut. Good to have you with us on the programme. Repairing the damage to the port will cost millions. Then there's the trade that's lost entering even before we begin to speak of the infrastructure, both commercial and domestic, that needs to be repaired. Where do you begin when it comes to estimating the money that's needed to fix it all? Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, I mean, the, the level of devastation is, is very, very big. Uh, we have direct costs and indirect costs. You know, the direct costs are to repair the physical infrastructure, the private property losses, the public property losses. And also you have indirect costs because this is, a, you know, a huge interruption to whatever what was left of livelihoods, of people's income, uh, people who lost their bread earners and, and their main income, uh, uh, you know, earners. And the, the Beirut port, which is now out of service for a long time, um, the indirect cost of this uh, economically will, will add a huge burden on the Lebanese society, which was already, as you mentioned before, suffering from huge economic losses. Uh, the, the, the estimate that is circulating is between four to five billion dollars, including indirect costs. And um, I think this is an underestimate because of the scale of the damage and also the a huge cost of acquiring uh, foreign currency in dollars at a black market rate that is now five times the official rate uh, will add a huge burden on people. Of course, the economy, uh, as you've said, said, was already at rock bottom and international partners unwilling to really help without uh, structural, fiscal and political changes. I mean, will that help come now without strings attached? And, and from where? You know, I really think that the international community should view the Lebanese citizens now as economic refugees in a stateless country, because this state, the, ruled by thugs, has committed another act of war on its people with this massive explosion that is a deliberate act of more than negligence. This is not an accident. This was stored for more than a decade there, everybody knew it was there from the top of the government till the simplest employee on the port. Everyone knew this dangerous equip equipment and chemicals were there, and they are responsible for that. So we are now in a situation where we have a stateless uh, country run by thugs, and we are economic refugees in this country. So we should be treated like economic refugees in a war zone or in an earthquake zone. Uh, similar to what the Syrian refugees have been treated. So the UN system is Lebanon is well equipped because it has been dealing with the Syrian refugee crisis for a long time now, mm. and it can extend direct support without passing through the government to the economic refugees that are now in the greater Beirut area and beyond. Would that actually be a reality? Because while you still have politicians in place, regardless of what their affiliations are, the international community isn't just going to plough money to, um, to the general public at large. They will need some sort of uh, body, be it a political body or the government, to deal with. Uh, and that's where the problem lies, isn't it? The factions, the groupings, and inevitably the politicians from the past decade. Who do you trust? I agree with you, but there are ways to bypass this, this political class, and it has been done before, specifically for the Syrian refugee crisis, passing through the UN system, the UN uh, you know, World Food Programme, uh, UN uh, Humanitarian Council, and everybody operating on the ground now in Lebanon for a decade, bypassing, in a way, the, the central government. And frankly, we don't have a choice, because uh, we can't fund this the same thugs and their cronies and their their system. Any, any amount of money that will come to this political class will be uh, decimated in corruption. So, but the Lebanese people need help. We need help right now. And any delay in help will even exacerbate the economic consequences of this. And this help can be channeled through humanitarian support directly with the agencies that are on the ground. I don't think, frankly, we have any other option. If the even if we were paid some compensation money to, to rebuild, it will be paid in Lebanese pounds, which are worth a sixth of their value. And we still need to import a lot of the raw material, the glass, the aluminium, the every reconstruction material possible. And from the initial assessment, I mean, 80 percent of Beirut has been damaged uh, from the blast. So th this is a huge humanitarian operation and it should be treated as such. We shall see what happens. Uh, obviously, difficult times for you, Chuban, and, and your uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, Jad Chuban, our economist, joining us from Beirut. Thank you for your time, sir.
You're watching Al Jazeera's News Hour with me, Zahil Rahman. A reminder of our top stories. A large explosion in Lebanon's capital has killed at least 100 people and injured thousands as a shockwave swept through the city. Beirut's governor says up to 300,000 people have been left homeless. Lebanese President Michel Aoun has called for an emergency cabinet meeting. Hospitals strained by the coronavirus are being overwhelmed by the wounded. UN experts are calling on the international community to step in if India doesn't urgently address the worsening human rights situation in Indian-administered Kashmir. It's been a year since New Delhi stripped the disputed region of its autonomy. Let's just cross over to the Lebanese capital. The president, Michel Aoun, is speaking. Let's just listen to what he's saying. Stricken yesterday by this disaster. This morning, we have all been hit with grief, saddened as we lost loved ones. Some lost their loved ones, others left their homes, others lost their property. The magnitude of this disaster is beyond description. I extend condolences to ourselves and to all the Lebanese and pray to God Almighty to accept in his mercy the fallen martyr. It is a real disaster. We have been all stricken and afflicted, yet we should not sit on our hands and weep. First of all, investigation is a priority and the outcomes should be reached immediately and swiftly. Secondly, the recovery of dead bodies. And third, search and rescue are the missing ones and those still under debris. Provide a temporary shelter for those who have totally lost their homes. Then initiate an all-inclusive investigation to assess the damages, then hand out payments and compensations for repair and restoration of homes, houses, and other institutions who have been totally damaged. Lebanon is in a real crisis, and I appeal to all, all political factions, political parties, political forces, to cease from engage in rhetoric and stand united. Also, I address the representatives of the media. It is their our collective national duty and responsibility. We are all working, rolling up our sleeves, and I hope we should stand united to brave through these dire days. And I hope that all the Lebanese will live up to their responsibilities. People are fed up with political wranglings and rhetoric. It's time to work and cease and I request all and each to take part in the current work workshop and work that has been initiated. We are all required to input our respective efforts. It's a test where each and every Lebanese citizen should live up to the occasion and give priority to the national interest above any other interest. We begin in Lebanon's capital where people are describing the fallout from Tuesday's explosion as Apocalyptic. There were scenes of chaos after the blast ripped through the city's port, killing at least 100 people. The president spoke a short while ago, promising an investigation to reveal what happened. Michel Aoun also appealed to the global community to speed up assistance to Lebanon. It was already grappling with an economic meltdown. Beirut residents, meanwhile, they're trying to come to terms with the widespread damage that extended over half the city. 
Among the hardest hit areas are the busy commercial districts. Beirut's governor says up to 300,000 people have been left homeless. Well, this was the moment of impact. As you can see, the blast there happening at a port warehouse where the government says about 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate had been stored for years. More than 4,000 people have been injured and rescue workers still searching for the missing. Hospitals across the city struggling to cope. And some were damaged by the blast. Already strained by the coronavirus outbreak, health workers are overwhelmed by the number of casualties. Let's go live now to Zaina Khuda. She's standing by for us in Beirut. So let's start with the casualty toll. Where do we stand with that? Where do we stand with the search for the missing? Well, the Red Cross says more than 100 people have been killed, thousands have been injured, up to 4,000 people, and many, many are missing. Behind me, what remains of Beirut port, the site of the explosion. In the distance, I'm not sure if you can see them, uh, the civil defense, the Red Cross, searching through the rubble, trying to find survivors or the dead, family members gathering outside the port, hoping to hear news about their loved ones. Many people ha are still missing, and the search continues. Uh, earlier today, a young man was pulled um, from underneath the rubble of his home, not very far from where we are standing as the electricity company. Also this morning, bodies were pulled out from underneath the rubble. Uh, some bodies in hospitals are still not identified. So people are still trying to come to terms uh, on what what exactly happened? Such a massive explosion. You can see uh, the damage. The port is now unusable. And this was the main port in a country which is import dependent, import reliant. It imports 80 or 90 percent of its needs. Uh, there are other ports in the country in the south and the north, but not as big as Beirut port. So you can see the damage um, with your own eyes, how uh, the, the, the sheer the explosion really caused damage across the city. Um, we've been driving across the city. Almost every building, almost every apartment has been damaged. And you mentioned 300,000 people now homeless. Zaina, any uh, clarity on why 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate would be left at the port for years? Well, this is a question many Lebanese are asking. We've been hearing from officials since uh, late yesterday that there will be investigations. They're promising accountability. Uh, but the reaction in the street is, how can we trust you when you have been in power over the past three decades? Yes, uh, the government uh, took office in January, new faces, but they were appointed by the same political parties which have been governing uh, this country. And uh, political parties who many blame for mismanagement and corruption that run the economy to the ground. In fact, the international community is holding off uh, providing any aid to Lebanon. Lebanon has been uh, requesting billions of dollars of, in, in aid of, to, to be able to kickstart the economy. And international donors say, no, that money is not coming. We're not bailing you out this time. You need to fix uh, corruption in the state. And they did mention Beirut port because billions of dollars are lost, tax evasion. And uh, the state's uh, control really over Beirut port is very uh, weak. So. As much as there is shock in the street, there is also anger. People are not calling this a disaster. They're not calling it an accident. They're calling it a man-made disaster. And they're calling this negligence, incompetence uh, on the part of the authorities who are, they are accusing of being uh, corrupt. Hospitals are overwhelmed even before this happened. The country was at it, on its knees economically. Are, are they getting any international assistance? I mean, I imagine they must need some if even the hospitals have been damaged in this blast. Yes, many countries have expressed their readiness to provide assistance. Uh, um, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, France, uh, Germany, uh, they will be sending medical teams, rescue and search teams to help uh, um, 
try to find survivors, if there are any, uh, underneath the rubble and to provide medical, much needed medical supplies to the hospitals, which are underfunded and understaffed. Uh, even private hospitals, as of late, uh, laid off so many nurses because they couldn't pay their salaries. Uh, as more and more people lost their jobs, they lost their private insurance. And that means that they relied on public hospitals, which were already underfunded and neglected for decades. So the hospital sector, the health sector is under strain. I just cannot imagine at this point in time, um, countries are going to give the Lebanese government uh, cash because uh, the French foreign minister was here not too long ago and he said, help us so that we can help you. And um, what he basically told the politicians, he scolded them and said, you need to carry out reforms, you need to fix corruption in the state or else you're not getting any money uh, this uh, time around. We're not bailing you out. And I can tell you that activists on the ground, anti-government activists who have been organizing protests over the past few months demanding a new leadership, they are calling on the international community not to provide aid directly to the government and to give people uh, aid directly or through NGOs. All right, Zainal Khudr there from Beirut. Thanks for that.